Is that familiar? Sí. Welcome everybody. Please, uh, we invite you to take a seat for the start of this uh, Rosewood 4.0 final event. I know that I know that you are all very excited to be here in person. We have been uh, all in our home countries and uh, offices and uh, seeing each other online. And this is very exciting for all of us, including myself, uh, to have you here in, in person. But you will have time during the, the coffee breaks and the lunch to continue uh, socializing and building the networks today and tomorrow because uh, this is one of the reasons why we are here to strengthen our our networks. Um, so uh, I'm Edward Maury. Uh, most of you have seen me uh, online from uh, EFI, the European uh, Foreign Institute, the Mediterranean facility, which is the host of this final event and which premises are located in this uh, marvelous campus. You may have seen uh, the, some of the buildings around. Uh, this is the San Pau. Art Nouveau site. It's a UNESCO uh, human heritage. And uh, I also want to uh, uh, announce that we have here my colleagues, Gerard Fernandez. Uh, Gerard Fernandez led the work package on communication and dissemination of uh, Rosewood 4.0 project. And you will see him here possibly taking pictures and tweeting. So Gerard, please uh, announce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have any question about how to, how to tweet, how to disseminate uh, any real-time uh, uh, announcement uh, in the social media and so on, please uh, contact, contact him. And also my colleague Giuseppe Tripodi that you have seen uh, at the entrance at the reception desk. Uh, he's administrative uh, and project officer. And in addition, he has managed the catering. So if you don't like the food today, Blame him. <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke. <laughs> okay, so uh, Rosewood 4.0, it's about stimulating uh, good mobilization from supply and from demand sides. And I would like to show you an example of how this can be important for a region like Catalonia, the region where you are now, which capital city is, uh, is Barcelona. So please take a moment to observe the room where you are. Uh, I know that there are some people following us online on YouTube. I don't know how access do you have to see the room. Uh, and observe the materials that were used to build it. Uh, the, the, the original materials. You see the, the wooden walls have been added afterwards. So this building and uh, the whole campus uh, was constructed during the beginning of the 20th century. It was a, initially a hospital. It was a sponsored by a wealthy uh, businessman. And so, as I said, if you omit the recent additions, you will only see as building materials stone, bricks, and ceramic. And some wood, but only for the windows and for the door. And this is representative of the Catalan forest history that I would like to summarize in uh, one slide that this is, is this one. So here you can see the Catalan forest history for the last 1,000 years, for the last 10 centuries, starting from 1,000 to, uh, to the present. And in uh, green, what you see is the, the land area covered by forests that in the year 1000, was more or less half of the, of the region. The region is 32,000 square kilometers, so more or less the size of Belgium. So initially, more or less half of the area covered by forests and gradually decreasing while the agricultural croplands and also the, the, the grazing land and the shrubland uh, increased. And we reach by the year more or less 1800, with the, our minimum surface of forest area, uh, more or less only 10%. And this, in the, this, this low figures in the, in the 19th century is where the, the Industrial Revolution happened in, in Europe. 
So most of the industrial revolution took place in a moment with very low area of forests in Catalonia. And that's why you, you will not see many wood in, uh, in the Catalan buildings uh, compared to other regions in, in Europe. And then what happened at the beginning of the, of the 20th century is that, as you see, the agricultural soil or the croplands in yellow uh, decreased, the marginal uh, farming areas were abandoned, also uh, extensive livestock was reduced, so also the, the light yellow with the, with the prairies and, and the shrubs land decreased. And what happened is that the, the, the forest area rapidly increased. And this has two consequences. First, there is very little forestry tradition in Catalonia because most of the forest area is very recent. Of course, there is this low 10% that always remain forest where there is forestry tradition, but it's a very small uh, surface area compared to the whole region. And the other consequence is that most of our forests are very young forests. So this has a specific challenges, such as low diversification of the wood products, a poorly structured wood value chain, low mechanization of forest operations, and lack of, the, lack of attractiveness of the forestry jobs. However, Catalonia has two strong points, a vibrant ICT sector, and a renowned research and academic institutions on forestry, such as the Forest Science and Technology Center of Catalonia, CTFC, the Center for Applied Forest Research, CREAF, and the University of uh, Lleida just to mention some, some of them. So, Catalonia has a lot to give, but also has a lot to receive. And this is the essence of a thematic network. This is the essence of Rosewood 4.0. So let's start the exchanges. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Everybody, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So also from my side, welcome all to this, uh, the final event of our Rosewood 4.0 Horizon 2020 project. My name is Javier Casado, and I work as a project uh, manager in Steinbeis Europa Centrum, which is the coordinator of the, of the project. Um, on behalf of Steinbeis Europa Centrum and, and the whole uh, Rosewood 4.0 consortium, I would like to thank you all for your participation here in Barcelona and also to those who are following us uh, online. Uh, after 30 months of really hard work, as you know, with the pandemic condition and restriction, uh, our project is coming to an end. For that reason, we organize this final event. Uh, this final event is divided in three different sections. Um, this morning section, it will be the opportunity to share with you all the key results and outcome of the project, also talking about the future of the Rosgood uh, 4.0 network. In the second session this afternoon, this will be related to sustainability with this title, how to ensure long-term sustainability of network once the project is over. So we are going to sh share with you uh, some t existing tool that we can support in some way this, uh, the exploitation or sustainability of the network once the, the EU funding is finished, and also some best practice cases of a uh, um, project or initiative that they succeed in this uh, challenging step. The final session will be tomorrow morning with this working group, Foster Innovation Towards a More Sustainable Forest Sector. As you know, there will be, uh, I think, a um, working, working group, a first round with four parallel work, working group, and after the coffee break, we will have five different working group based on topics selected by, by you, by all the registered people. So with this, uh, again, welcome to this final event, and to start with the, officially with the, the first session, session one, um, hopefully there is no technical problem. Uh, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Michael Wolf, um, policy office, officer from DG Agri, who is going to, uh, to share with us an update on forestry research and innovation, the cluster, cluster six. This is food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment. I don't know. Um, 
is morning, Michael Wolf. Can you hear me and see me? Very low. Can you hear me? Very low. I try to adjust. Now, now we can hear you. Thank okay, you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for, for uh, accept, accepting our invitation. And um, please, the virtual room is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Wolf. I'm working in DG Agri, the European Commission's Department for Agriculture and uh, Rural Development. Uh, and more precisely, I'm from the Research and Innovation Unit. And we are working with Horizon Europe uh, on the research programs uh, in the forest sector. And today I would like to give you a bit of an idea what we are doing currently with the, with the work program 21 to 22, but also to give you an outlook uh, what you can expect in the coming years. Of course, it would be a pleasure to be with you in, in physical form. Unfortunately, I can only attend in virtually today. So today, what you can expect, uh, I give you a bit of a background. Uh, what are we doing uh, also on the political um, line with the new EU forest strategy? What does it mean for research and innovation? Then I will give you uh, more of an overview of our current priorities. And what is also very important uh, to give you an uh, a view how we link the multi-actor approach and the ERP agri with our research and innovation. So all of you uh, know, I guess, that we have adopted around a year ago a new EU forest strategy. This is a flagship initiative of the European Green Deal and it is a framework to coordinate all these different forest-related policies and to make sure that we have coherence. And for this uh, new EU forest strategy, I think it is important to say that we have really significant commitments in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, uh, and many others. So here we are building on the concept of sustainable forest management to provide really the framework uh, to ensure that our forest can contribute to the targets and objectives at EU level. So uh, what is at the core of the EU forest strategy? Uh, the multifunctionality. This is actually in the center of the EU forest strategy. So we have to make sure that uh, the forest sector forest managers contribute to our big objective of climate neutrality by 2050. At the same time, we want to make sure that, uh, that the forest ecosystems are restored where necessary, that they are resilient also for future challenges, and that uh, also certain areas are adequately protected. Another priority is the forest monitoring and the strategic planning for the future. And in the forest strategy, uh, we also have our enabling elements. And I know that you are particularly interested in how we engage also with the scientific community in this area. So research and innovation has received uh, a particular attention uh, as a key enabler to achieve really the ambitious objectives of the strategy. And uh, we know uh, that we have to improve the knowledge on our forest, as well as on possible climate change mitigation pathways, and facilitate also a faster uptake of scientific knowledge and practice to make sure that this is really also implemented. And our main instrument to achieve this objective is Horizon Europe, the new research and innovation uh, framework program. Uh, most of you are familiar with it. We have still the same structure as in Horizon 2020, three pillars, pillar one, excellent science, global uh, pillar two, societal challenges, and pillar three, innovative Europe. 
And today I would like to focus on pillar two, where we have the six clusters. And the last one, cluster six, is on food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture and environment. Forestry is not mentioned in this title, but it is included. And you see it's a huge cluster. We want to cover really many different uh, areas. So this is why we have also quite a significant budget of 9 billion for the whole period, 21 to 27. Before I'm going more into the priorities as such, I think it's also important to understand how we develop our uh, areas, our research priorities. So we are starting with the legal base of Horizon Europe because it already includes the structure and broad lines of intervention. And this will be the basis to develop our strategic plans. We have one now for the first four years and we will have a second one for the last three years, 25 to 27. And this is important because those strategic plans include all the key orientations and impacts we want to achieve. And uh, building on those, we develop biannual work programs. So currently we are evaluating all the proposals uh, which have been submitted from the first work program, 21 to 22. And we are already uh, working and even finalizing the work program 23 to 24. Uh, this will be published end of the year, which will include new calls for proposals and then result in new projects. So I told you before that the strategic plan is really our basis. We have identified uh, impacts which we want to achieve and we translate them now in the work program. I will only focus here on the right side on the so-called destinations. You could also call it uh, maybe chapters in the work program. And for every destination, we want to achieve different impacts. So, so we have, we have uh, uh, now a destination on land, oceans and water for climate action one destination on biodiversity and ecosystem services, another one on circular economy and bioeconomy sectors, clean environment and zero pollution, then our farm to fork destination, fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food systems for primary production to consumption, another destination on resilient, inclusive, healthy and green rural coastal and urban communities. And the last destination, number seven in the work program, innovative governance, environmental observations and digital solutions in support of the Green Deal. When we look uh, on the first work program, on the overview, we will see that in total we have almost uh, 200 uh, topics with a budget of more than 1.9 billion euro. So I mentioned, of course, this does not only include forestry, but all the other sectors, agriculture, bioeconomy, etc. But it is important uh, to see all these different destinations because you, you can imagine in our forestry, forestry research, we want to tackle a lot of different challenges in relation to climate change, in relation to biodiversity, in relation to uh, bioeconomy and others. So actually we have in all destinations relevant topics for uh, our sector and I will uh, mention uh, the main ones in the coming slides. So uh, in destination one, in support of the biodiversity strategy, we have one topic on forest genetic resources and forest reproductive materials in the climate change context. Then in the destination two, in support of the farm to fork strategy, we are tackling uh, the sanitary, the phytosanitary aspects. So we have one topic on uh, outbreaks of plant pests, another one on the risk assessment of new low risk pesticides. 
those uh, topics cover agriculture and forestry. Then we have the destination three, circular economy and bioeconomy sectors. Here I only mention the selection because uh, many other uh, topics also have a strong reference to the forest sector, but the main ones are the following. So we have new technologies uh, in the forest based sector, ICT. Then we have uh, one topic focusing on the research and innovation ecosystem. This is also one of our key priorities because it will also uh, prepare the ground for a future partnership on forestry, which will uh, be proposed for the second uh, strategic plan. So this means from 25 to 27, we would also like to have a partnership with member states on forestry and forest. What is also important to mention is uh, the Circular Bio-Based Europe Partnership, uh, the CB. They have uh, their work programs outside of Horizon Europe, but we have strong synergies. The Commission will invest uh, 1 billion in the next seven years, and we want to make sure that also the forest sector is very closely uh, included in this partnership. Then on in destination four, uh, four to address the zero pollution ambition. This uh, one includes a topic to improve the environmental performance of industrial processes, construction, woodworking, textiles, pulp and paper, biochemicals. Then we have destination five in support of the climate policies. And this is our biggest priority in the work program. So here we have uh, three interlinked topics uh, focusing on climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, but also monitoring of climate change impacts and demonstration network of climate smart restoration pilots. We also do not look only on uh, trees in the forest, but also outside. So agroforestry is also included here. Then in destination seven, we have uh, we have one topic, uh, smart XG last mile and edge solutions for remote farming, forestry and rural areas, because we know that often innovations are hindered by a lack of broadband connections. So we also want to contribute on this aspect. Last but not least, uh, destination seven. This uh, here research and innovation will help to improve the design, but also the implementation and evaluation of policies. So we have here the CUP strategic plans then also the development of bioeconomy strategies. Another aspect is uh, here mentioned in, with the drones. So we also want to assess the risk, but also the added value of uh, drones as multi-purpose vehicles. And what is also very important, uh, we want to make sure that all those knowledge which we are producing are not lost after the projects are finished. So we also have included a EU-wide interactive knowledge reservoir and uh, further semantic and advisory networks. I think this is uh, good to know what we have done in the first work program, but I also want to give you a bit of an outlook. And actually, you are one of the first now to see uh, what are also our future priorities. So for the first work program, uh, or for the next work program, uh, 23 to 24, we have uh, identified new priorities. We want to focus on small forest properties and the development of sustainable uh, value chains for wood, but also non-wood products. Then we want to improve also the scientific knowledge on forest ecosystems and possible payment schemes to uh, improve them. We have also uh, included uh, our priority 
in the construction sector. So we want to focus on the climate smart use of wood in support of the new European Bauhaus. Another topic uh, will focus on uh, biodiversity in the, and climate change. Uh, here we want to, uh, yeah, to address the need to conserve and protect carbon rich and biodiversity rich forest ecosystems. Then I mentioned that the monitoring uh, is another priority also in the political uh, arena. So here we also have a supporting topic included. We will also have uh, one topic uh, for uh, an advisory network on forest. And we will also have one topic uh, focusing on uh, multiple ecosystem services and enhanced biodiversity and possible ways uh, in, in, in the forest management to address that. I was talking now about the what, and I think it is also important to, to talk about uh, how. So we believe uh, that the cross fertilization is really key to tackle complex challenges and to develop opportunities for new innovation. And I will quote now the uh, former president of the US. I not only use all the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. So this means that we really want to bring together all the different actors with complementary knowledge and work uh, together uh, to develop the suitable solutions. This is why we are also strengthening now the multi-actor approach in cluster six. Uh, before in Horizon Europe, it was only a criterion for excellence. So we included it in the topic text and it was uh, nice to have. But that's it. In future, or actually also with the current work program 21 to 22, it became a, an eligibility criterion. So this really means proposals must use the multi act approach. And we believe that uh, the outcomes are more demand driven, reliable and relevant to society. If we really include the end users, the forest managers, the practitioners, and make sure that all this uh, knowledge is also taken up in practice. We have a full list of requirements. I will not go into uh, detail here, but of course it's important that uh, the composition of the consortium is uh, balanced in, in, in the choice of relevant key actors with complementary knowledge from the very beginning. But then uh, I want to focus here on the on the last two requirements, number seven and eight. So all those uh, projects, they also have to produce the practice abstracts, which are used in our common ERP format and our will, which will be published on our database. And uh, another requirement is to involve our local interactive innovation groups operational groups under the uh, ERP agri uh, as much as possible. And this is important if we want to have the bigger picture. So what we are really trying to do is to connect uh, the common agricultural policy and Horizon Europe. So we have on the left side here our operational groups which will be funded. Uh, through national uh, money or co-funded. And then we have on the right side our Horizon Europe multi-actor projects, of, of course, also thematic networks. Uh, and all those are connected through the CAP networks at EU level, but also at national level. And we are also having our uh, EU knowledge repository of contacts and the mentioned apps practice abstracts. So this is very important for us because we believe that we really have to use uh, all those synergies. And just to give you also a bit of an update, what uh, where are we now in the ERP agri? So um, 
all member states, with one exception, uh, have implemented uh, the EIP Agri. We have already more than 2,500 operational groups running or finished. And from Horizon uh, 2020, we have already 190 multi-actor projects. Uh, so this means we really have a growing network, a very lively network. I will uh, finish my uh, presentation now, but I have one more thing which I should mention. Because this year is also the European Year of Youth and my colleagues in RTD asked me uh, to also highlight that for you. So this was declared uh, also by our president von der Leyen in the State of the Union address. And the Commission has two bioeconomy youth initiatives in addition to our work on bioeconomy education. These initiatives celebrate the youth participation and leadership. We launched a bioeconomy youth ambassador call and will open also a creative call by economy in my life very soon. And we believe that it is really important to spread this also in the forest uh, community. So the youth uh, ambassador call ended already, uh, I think yesterday or today, but with uh, more than 200 applications from all over Europe. And from the creative competition, you will hear very soon uh, more information and also the link how uh, to submit. Uh, so stay tuned and follow that also in future. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wolf, for this really interesting presentation. I'm sure this information will be really useful for our attendees. And now we have the time for questions. Uh, does anyone in the audience have uh, a question from Mr. Wolf? If you have a question, you only have to raise your hand and we will bring the microphone. Don't be shy. <laughs> Also for the participant online, they can use a chat to write down the, the question and we will bring to the different speakers. Can you check, Edward, if there is a question in the chat? Um, there is a, one online participant asking if we could have the, the presentation available, Mr. Wolf. Yes. Uh I have shared it already yesterday and uh, happy if you can uh, publish it or give it further. Okay, so we will disseminate the presentation from Mr. Wolf through the, by email to the Hochister people. So it seems that there is no question. So again, Mr. Wolf, thank you very much for your participation. Have a nice day. Ciao. So now we can move to the, the result of the activity of the, of the project. Um, this is a presentation I, I tried to summarize. It. You can imagine it's a really complicated to summarize the, the, the main activities and result for 30 months in one presentation. I will try to be uh, brief because we have already some delay and I'm the responsible for the timing in the, in the moderation. So. Uh, what is uh, Rosewood 5.0? It's a 30-month is a project. It's a thematic network built in a, ba a previous uh, Rosewood network of uh, regional hubs, but extending the scope to the European, uh, the Eastern Europe. Uh, the project is focused on digitalization, uh, fostering the knowledge chain in Europe for sustainable good mobilization using digital tools and solutions. The main challenge, it was to um, identify it and look for best practices and innovation. Again, this is digital tools and, and, and solution that open up new pros, uh, prospect for the, for the sector, boosting the sustainable boot mobilization in the whole Europe. Who did that? This is, uh, here you can see the, the Rosewood 5.0 consortium. We have 21 official partners. The consortium of the project is coordinated by, coordinated by Steinbeis Europa Centrum. And as you can see, 
Most of the partners are including the five established uh, regional hubs, Northern Hub, Central West Hub, uh, Central East Hub, uh, Southern West Hub, and Southern East Hub. You can see here in this uh, map the distribution of the different hub and the countries involved in the, in the hubs. With this uh, structure, we were able to identify uh, uh, at national or regional level uh, best practices and innovation to be disseminated at a uh, European scale. What is the result of the, of the project in the World Packet 1, Information and Knowledge? Um, the work started with the your, um, joint survey, a collection of best practices and innovation. This was done by the, the five regional hubs. As you can see, there was three different steps, the screening, selection, and the final, it was the validation and clustering. In the last step, validation and clustering is really important because we engage external stakeholder, a facility, um, advisor, a practitioner, expert, in a series of existing different workshops for the validation of the result of this uh, survey. So after the joint survey, we have an internal database with uh, 400 uh, 57 collective best practices on innovation. Based on that, uh, the, the hub make a kind of selection and we create the open knowledge platform that will be a dedicated uh, presentation later on that with around 280 fat sheet. After that, we have the validation workshop, uh, around three per each uh, hub. And based on that, uh, we were able to create uh, um, five regional and one cross regional roadmap produce 27 videos for some specific best practices and innovation, and also decide which are the best practices and innovation to be including in the study visit or to be visit. I'm not going to talk about the, the knowledge platform because we will have the dedicated uh, section. Um, presentation later on, only I'm going to highlight this is an open tool, uh, and we have an average number of visitors per month of more than 1,100. 1, so this is a quite uh, big number. Uh, one result of this, uh, this work, it was this uh, report, Best Practices and Digital Innovation for Sustainable Boot Mobilization with a full collection of 100 fast sheet. You can find this in our website. Also, it's in, in, in available in Senodo. As you can see, with uh, currently more than 440 downloads of the document. And also, uh, related to the presentation from Mr. Wall, the project, the project had produced 100 uh, practice abstracts following the, the common API grid uh, um, common format. Sorry, I will need some water. And also, based on the selected best practices innovation, they have um, produced um, 27 videos. They are already available in our own YouTube channel and also in the, in the website of the project. And you can see some of the video, they have more than 400 views. In World Packet 2, um, the project produced five regional roadmap and also one cross-regional roadmap um, to try to broaden the sharing of digital solutions, digital tools of the best practices and innovation in the different regional contexts. The five regional roadmap link the identified uh, best practices and innovation with also identified regional needs and challenge. Also defining the regional individual strategy for transferring of this digital innovation. Um, based on all the results of these five regional uh, um, roadmap, we have one cross-regional roadmap presenting a cross-regional uh, strategy for knowledge transfer and cooperation opportunities among the different hubs. So we have in the left side, uh, as I explained before, uh, we have this screening, selection, and validation of best practices and innovation. And in this work packet, uh, they have, um, they did a SWOT analysis to try to identify the concrete needs and challenge in the different regions. And then, based in the validation workshop, uh, the expert and uh, uh, practitioner and advisor decide which are the more urgent uh, um, needs and challenge. So the roadmap they match the identified uh, problem of the different region with existing uh, best practices and innovation. So this is uh, how the, the roadmap looks like. And they are available in the project website, also in Senodo. We have already uh, have been more than uh, 230 downloads. 
Uh, it was also distributed through the, the one of the newsletter of the project, also through social media, and using also the contact of the of the network uh, and contact and network of the hubs. The second task in this work packet it was the regional implementation groups. Uh, this is a series of two workshops uh, with the, the name Business Idea Creation Workshop. This was done by the five different hubs. And in this uh, workshop, there were practitioners for the, own, uh, the countries involved in this hub, but also participants from other hubs. In that way, we, we were able to cross regional transfer the best practices and innovation between the different hubs and also the creation of new ideas. As you can see below, before the wor uh, workshop one, um, the hub uh, make a kind of pre-selection on the main gap and needs uh, need already identified in the, in the roadmap and also the related best practices and innovation for all the hub. So in the workshop, um, it was invite, there were invited the owner of this best practice and innovation from other hubs so they can uh, pitch and present this, uh, this solution. And also, in some cases, um, the hub uh, um, identified also potential ideas that were not identified as a best practice innovation. Based on this discussion, a uh, number of two, between two and three best practice innovation, a new idea able to cover some of the challenges or need of the hub, pay, pass to the next uh, workshop, as you will see here. In this workshop two, um, based on the identified initiative, um, it was a creation implementation team for each of these initiatives. Also, they discussed about the business plan of this potential initiative, and then it was a discussion which of the three, two, between two or three uh, initiatives was the most uh, interesting or relevant. And based on this selection, it was a final one or two initiative that was further supported by the, by the project. Here you can see some, some impression of the, this um, business idea creation workshops. And this is the result. So in total, we have 10 workshops, more than 30 presented the practices and innovation for new ideas. In total, more than 230 uh, attendees. And uh, this is together a uh, partner of the project in external and external stakeholder more than 150. So in this table in the left side, you can see the selected initiative only like an example. I'm going to explain, for example, in the northern hub and they um, decide to support this Tiger Tech. This is a, a, a startup um, who produce a low cost software to identify um, uh, the tree through a photo matching, so this is a kind of fingerprint. Print. What we did with this uh, startup, we have two different meetings. In the first meeting, we talked to them because they don't have experience in a EU project. So we explained how they can be involved in a proposal in consortium. And also we talked to them about the business model of the company. The second uh, meeting, it was a dedicated meeting to explain the um, EAC accelerator program. That is a, a really interesting tool from the commission for, uh, for a step up. And they are currently preparing an application to, to do so. Also, they were invited uh, as a, a best practice to be presented in, uh, during the study visit in, the, in Norway and Sweden in April this year. I'm going to skip this. And the last, the last uh, task in this work packet, it was organization of a study visit to select it best practices and innovation. It was between two and three study visits per uh, hub. In that way, we support the interregional knowledge uh, transfer. Here you can see some impression of this uh, study visit. Here in this table, um, you can see the overview of the, of the study visit, um, the countries. Also in the middle, you will see the format. As you can imagine with the pandemic, many of this study visit uh, was organized online or a hybrid event. But at the end of the project, in the last month, we were, or the hub manager were uh, able to organize I think four different uh, physical study visits, so we are quite happy about this. So in general, 16 uh, study visit uh, with more than 35 best practices and innovation presented in this study visit with more than 520 attendees. Uh, regarding to this, uh, we produce, or the hub manager produced uh, six videos They are already available in our website and also in YouTube regarding to this uh, physical study visit. In business support, 
this is a um, training course. This was the first and the main task in this uh, work packet. I'm going to only uh, give uh, a really small overview because we will have later on a dedicated uh, presentation on that. And it was organized uh, by the, the, the Central West uh, Hub, coordinated by FBC, to develop three hybrid training, including each of them a MOOC with several webinar, video lecture, podcasts, and also on practical on-site uh, training. These three MOOCs um, are available in the, in the project website. And, and I would like only to highlight that um, the initial idea, or, or is including in the Gorang algorithm, it was to have this MOOC in English and also in German, but uh, we have, uh, the partner, they have some, they decide to support this extra, extra work with the translation of many of the material of the of the MOOCs you can see in this uh, in this table. So finally, we have the the, the webinar, podcast, and uh, presentation in thirteen European language. The second task for the business support uh, work packet it was uh, this B two B training. So we try to support the connection between the practices offner and adopter, collaborative partner, investor, and funding agency. So we prepare in standby uh, B2B training material. This is two different presentations. The first one is uh, access to finance, providing to a stakeholder looking for um, financing some really interesting and relevant information, and also how to present your uh, idea, your, uh, your project or proposal, pitching this uh, in front of the potential investor. The second presentation, it was how to develop a collaborative project. Um, this is uh, the presence and general information in which way you can, uh, you can uh, follow with kind of a step you have to follow to create uh, a collaborative project starting from the, the, the building of the consortium until the preparation of the proposal. These uh, two pre uh, PowerPoint presentations are available in the, in the project website. Based on this um, material, all the, all the hubs, they uh, organize a kind of replication. Uh, they select what kind of uh, information it was more in relevant for the target group. Um, and they organize five different B2B training. Also in some cases, presenting some information, some specific information about the regional, national, and international funding opportunities for some specific call regarding to the forest sector. And I forgot to, to indicate that uh, the first uh, B2B training, it was a kind of internal B2B training for the hub manager, was organized by Steinbeis, um, and it was a two hours uh, training in access to, to finance. Uh, this, the recording of this, uh, this uh, B2B training is already in the project website and also in, the, in YouTube. The last uh, work packet, it was communication and dissemination. I'm going to be really quick. Uh, we have the, the project website with all the, the information on a lot of resources and material, also the link to the knowledge platform. Uh, we, have, we were really active in, the, in social media, in Twitter and LinkedIn. We have, a, this is a, 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 I really recommend to go to the YouTube channel. We have several really interesting videos, not only the videos at 27 for the best practice and, and uh, innovation, also for the study visit, also some example of webinar and dissemination session, the two B2B training videos and also three general video presentation. The newsletter, we have produced five different newsletters and also dissemination note, this is a small, um, document with each of the document, I think we have five in total with a, a one topic. And based on the, this topic, we make a selection for five different best practices and innovation regarding to this topic. This was disseminated. Uh, they are already av available in the website, but also in the in social media. Example of communication and dissemination. Uh, we organized a new networking and dissemination webinar. This was with the AP Agri and also some Forest European Association to talk about our main result and also to discuss about the sustainability, the exploitation, how, what can we do with the, with the knowledge platform and the, the Rosewood network. Um, another example is uh, we present, or the, the, I think it was thesis for present the result of the project in the seventh Mediterranean Forest Week last year, uh, this year, no, last year, this year, sorry. <laughs> and also we have, for example, one article regarding to the knowledge platform in the uh, Agro Innovation Magazine. This is the AP Agri Magazine. I think it's not uh, launched, but it will be soon available. To finalize, some example of uh, 
cooperation with other uh, project uh, initiative organization, uh, especially strong it was a collaboration with uh, Bioregion Facility through the FEI partner. Uh, we have also here some uh, thematic network, other projects. In, in principle, the main uh, cooperation it was in the communication dissemination direction. So we support each other with the, with the dissemination of the events, uh, the main result, report, and so on. We organize also some joint dissemination activities. And um, with two of the former um, thematic network, this is incredible and affinate, we have together a, a, a new Horizon Europe proposal hopefully will be funded. It is, is um, uh, coordinated by the University of Firenze in Italy and um, this was the three uh, um, coordinator of these three thematic networks are involved in the consortium with the idea to support and fit the three online platforms, each of them with one specific topic in Rosu 4.0 good mobilization, in incredible uh, non-good uh, forest product and affinate agroforestry but it will be a really good way to, to continue to maintain not only online the, this, uh, this um, platform, but also to include new additional best practices from um, Fashit. On with this, I think I'm done. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, please let me know. <laughs> question? Or maybe from yeah thank you for the the overview it's I think it's truly an impressive project uh, I'm, I'm Tyler Arbor from Ghent University and with uh, one of the partners there Eureka that you mentioned so it's uh, it has been been good uh, good collaboration at least with, I've, I've known Edward for a bit but I I have a question because I think you do communication and dissemination <coughs> so <coughs> so well. Um, what uh, for may maybe you weren't directly involved, but for example, the c creating videos and making sure you have the kind of are set up to do that as you uh, during all these hectic events and you're going along. Um, do you have any tips, I guess, or insight into how how you're um, able to sort of capture that so you don't lose it in the in the moment? That's a question. Um, thank you for the question. You you are asking to the wrong person, but we have uh, Gerard. He's our communication and dissemination leader. And um, the the thing I can I can tell you from the video I wasn't involved. It was done by the hubs and the the member of the of the hubs for the best practices and innovation. Um, but uh, EFI they prepare I think a kind of guideline. It was a suggestion also from the from the monitor during the first review meeting to ensure the quality and also the, the standard to have a kind of similar um, layout from the, from the videos. I don't know, uh, uh, Gerard, did you hear the question? Uh, more or less because I was uh, outside Sorry. taking pictures, so, but uh, I guess that you were asking about how we managed to do all this communication, right, in the project? Well, um, in general, in Rosewood, the communications uh, has been really decentralized through the hubs, through the five regional hubs. So it has been a matter of uh, work on coordination with all the regional hubs. Um, I cannot say that I've been just the, the responsible of this success. I think it's a general success of the whole consortium and, and we have been exchanging a lot of uh, you know, messages and, and a lot of guidelines especially. So what's important to be there? Um, always thinking about the audience that we are addressing. So um, especially, okay, we have followers from the forestry sector, but there are people who are not very, you know, specialized in this uh, issue. So we have also uh, and always shared this main message. Keep it simple, keep it understandable, using a plain language for the also general user, for the European citizen who wants to know what is happening in the forest sector and also taking into account this, uh, you know, EU green deal agenda and so on. We have to focus now that this is very important. And also the videos are the first material that people want to see because you can share a lot of, uh, you know, briefings, uh, press materials, things like this. But finally, the most important thing is that what uh, draws attention through the visual 
uh, aspect. So yeah, we have worked a lot on having these guidelines, uh, also supervising a lot what has been done, giving feedback, things like this. And, and also it's very important that uh, in Rosewood, as, as I said, we had a very decentralized consortium. It's very important that from the local arena, from the local sphere, these should be shared with the local forest experts and also these materials, it's highly recommendable to be translated because one of the gaps that you see in the forest sector is that uh, we prepare everything in English, but this is not the language spoken generally in, in this uh, sector. So it's very important that, okay, we are sending a message in English to the EU citizen, but it's also very important to have these materials, these videos translated with subtitles and so on. So this has been the work we have done, but of course, uh, I think that this has been, uh, you know, coordinated and col uh, collaborative work in, in all the consortium. And I think that without the help and the patience of all the uh, partners, this wouldn't have been possible. So we have, we had a lot of luck to have this consortium. We, we've been very lucky because all of them have been doing an exceptional work to have all these 27 videos, and also we have even more, <laughs> which we have still to upload. But I mean, uh, this, this has been uh, really exceptional for a European project, I must say. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. I suggest that we continue with the next uh, presentation because you will have more details on some of what have been uh, summarized by Javier. So next questions could be asked directly to the responsible people of uh, each uh, work package. Yeah, our next uh, speaker is Uwe Kies from um, InnovaGood. He's a leader of the Work Packet One, and um, he's going to talk about the, the um, knowledge platform. So, please, the floor is yours. To move okay. the, Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would like to present now the main outcome, I would say, of our joint efforts um, to make the results sustainable and accessible in the future. And this will also be, of course, the tool we want to use in further collaborations. Uh, great to have the uh, indications um, already from um, the, the the, the project um, officer to indicate what kind of opportunities we have now in the upcoming Horizon programs. I think we also saw this multi-actor approach and this is exactly what we have demonstrated in our project. How can we build with such a big group and such a yeah, uh, engaged uh, consortium a common platform to collect all these results and make them more accessible. So uh, this uh, outcome has been mainly been produced by um, the four partners uh, you see here EFI, InnovaWood, Cesafor, and Steinbeis, who are sort of creating the concept and the, uh, the setup of this platform. But of course, it includes all the work of the whole consortium. So I would like to um, briefly uh, come back why we need this sort of platforms. What is the, the possibility to, um, yeah, to, 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 to share knowledge? And um, how is this portal actually working? And uh, I also have a few more um, sections later. So Rosewood uh, was set up to, um, find, to find solutions to knowledge needs, innovation opportunities and the use especially also of digital tools because uh, this digitalization uh, is a real big transformation for our sector as well. So uh, not, uh, better sharing this kind of um, needs and understanding uh, what can we do with dig digital technology, how can this advance our our needs in the sector, that was a key uh, driver from the beginning in this project. And um, yeah, as has already been pointed out, the idea is to create sort of a first pan-European platform that can be, uh, uh, yeah, be a first start to create a real um, forestry uh, knowledge information system. Uh, it refers to the Agricultural Knowledge Information System, ARCIS. Um, and of course the goal is to make all this information more accessibly, especially to the practitioners on the ground, uh, really all across Europe and also share it between the regions. And um, this mainly means uh, also that these innovations, 
you should not only know about them, they should also be accepted, they should be understood, they should be uh, taken up by the, by the practitioners. And one main direction, of course, is the forest sector, the forest industries, uh, probably also including, uh, you know, later steps in the value chain, uh, where managing ID, managing data, managing information, managing knowledge is key to business success. But I also want to remind that our real main target group uh, are, let's say, the forest owners. And there are lots of private forest owners uh, who are not experts and, um, let's say, professionals in this sector. Uh, they also are the ones who are taking decisions, uh, who have to much know, be more engaged in these decision-making processes. So they are also a direct target group uh, of this platform and of our activities. And this is especially uh, thinking further, this was also mentioned in the previous pre presentations, what is the youth, what is the next generation uh, taking out of, of this? How will they manage the forest? How will they uh, adapt, let's say, this understanding of the, of the challenges? So, uh, I won't go into detail because um, Javier already presented this, but it was a huge uh, team effort, uh, this whole project. We went through many, many um, uh, steps of screening, selection, validation. Uh, many st local stakeholders were involved in these uh, workshops and um, we collected a lot of feedback and built up these roadmaps and collected all this impressive number of uh, examples, best practices and innovations. And all in all, this project created really to create a living community of practitioners and experts, which we hope to that we can maintain and expand even further after this project. Um, so the knowledge platform itself, you find that under this uh, web link, uh, it's a basically an, um, a main portal where you can easily um, yeah, uh, filter and, and, and search for uh, keywords and for um, classic, uh, different types of categories. Um, it shows you a, a map where these things are located, where they have been um, yeah, uh, based. Uh, the whole um, platform is managed by an editorial team, so the hub partners contributed, sort of checked and uh, approved the content that was provided. But it's also a really open platform in the sense that anybody can actually um, submit an own best practice. So th this is, we made the first start to collect this uh, 280 uh, best practices in there, but uh, it's open and it can be used no further to uh, grow it even yeah, to the next level. So, inside the platform you find fact sheets, which basically have a, yeah, a common layout. Uh, you include, let's say, a topic, a short abstract, and you provide uh, additional material, such as um, pictures, visuals, links to other resources. Uh, for example, these very nice video clips that have been produced, or uh, additional outcomes. And of course, you also have immediately the contact to the owner of this best practice, or the, the one who, who was leading this. Uh, to, so you can directly reach out and um, yeah, get, in, get in touch and in contact. Um, the fact sheets themselves, so in total 279 are now um, published. And out of this uh, larger set, we have this 100 best practices innovations that were uh, sort of identified as a priority of the whole network and which um, are published also in this report. Uh, these fact sheets are classified according to domains, challenges, uh, hubs and countries, and also different types of solutions. So these are different ways where you can get, enter into this um, uh, yeah, data set. Um, domains are more like different work areas within forestry. Is it more on the you know, practical uh, tree planting um, management inside the forest or is it more on, on, on later steps? Challenges addresses um, common needs and problem fields, and you can see them um, on the lower end. So if you're looking for solutions, for example, to improve forest resilience and adaptation to climate change, you can use this uh, entry point and you get the collection of all these um, challenges grouped, uh, uh, fact sheets grouped under these challenges. You can also uh, search, of course, for regional hotspots or, or topics, and the last group is um, types of solutions which actually group di different technological approaches. And um, I would like now go exactly through these different types of solutions just with uh, one example for each uh, type that we have identified to highlight a bit the, the range of um, 
yeah, technological solutions you find in there. The first um, big group is anything related to uh, censoring and measuring devices. So uh, technological av advantages uh, allow now to install really much more sensors inside the forest or use uh, remote sensing technologies um, to get really a much better um, monitoring and yeah, uh, data collection, let's say, uh, basically like that. Um, so here's an example from Austria. It's a bark beetle detection system via um, a multispectral airborne um, sensing system. Yeah. Uh, the second big group is anything about data platforms and data hubs. This is where the data becomes accessible and um, especially also state uh, forest organizations, they are making a bit uh, effort now to make the, the data more uh, available for more users. Uh, it can also be exploited by businesses or it's used really in, in large scale um, yeah, environmental monitoring. The third big groups is um, anything, uh, all kinds of applications and tools and services that are directed uh, directly for the use by the forest owner so that they um, have better access to knowledge, better access to their own property management systems. And you have lots of examples in any country. Uh, also a lot of startups, you know, are developing these kind of tools to make the life, let's say, easier for, for um, yeah, non-professionals and, and private owners. The fourth group um, includes anything related to joint forest management. So, as we know, this is a, a real challenge in our sector. This is small-scale uh, um, ownership, and there are lots of also technologically supported solutions through digitalization, through um, optimization of uh, joint measures, but also, of course, how you organize yourself uh, in, for example, um, an operational group or in the forest owner associations. Uh, yeah, lots of examples also in that field. The new group number five are marketing platforms. So these are all sorts of solutions that help um, forest owners and forest managers to um, yeah, make an easier, for example, timber purchase and trade platforms, but it goes also into the direction of um, services offered to forest owners. So that is much easier to identify the right um, service provider for you. This is a whole range of yeah, different uh, examples in there. The sixth group is a bit more advanced in the sense that this is also of both about trading and marketing, but it's really also of sharing data within the supply chain during the processing. So there are quite advanced, quite advanced um, forest land management systems offered by um, companies. Uh, there are logistical platforms where really the different actors in the supply chain um, interact uh, immediately and, and, and live. Group number seven, this is... Uh, yeah, enhancing and upgrading the machinery and the equipment with uh, data-driven support tools, with um, yeah, all, all sorts of optimization processes and systems, also to enhance, of course, um, safety and security of the whole working process. Uh, various examples in there. The <laughs> traceability is um, a key point for the forest wood supply chain because um, yeah, there is much more need and pressure now to understand where is the um, source coming from, where is the timber um, sourced from, and there are various innovative activities uh, and initiatives working on, for example, blockchain solutions, um, yeah, another group of, of importance that will also lead to more innovation in the future. The ninth group includes, let's say, also more regional and larger decision support systems, anything that relates to modeling, simulation, optimization, analyzing the forest as a whole complex system. For example, this uh, uh, example here from Austria, dynamic ecological forest site classification. This is really a, a decision support tool that helps uh, all the forest owners in that region, for example, yeah, to have a better decision um, how to orient forest management towards um, you know, changes in the climate uh, and so on. And, yeah, not yet finished. Um, number 10 is uh, comp um, compiling R&D platforms. There are a, a lot of examples in uh, countries where actually national initiatives try to uh, really bring in digitalization into the forest supply chain. And this involves various actors from um, forestry, from um, uh, IT uh, services and researchers 
to yeah, build up better platforms and find the, uh, really uh, solutions to challenges in forestry. Forestry itself has, to, has been really a, an innovation driver in many of these fields. Yeah? Quite a lot of digital solutions are also or originating in forestry. The 11th group that is very important also for our project, this involves all the initiatives related to training and education. So um, national programs, uh, local initiatives, lo local training centers, uh, portals that are being produced to make um, really um, knowledge, uh, practical knowledge, tangible knowledge accessible to forest owners. And um, the twelfth group, the almost the last group, uh, is about funding schemes and grants. So of course, the whole possibility to support, let's say, transformation in digitalization can also make of dedicated um, funding schemes and grants. And there we collected a few um, nice examples how, how this also can yeah, be, be, be used. And the last group um, focuses really about um, awareness raising. So this is not so much targeting specifically the forest owner as, as the main target group, but more the general public and educating the public about what actually um, the forest sector can contribute to um, employment, uh, economy, uh, uh, the natural environment, the, the, the climate change uh, mitigation uh, effects, and so on. So many examples of um, yeah, communication platforms and, and campaigns that use this kind of approach. Uh, another part here you see from Switzerland, it's like a, a very um, colorful, um, um, uh, let's say, art-driven uh, initiative to make people aware how many wood species uh, you have and what actually c you can do with, with wood. Um, and the third example is um, a, a map where all the wood construction uh, buildings are, uh, can be found on one portal, which is also a real yeah, interesting example how to showcase that um, wood is actually a, a material of the future. So all these um, top uh, 100 um, best practices that we have identified are um, presented in this report, um, which yeah, yeah, is accessible and um, has been already shared quite wide. And um, just to wrap it up, I would like to have a small outlook. Why does this activities, you know, uh, creating such a platform and engaging so many people, why does this really matter? And why should we continue to do this uh, as a, you know, um, joint activity and find better ways to collaborate there? Well. We are living in dramatic times. I don't have to say this in any ways. But uh, the last uh, years, um, COVID uh, and also now the um, uh, war on Ukraine uh, has shown us that we are living in turbulent times and that a crisis can happen very quickly and that they um, are overwhelming. Yeah? And that they completely change the work and the context. And since so many uh, crises have happened, I think we have forgotten a bit that the largest global challenge of all times is really the climate crisis, which is ongoing. And this um, IPCC report, which was just published uh, in the beginning of this year, has not received so much attention uh, because of so many other things that are ongoing. But this will uh, be definitely a major impact for us in the forest sector, but for the whole uh, society and uh, the planet. So, um, what becomes quite uh, apparent in many discussions also on high levels is that the forest sector is also expected to have a major contributing role in the sense that um, trees sequester carbon and if you think that on a large scale, if you think forest management on a larger scale, also increasing the, 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 the number of trees on the planet, um, forest management can provide really a, a solution to contribute um, a, a, to a large carbon sink in the built environment. Because you have to see that the built environment is actually um, responsible for 40% of all these um, greenhouse gas emissions. So if you collect all the construction sector, the built environment, the waste it generates when um, buildings are dis, uh, dem demolished. So if we would go uh, in the direction to use more wood products and also other bio-based materials which actually can store carbon for a long time. And if we manage to uh, implement this in a circular economy model, then um, this can be, become a real 
yeah, let's say, solution for climate change. And um, this means the forestry has to collaborate more also with other sectors. First of all, uh, the wood sector and the, the, the building sector. But because this really relates also to how do we want to live in the future, it relates to architecture, construction, urban planning, and so on. So on the lower end of this graphic, you see the digitalization part. And that is what Rosos has also focused about. So how can digitalization actually enable to connect this whole supply chain? From sustainable forest management, where we capture, absorb uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, by, where we also preserve biodiversity and where we have a lot of social functions, so these are not neglected. But with the sustainable forest management, we can create a, let's sort of a pump of carbon to uh, feed, let's say, a growing um, wood sector that can produce long-life wood products, which can store carbon um, for decades or why not centuries uh, in the built environment. And just to underline that this idea is really gaining momentum now is um, that the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has started to talk about wood. And this is really the first time this has happened that the president really addresses also a specific sector like that. Um, since 2021, in a State of the um, Union speech, she, she is promoting um, the new European Bauhaus, which actually has to be understood like a grassroots movement to make the Green Deal a reality. Yeah? Uh, on the side of the Commission, they will um, make legislative reforms, administrative reforms. Uh, the Green Deal is a, is a big and powerful economic package, but it needs to be uptaken by um, the societies, by social actors, by regions, by cities, you name it. And this is this new European Bauhaus initiative, which uh, everybody is talking about. It doesn't only focus on wood, it focuses actually on all kinds of bio-based um, solutions and nature-based uh, nature -based solutions and bio-based materials, so to say. But the uh, wood has an eminent role. And here you can see in this citation, just from last week, there was a high-level meeting in the Vatican, um, organized by um, this um, Bauhaus Earth Group, which is uh, founded by this eminent um, scientist, Professor John Chernhuber. Uh, so in that meeting, she, she said, sustainably harvested timber can reduce a building's carbon emissions by up to 60%. So timber is a real solution to decarbonize the built environment. And Pope Francis is so right when he says um, that humans are not meant to be inundated by cement and steel. Building more with natural elements like wood is both good for the planet and good for the well-being of people. So this is quite... Uh, yeah, uh, notable that the president, um, you know, backs this kind of concepts. And you see various initiatives in the new European Bauhaus who are addressing this area. And um, we with InnovaWood and several other associations um, uh, representing the forest-based sector, we have created this Wood for Bauhaus Alliance, which is sort of feeding in a lot of ideas also on, on that level. Um, and we are actually collaborating quite closely now with the Bauhaus Earth. There will be a new conference uh, at the end of the year. And yeah, we hope to, to be heard in that uh, arena as well. So coming back to Rosewood, I think, as you have seen, Rosewood and the forest, uh, let's say, transformation, that is part of this bigger picture. And this is how we also have under, to address this in the upcoming programs, which have been yeah, briefly presented within Horizon Europe. Forestry is focusing on forests and protecting and managing the forest, but it also has to play an even more important role in uh, wood supply and in um, yeah, the European Green Deal. So for the future cooperation, I think we have made an excellent start with this project. Rosewood 4.0 has shown that this kind of um, uh, network of hubs can really grow and can really accelerate this kind of transfer. So the dissemination function uh, will be the main, uh, let's say, outcome which we can even use further in new initiatives, new projects, new collaborations. Um, I think we should tell this story also much more clearly to the policy circle in Brussels to feed these outcomes into policy discussions and make really the case for this kind of network. And yeah, we will also discuss this uh, at this conference in, uh, today and tomorrow, how can we um, create the Rosewood 4.0 community that it sustains and grows this platform further um, with all kinds of partnerships and so on. 
the EFI bioregions initiatives was already mentioned. Uh, so the, I think the next step will be to embed the Rosewood network uh, or link it with these bioregions. And from that on, I think the network can grow even further. So thanks a lot to everybody who contributed, the whole consortium. Um, yeah, I think it's a really success story, which we should use for our fu future efforts together. Thanks a lot. Yes, 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 thank you. Wait. Thank you very much, uh, Ove. Uh, any question from the audience? We are explaining everything so good yeah. that there is no question. This is good. <laughs> In, no, okay, so we can go. Thank you very much, Ove. So we can move to the last presentation before the coffee break. This is a strengthening capacity for value creation through trainings. So I would like to invite to the stage Tilo Warner, Elke hubner tefno and Marie-Charlotte Hoffman, Hoffman from State Enterprise for Forestry and Timber, not Ring Westphalia, Forest Education and Training Center. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Javier, for presenting our German Rosewood team from Forest Education Center Arnsberg. Um, in Work Packet 3, we are responsible for training methods and training material. Um, these things were developed with our partners in the Central Europe Hub. Thank you very much for the excellent cooperation, Wood Cluster Sturia from Austria, Bern University of Applied Sciences from Switzerland, and Centre National de la Propriété Forestier Nouvelle from France. Henri, I hope that I had pronounced it in French well. I try my best. <laughs> okay. Uh, what we have done in the work package was about shortly say about content, concept, and needed infrastructure. First, we start working with an overview about uh, existing e-learning opportunities for vocational education and training. We develop training materials and training actions uh, completely for three courses. And um, all this was done, it was mentioned before, in a pretty hard time. So, uh, the trend of development is certainly heading in the right direction, I think, and this was also the initial idea for Rosewood 4.0 for this project. So, uh, COVID-19 was not a game changer for digitalization, but I think it was a catalyst for the acceptance of trainers and learners and the willingness to invest in modern teaching devices and infrastructure. I think our project Rosewood is delivering additional best, practice, best practices and experiences to support this rapid process. And I think we all have used the lockdown times in a very productive way. We start a comprehensive evaluation process to identify the most relevant and highly demanded topics for the project uh, consortium based on a, also on a consideration of the existing training programs being available. The three target groups were given in the project, uh, contractors meeting the digitalization challenge, private forest owners, and women in forestry, especially female forest owners. So uh, now we have to find the right contents for this target group. And so the first step was a joint definition of the most important topics for the training. And so we used the Rosewood kickoff meeting. This Florence workshop was very efficient and very important for the following work in the work package, but I think it was also a good team building for the hubs, and it was our common first active meeting and our first joint 
cooperative work together. In a topic portfolio, we find out the relevant topics for the partners. And in the following cluster procedure, we concretize the most frequently mentioned topics for the target groups. Digital flow, decision support systems, and resource efficiency in mechanized timber harvesting for the contractors. Digital support for private owners in need of reforestation with climate stable forest after calamity and basic knowledge and skills to integrate active forest management into the daily life of the participants. That were the contents we choose. This assessment of the actual status was a good base for our main work course concepts in the thematic area of digitalization in forestry, wood mobilization. It was completed by survey of existing e-learning offers. Marisha Lotnow gives us uh, more details about this interesting study. Yeah, we carried out this survey with uh, the help of the whole uh, Rosewood uh, 4.0 consortium and um, were able to get uh, reports on 85 uh, e-learning programs available in the, in the Rosewood regions. Um, there was a certain concentration of uh, this availability in the uh, Northern Europe hub, as expected by partners, uh, as you can see on top of this graphic. That was the expectation as uh, measured at the kickoff meeting. Um, followed by uh, Central Western Europe and uh, Southwestern Europe. Uh, well, you can see that uh, in Spain, for instance, uh, I think partners were surprised that quite a lot is available here already. Um, these 85 reported uh, uh, e-learning programs were analyzed um, as to the languages in which they were available. And as probably could be expected, but nevertheless a bit surprising, was that um, English is not very much uh, available. So dominating are the, the regional languages. And this already started our process of uh, thinking about the, the Rosewood, Rosewood 4.0 plan. Um, we, here we got the first idea that maybe developing our e-learning programs in German and then in English could probably not be enough. So we will hear more of that later. And, um, yeah. and then we saw that only 13% of them were specified as a real learning management system. So maybe to explain this here, um, this is not a YouTube channel or a website where you can download a PDF or a video, watch a video. It's a like protected environment uh, where users uh, register and uh, which can offer a high degree of interactivity if uh, fully used. So we saw here that uh, we probably would do a good job in uh, working with a learning management system ourselves. And uh, that guided the next decisions. But yeah, first we, we continue with the content development, con sorry, content development for the MOOCs. Digitalization was for us a transversal theme. We developed our training actions we want to connect also the multiple actors of the value chain, start as a base of communication, networking, and the dialogue. So we, content, we develop content, what we learn, and we develop also didactics, like training tools and methods, how we learn. For the content, content development, we choose a process-oriented approach, action-oriented or action oriented to pro professional practice. The business cases we used were European transferable. The first business case was a young couple who own forest and needs consultancy for reforestation of their climate 
damaged forests, for example, in an agency like a forest education center. The second business case was a young contractor owning harvest and forewater conduct, conducts a conversation with a forest owner to obtain an order and we overpaced a little bit. The forest owner was a nerd, a digital nerd. Uh, these two stories were told in, our, told in our trailers and the trailer should be also an inspiration for starting learning. For example, here you see the business case of harvester operation and this business case restructure the logistic chain along the highly mechanized timber harvesting in application scenarios. The application scenarios in this case is the offer preparation and the order placement, the planning and preparation of the logging operations, the implementation of the harvester operation, forwarding the logs and the transport to the mill gate. So, uh, various process steps and activities were necessary to carry out this approach, um, this um, approach, this application scenarios. Based and orientated with the, these practical activities, we made a kind of curricula development. What is needed to teach for fulfilling the working task? Which digital tools or media are necessary for execution of the task and must be shown or mentioned during the training? So, uh, this is uh, what we have done for all these applications. For example, um, if you want to plan logging operations, you have to do stand preparation. And for the stand preparation, you have in some European countries marked the trees of the remaining stand or that the trees who want, want, to, want to be cut. And you could do it in a digital marking modus. For example, there is from Steel Company a good tool which is called Logbuch for the geolocation of the trees and voice recording and transforming the vocal information up to digital contents. You also have, for example, to find or mark the strip roads where the machine moves. And uh, you have forest GIS where you could get this information and you have GPS for navigation or to mark these this strip roads with rotation lasers or digital compass. So that's about the content. What's about didactics, Elke? The project task provided for the use of new teaching and learning methods such as blending learning. Together with the Technical University of Munich, ProLehre, we have developed a didactic concept, blended learning, especially for forestry. The concept stands for didactically useful combination of face-to-face -face learning and self-directed learning online self-learning. And here you are see the concept. At first, you, it starts with this trailer that contracts uh, attention and the learner. It follows by a MOOC, it's a massive open online course with different modules. A knowledge base is created. Then a podcast is followed, it deepens the content. And then it get a webinar who provide a virtual space to exchange information. And at least the face-to-face -face event on this knowledge page, knowledge is transferred into practice. Mary Charlotte, what have we, what have we done? Uh, yeah, focusing now on the online content of the uh, fully developed hybrid, uh, sorry, of the uh, developed hybrid trainings. Um, uh, we have created uh, three MOOCs, so uh, deciding this with uh, our kick-off meeting for MOOC development with t the team of the Central West Europe Hub, um, we, we developed three MOOCs instead of one planned to address uh, each target group respectively. 
And um, here you can see the MOOCs that are available in, in the uh, learning management system. Uh, directed as uh, explained already at the uh, forestry contractors, the second digital tools for climate adapted reforestation for private forest owners. Both of them integrating as much digital tools as possible. And then a third MOOC uh, created in Austria um, directed at new urban forest owners, often female uh, forest owners, and there the focus was more to um, integrate uh, forest management into their daily lives. Uh, so uh, digitalization was not that important here. Yeah, mm, as mentioned before, um, we, we decided to get familiar with the learning management system ourselves. So uh, we had to exercise the administration, user management, management of roles, and uh, thus um, feel confident to ensure that this uh, can be used in a very flexible way after the project. Um, as uh, you can define roles here, for instance, um, yeah, different owners of courses can be made tutors and change content as they see fit uh, in, in the time to come. So the MOOCs contain the various elements um, partly already mentioned. There's a trailer for most of them. Um, there are video, short video lectures and some additional information and we included the webinars that were part of the hybrid training. So they are available here um, for, for the future. In total um, you can find there 45 video lectures and um, those three trailers. Yeah, um, in the course of the project um, together with the uh, hub managers and then more and more partners, uh, we decided that we would go into the effort of really translating these MOOCs. And translating into regional languages um, means that you not only uh, dub or subtitle the MOOCs, but you also had to, uh, um, to translate all this content that is shown in the videos and reproduce all these videos. So I think in total we are now at 150 videos that were newly produced with translated content after we had fulfilled the project's obligations. And here you see a, a short uh, overview. So uh, partners, of course, choose uh, from these MOOC uh, the content that they saw best adapted to their own regional target groups. Um, and uh, so MOOCs are available in French, in Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Croatian, Greek, Slovenian, Polish, Ukrainian. Ukrainian is very soon to come. We are working on it intensely uh, in Romanian and Slovakian. And all this will stay accessible at the Rosewood website or directly with this link um, after the project ends. And why this is possible? Because it's quite expensive. You have to know uh, producing e-learning content doesn't save time or costs. It's, it's quite time consuming and also costly. Uh, not only the, the working time, but also, of course, the, the learning management system. And uh, we are able to continue this and to have it available further because uh, the state enterprise, uh, Timber and Forest, um, uh, got very interested in the MOOCs and decided to, uh, to keep the learning management system and to expand it for their own purposes, of course. And this will be explained by Elke. Storm, drought, bark pickle investigation have destroyed more than 300,000 hectares forest in Germany and need to be replanted. For us, it's a mega task. This is a real reason for further development of this concept of rosewood. The goals of further development was to increase the practical relevance and the anti-activity of forest owners and forest experts. And another point is to counteract alienation to advancing digitalization. And the most factor is 
if you are create new things, the acceptance of this learning concept with forced management, your own colleagues is very important and no teaching from the ivory tower. That is our, our wish. And here I would uh, uh, present this uh, knowledge stairs, we called it new. And what have we done? You can see the trailer. The trailer introduced the content and the lectures. In the MOOCs, this, this massive online course, the modules are more interactivity with target tools, interactive learning cards with checkboxes, green cards, video lectures, clips, and green screens we have used also in Rosewood. And that the this, uh, the third is the on-site training in the forest. The online content is directly deepened in the practice. Here you see our one guy who I explained this new digital thing. We have the, the, the screen and he explained and you see the forest owners with their iPhones. And there is a direct exchange and experience with colleagues and forest owners. And then we have done in the forest, we have asked our forest owners to think about their forest and to send us further questions. Why? After three weeks later, we, the webinar takes place where we answer the question of our, with our forestry expert and give forest owners concrete advice. In this way, we are very close to our forest owners. This is important for us and evaluation, what is good, what is not so good. For, important for us is whether and what to extend this complex hybrid seminar helps them and what suggestions and wishes they have. We have done it in two ways. At first, on the third one in the forest, we ask them with a final discussion and secondly, via online survey. For participating this online survey, we would like to reward the first owner with a podcast, which will then be released on the platform. Yeah, what is important for us? Collecting and measuring user feedback, acceptance, quantitative use, effectiveness is very important to identify to identify sorry, trends and make improvements. I give you some results, some results. More than 83% of the users think that the combination of e-learning face-to-face is very useful. The possibilities of digitalization in reforestation sector are rated important by 80% of forest owners. What is about the spontaneous feedback give us via mail? A forest colleague said well, it was a crisp and concrete event. A forest community leader said, thank you very much for this exceedingly great seminar. And for our University of RWTH Aachen, they think that these learning modules are, uh, I have a very good quality. What is about the use? If you are looking at the platform, you can see about how long are the learners on this platform. In average time, 37 minutes at these modules of this massive online course MOOC. Five hours they were on site in the forest, one, uh, one hour webinar and three minutes podcast. This is the total learner time. What is the use of Rosewood? Rosewood Blueprint is used in other projects like blended learning courses in forestry and construction. The entire further education and training of North Rhine-Westphalian forest administration is mapped via this learning platform. The Rosewood blended learning concept with these integrated learning tools are learning with all senses in forestry sector. It promotes the learning among the target group as well as the ability uh, for effective self-study. Costs. Innovation costs of course creation and LMS development are enormous. And this is our wish. 
A European development is very important for the promotion of digitalization and knowledge transfer. And what are our yeah, summary the develop of Rosot 5.0? The development learning management system and learning formats, MOOCs and webinars are accepted and used for the knowledge transfer in the cluster Forest and Wood. The use results of this project, best practice and blueprints are available in 13 languages and can be used for own national projects. The achievement of Rose for 5.0 are secured and freely available in the learning platform Wald and Holz NRW for a long term. Perspective. Knowledge management is one of the key success factors to ensure the productivity and competitiveness in the forest and wood cluster. Therefore, an innovative further development and the competence development of the lectures on an international level is indispensable. Coming to our general conclusion. Florence and Barcelona, we start and fin finalized our project into wonderful towns with impressive locations. Thank you to our local host from EFI for organizing this meeting. Also, thank you for the project coordinator Steinbeis and the hub managers. It's not easy to manage such a comprehensive project in this given time frame. 21 partners from 18 countries and huge networks and Javier, I think, Sometimes not easy to handle, but I think it was an excellent cooperation and teamwork. Henry Ford said, coming together is the beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. Just remember our kickoff meeting, workshop meeting in Florence. We evaluated your previous experience in the field of e-learning and your expectations for the project. We ask you, where do you think you are at the morning, at the moment, concerning e-learning? Where do you want to be at the end of the project? And I think we have all together reached more than we could await. We have done good work and great teamwork. This project, Rosewood, is fully in the line with the funding idea of the European Union, I think. Why and how the European Union spent money is often discussed in their EU member countries and it was seen very critically in the recent years. The basic ideas of the founding fathers of the EU recede somewhat a little bit in the background. The basic idea is states that are friends with each other and help each other do not wait wage war against each other. This is the basic idea that leads to the European Union, and this idea is more relevant now than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elke, Tilo, Marie Charlotte, for this really interesting presentation. Any question? It's not, um, we have some delay, and really bad uh, with the time in management, sorry. But uh, we will have this uh, coffee break, and we will be back on 11.45. Thank you.
So, uh, welcome back. We are going to the last part of this uh, session one. And in, in this um, part, we are going to present the five regional hub. You had already heard about the, the five uh, hubs. They have a, a central and crucial role in the, in, the, in the project. So the five uh, hub managers, they are going to present briefly the, the activities and the achievement. So it's my pleasure to present First place, Jussi um, Sopela, Lapland University for Applied Science from Finland, from the North Air uh, Hubs. Second place, um, Bisnia Koskar, Boot um, Cluster Styria from Austria, from the Central West Hub. Lesia Loiko from the Agency for Sustainable, Sustainable, Sustainable Development of the Carpathian Region from the Ukraine, Central East Hub. Uh, Ricardo Castellini from Castilla y León Good and Forest Service Center, Spain, from the Southern West Hub. And the fifth is Ivan Ambrose from Competence Center for Research and Development from Croatia, Southern East Hub. So please, Yusin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm not the hub manager of Northern Hub, but uh, because Mary Laajanen was not able to be at present, I will tell the results of Northern Hub. So, first, uh, Northern Hub is composed from three countries, Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and from uh, four organizations, Luas and Luke from Finland, and Paper from Sweden, and Treetoriet from Norway. We started uh, our project by uh, trying to find best practices and innovations, which we succeeded to find totally more than 70. And uh, <clears throat> the roadmap process started by uh, compiling a common SWOT by all the hub partners. And the SWOT was validated by our experts. And the whole roadmap was done in March last year. Uh, we used uh, the best practices uh, for construction of the roadmap and we also added them to knowledge platform where you can find totally 55 of them from our hub. And uh, here you can see the main items from our SWOT, main treats and main weaknesses. Uh, so I can read here, there's urbanization and lack of attractivity for forested jobs, uh, climate change, lack of funding for research and development, and uh, social acceptance of forestry, more national and EU restrictions on forestry harvesting operations nowadays, aging of forest owners, which is uh, quite uh, severe, uh, all the time in all the countries. And about the weaknesses, uh, uh, there are lots of uh, decreased and uh, decreased interest and uh, low competence of forestry among forest owners in these countries. Uh, we have lack of qualified forestry labor in all the countries. The forest roads are not in good condition and there are management uh, areas of young forests also in all of, of our participant countries. And there are always also a lack of knowledge on recycling and circular businesses models. And um, <clears throat> we uh, choose the most urgent needs and challenges from our Northern Hub, which are as follows, social acceptance of forestry, which means that uh, there are lots of discussions about the land use of forests nowadays. And these discussions are concerning about how widely forests should be protected. Climate change is uh, uh, good for us because growing season might lengthen the growing season and increase growth. But this is only one side. Of course, there will be problems of the insects and damages, and also uh, the climate change will result less ground frost during winter time, which uh, leads to problems in harvesting 
especially in peatland forests, which is very difficult because we have lots of peatland forests in Finland, for example. And two more. High age, urbanization and continued passiveness of forest owners and fragmentation of forest estates. That's one big question. And lack of skilled workforce uh, appears so that uh, uh, we don't have enough forest machine operators and other forest workers or timber transport workers. Uh, although we have education for them in vocational schools. But uh, there's another problem that those graduated forest machine drivers are often not enough motivated, motivated to stay in forestry field. And that's also a difficult question. And then uh, we choose two challenges where we try to match best practices. First one, concerns about the interest and competence of forest owners, and we match uh, three best practices to get the situation better. Uh, Forestry Extension Institute from Norway, Finnish Forest Association from Finland, and Forest Finland campaign. It continues all the time with uh, renewing finance. Another challenge, uh, climate change. The found two matching best practices, Arbo Air for Sphering and Festmeter for Austria, which are detecting bark beetle, beetles by drone monitoring. And <clears throat> as uh, Javier already mentioned, Tigatech won our business idea creation workshop, and this enterprise uh, was presented uh, during the study visit in Sweden and Norway in May. Uh, and um, uh, after this contact, uh, they, there is already, and after that, established uh, cooperation with, uh, with Meyer Malnhoff from Austria, which may lead to further cooperation, we will see. And Innovations Camp uh, got an idea from Evergreen Innovation Camp, which was also uh, basically an idea from Austria. And this Innovations Camp uh, uh, was implemented in Norway, and it's going to be an annual event with a larger context So uh, after this. In Finland, uh, Science Center Pilke uh, was one important uh, best practice. Uh, and uh, actually, we had a meeting there in, in the first day. And this uh, center was interested especially to Forza, because uh, in Ukraine, they have plans to build similar kind of center somewhere there. Vetsan.fi application uh, is very fruitful in Finland. And they have already launched it to France, and uh, a new application is inside. And they might get more financing with a large-scale project in the future. We will see it in September, or how it goes, Andri. And about the activities we have had, we have had a lot of uh, expert workshops, business workshops, all in online. We had made seven videos. We have had four study visits, two online, two in contact. And we have made uh, two MOOC replications, one in Norway, one in Sweden. And we have had two P2P trainings, one in Norway and one in Finland this spring. And some examples from the study visits. First one from Rovaniemi. Um, we had uh, eight partners as a guests and from five countries, Poland, Ukraine, Spain, Austria, and Romania. And we presented quite a lot of our best practices there. And in the other uh, picture, you can see the simulators in second day of the study visit, where we visited the vocational forest educational school. 
that they use the simulators. And another study visit in contact implement, was implemented in uh, Sweden and Norway, where they have even 15 partners from three countries, and also uh, quite too many of best practices were presented there. And I suppose that quite too many of you here have also participated in this study visit. And we have also done lots, quite a lot of dissemination activities, like uh, articles, social media posts, and other, other dissemination activities, like uh, dissemination web webinar this spring, and uh, the surroundings or environment for, for social media we have used are LinkedIn and Facebook and organizations' web pages. That was it shortly. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to represent uh, Central West European Hub and to present you the outcomes and activities that have uh, been organized and produced by our partners. And uh, when we are now talking about the partners in our hub, uh, we had the uh, following partners, and this is Bern University of Applied Sciences from Switzerland, from Germany, State Enterprise for Forestry and Timber, North Rhine-Westphalia, from France, Centre National de la Propriété Forestière, and from Austria, our company Wood Cluster Styria, which uh, we were also hub manager for um, and responsible for coordination of the acti activities between our partner countries and organizing every one or two months uh, virtual meetings in our hub. As one, uh, one of the first activities uh, was um, of the project, we created a roadmap uh, at the hub level. Uh, this work was done during several intensive months with numerous regional and three interregional workshops with a large number of national experts. Regarding the strengths in our hub, uh, we have detected that, or it is very clear that our regions have sufficient available certified resources which are operated under sustainable managed systems. We have also high quality infrastructure of the forest sector and also highly functional supply chain. Our hub holds also excellent knowledge of forest management and also a well-developed roundwood market. Well-trained professionals manage forests of any type of ownership professionally and sustainably. In terms of weaknesses, uh, the fragmented ownership with many private small-scale and uh, forestry owners leaves some of the potential of the forest unused. There is also lack of communication between different sectors of chain of custody, and also we are region uh, with the high prices and high wages. So to keep this in balance, it is necessary to maintain high productivity and excellent product quality by exploiting state-of-the-art technologies and production co concepts. One of the weaknesses is also declining interests in active forest management, and also increasing share of urbanized forest owners disconnected from their, their forests. Therefore, in the Central West Hub, we face weaknesses in social societal matters like communication outside the sector, lack of public interest and knowledge transfer. There are also some of the opportunities that we have detected. Uh, this is uh, one of the most important is digitalization of harvesting and management services as uh, uh, to raise productivity. Also education and communication to, s to actually in, uh, in wider public and urbanized forest owner is an another opportunity. Um, development also of new value added products and developing new business model in the context of circular economy is, is one of the opportunities for us and emerging growing markets for timber structures that we can actually witness today. Climate change and the ongoing trend for urbanization are the main threats for the forest sector in our hub. Unmanaged forest stands with the high stock are increasingly vulnerable to calamities. Shortage of skilled workers due to our, our 
aging workforce and also low willingness, capability to invest in new technologies or major digital innovations due to high cost pressures. To sum up, um, there are in a need analysis in our hub, uh, or our hub has to focus on three most important aspects. First is finding responses, responses to climate changes and their negative impact of the forestry, on the forestry sector. The second one is finding responses to urbanization of the forest owners, especially focusing on uptake of digital technologies. And the third one, and this is almost in every of our countries, there is an evident need for skilled workforce. So the forest-related jobs need to be modernized and digitalized to attract younger labor. We have discussed in our hub and with our pool of experts how can we respond to these challenges and needs. And some of the solutions lie in transferring the best practices and innovations from other partner countries and hubs and the best practices like these on the, on the right side here that were de detected also in our project. We have also worked on that, but before I would like to say some words about our best practices and innovation that were identified in our hub. So we uh, have carried desktop research and also expert interviews and stakeholder workshops, and we have selected in our hub 96 best practices and innovation, of which 27 were selected in Austria, 41 in Germany, 17 in Switzerland, and 11 in France. So we can say that uh, our Central West European hub is rich in best practices and innovation and research projects related to the topic of wood mobilization in the forests. Some of these best practices are most important from our countries. We have also described uh, or filmed in the videos. So we have produced in some nine videos four uh, best practices. This is from Austria Foresight Project, Dynamic Forest Site Classification. One from Germany, Wald und Holz 4.0 Competence Center. From far France, we have a video on, about La Forêt Bouge. Switzerland soil protection root depth measurement with a terrestrial laser scanner and we have produced one joint hub video on forest challenges and solutions in Central West Europe. We have also produced two videos on study visits, one was in France in Mimizan and one from the study visit in Austria in Styria that was uh, one month ago and two project dissemination videos on German language but also translated on English. Development of new business opportunities. So uh, we have, um, there are missions to the best practice cases that was very valuable in this project and most of them, uh, or every of these five, we have uh, done in on site. So we have organized the first mission uh, in Ansberg in Germany and we always tried to include other activities from the project like validation workshops or bilateral, multilateral, B2B uh, talks. The second one is, was in For, es For Expo in September 2021 in Mimizan in Fr France. It is uh, the biggest forest fair in uh, France. Third was a joint Central West Europe and with Norton Partners. Uh, Norton Hub Partners, with, uh, we had the mission to Sweden and Norway with the companies from Austria. Fourth was mission to Norton Europe, to Finland in May 22. And fifth joint also um, mission to, from the Southeastern Europe Hub and our hub. Uh, it was mission to Styria, to Austria with uh, almost 40 participants. So um, we organized two business idea creation workshops and it is uh, very logically that we had uh, these two topics after uh, our SWOT analysis and need analysis. So we had two topics. Uh, the first one was the role of digitization in the climate adapt of adaptation of the forest. And the second was uh, digitization as a key for attractiveness for forest working conditions. And the outcomes of these business idea crea creations workshops uh, was that we have several joint proposals in the Austrian Forest Fund, open for now just for Austrian partners only, 
So first one was uh, forest information systems on adaptive forest management. This project was submitted and also recently approved. Uh, this project is based on and inspired by pro best practices from our project like Foresight, Wald Info, NRV, or Virtual Forest from 2.0 from Finland. The second project that we have submitted is a roundwood tracking system from Logyard to final product. It is industrial led consortium inspired by Microtech and also by Tiger Tech from Northern uh, European Hub. And the third one is establishment of national bioeconomy cluster cast, uh, is cross-casting, submitted and also approved project in our uh, forest fund. Then we also, um, on behalf of the activities that we have done here in, in the project, we submitted Erasmus Plus project together with our German partner. Uh, on boosting digital competences and skill in forest education. So the German partners, Austrian partner, Estland and Italian partners. We are still waiting for the response. So beside that, we have numerous bilateral transfer activity facilitated, business oriented, where we, get, uh, get, where we joined uh, partners and the best practices, where we organized uh, round tables and so on. You can see here some of the and I would like to, on behalf of the team of the Central West Europe, um, say thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, I would like to say to all of our partners, thank you very much for a fr fruitful and successful collaboration. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to present to you the results of the um, Central East European Hub. Yes, so um, our hub is formed by four partner organizations uh, coming from four countries. Lukasiewicz Research Network, Poznan Institute of Technology from Poland, the Provood Regional Wood Cluster from Romania, the National Forest Center uh, from Slovakia, um, our organization that I represent and also the hub manager, Forza, Agency for Sustainable Development of the Carpathian uh, region from Ukraine. Um, I'm also happy to announce that um, during the project, we, um, our hub has uh, grown and became stronger because um, Institute of Forest Ecosystem Research Monitoring and Mapping Solutions IFER from Czech Republic joined uh, our hub. And uh, I would like to mention that this organization is well known, that it develops and offers an own original product, field map, advanced software tools for computer-aided field data collection and uh, data processing. And we are thinking and considering further collaboration after the project ends uh, with this organization as well. Um, as other organizations, as other partners uh, of the project, we have conducted the SWOT analysis uh, per country and per hub in collaboration with many experts from all the countries during uh, several validation workshops. So when we looked at the current status of the wood value chain in each hub of the region, we found weaknesses. Some of them you see on the slide are obvious, but some of them are like the lower part of the iceberg, not seen um, if you don't look more precisely to, to the sector. So uh, poor climate adaptive thinking and digital thinking of forest authorities and decision makers, um, low level of cooperation among uh, actors along the value chain, um, underutilization of food waste from harvesting, high focus on export to food in the rough, uh, in the, uh, yes, rough or sown wood versus processed goods, and limited strategic orientation and planning in the wood in industry. These are the few weaknesses that we have um, detected uh, during, during the project when we looked precisely to the sector. As other hubs, we also developed the, our roadmap per country and also one regional roadmap, just few conclusions to mention, at the moment, we, we 
state that the forest sector still remains a low-tech industry, rolling out sustainable forestry and with high focus on lower added uh, products. This is not so good. But there is a potential for, for growth in digitalization and circular economy, and this is good. And the interest that countries, our partners and our experts that we talk to during the project show gives us hope for uh, good and um, perspective developments, especially in the digital solutions as a transverse and enabling technologies, increasing openness and transparency of the market experts. Public demand is very high for transparency and law enforcement, and this is that was mentioned uh, in um, basically all the countries of our hub. And the sector is expected to push forward the transparency practices and uh, develop related know-how. So as other um, partners, we also had uh, three validation workshops um, with 64 participants all in all from the four countries. Um, we have um, selected 53 best practices in our hub, but then when we looked more thoroughly, you know, trying and addressing the best practices with the weaknesses and opportunities, so we shortlisted 18 practices that are available uh, on the web platform. So we set development targets and we also selected, as you see on this slide, uh, matching best practices from our hub and also from other hubs um, of, of our consortium. So the climate change, focusing on control and monitoring mechanisms, you see the best practices, uh, ELOS, Detected, Mileva, adaptation of current silvicultural systems and practices to mitigate the impact of climate change, induced calamities on forest ecosystems, invasivke, green city cadastre, uh, qualified labor and addressing gaps in education, Kokkurs, Pilke, that you have heard the presentation uh, earlier, uh, Avatar, silvicultural practices with METSA uh, in Finland and Eivald, communication technologies and platforms, uh, digitalization of forestry supplies uh, for, uh, and logbook, Moigosdar, um, drones in forestry planning, forest data bank from our uh, hub, and so on. Um, the knowledge platform uh, that it was developed, and you have heard the presentation previously, uh, we find it as a useful tool that provides easy access to information and, you know, a, just a great place where you can find many things that might be needed for various stakeholders uh, along the value chain. So, really, we made a deliberate effort from our um, hub to uh, translate the best practices into national languages. So, I can uh, say that we have translated 56 best practices to our country languages, 24. Uh, five to Ukrainian, 12 to Polish, seven to Romanian, and 12 to Slovak uh, languages. Uh, we still go on with the Ukrainian translation, and I think uh, approximately 10 more practices will be soon available. Why is this important? Often our forestry stakeholders, unfortunately, do not speak um, English, do not read English. So if they can get the first glimpse of information about so many useful practices in Ukrainian, and then if they are interested, you know, go on with, the, um, with more in-depth um, information. So, as other hubs, we have organized two um, study visits. Unfortunately, those were in the high times of COVID, so they could take place only virtually. The, uh, both of them took place in uh, last September 2021. The one best practice, Shumal in Romania, um, the digital forest management tool was presented that improves the transparency of the forest management from inventory to harvesting and transportation to the user, and um, approximately 20 participants participated uh, in that event. Um, we can state that the other uh, study tour um, 
the visit Rembio for best practice in Poland was uh, very successful because uh, 65 participants from seven countries participated in it. And the remote sensing based assessment of woody biomass and carbon storage in forest, complex method of defining selected forest stand descriptions, as well as uh, the biomass and carbon sequestration was presented uh, on that study tour. Um, we are happy that finally in May, which was a very um, extensive and um, uh, reach in events, we could uh, also participate in uh, offline study visits and three uh, representatives of um, our hub were part of the study visit you just heard from, from Vishnya previously. Um, for us as uh, Forza, we were very much interested in innovations in wood construction, so the part when we visited the um, producer of the uh, CLT panels and when we saw the Q7 district in Graz where the wooden uh, building is prevailing it was very impressive and um, we would like to apply um, this um, using wood in our center. You see mentioned that uh, Forza is going to build a forest um, and climate demonstration and information and training center. So um, all that knowledge that we received uh, was very uh, useful for us. Our other partners from Poland and Romania were interested in digital solutions for the bark beetle detection and also the forest site classification and mapping, the foresight uh, best practice. And also uh, on, during this study tour, um, best practices from uh, our hub were presented in Styria, Prozel, Lassin Foresight Monitoring by Taxus uh, IT. The other study visit was to Finland, and we are thankful to both our um, partners, hub in, hubs in, um, from North and also the Central West, in sharing the information. Uh, we Forza were especially interested in this Pilke Science Center, you know, how the uh, forest is taught and how people are uh, sensitized, you know, to the importance of the forest. Uh, and we will take up many things. We have created a good partnership with the management of the uh, management of the um, center. We also were really impressed by the um, virtual forest two um, zero. Uh, yes, this uh, instrument, and actually we even dubbed it to Ukrainian because there was a high interest. So this best, uh, this video about the best practice is also available in Ukrainian. And also our partners uh, looked with interest from uh, Romania and Poland to the wood force and log force um, um, projects and uh, practices uh, of uh, planning for harvesting. Um, I myself <clears throat> was lucky also and thankful to the project that I could participate and I take it also as a study visit in the 16 uh, European uh, Forest Pedagogics Conference because um, our organization makes um, a big effort on the forest education and during that congress more than 100 uh, participants from all over, over Europe looked uh, at the issues of how to um, teach about the forest and the climate change in innovative ways, you know, using di digital tools, especially for children and youngsters uh, and uh, this education shall help us to tackle the climate uh, crisis more effectively. When we looked at the, um, you know, the um, weaknesses and the opportunities in, in two countries of Poland and Ukraine, we saw that we have a lot of in common. For example, you know, most of the forests in our countries are state-owned. And uh, we have conducted one event which actually was not planned within the project, but was very important and demanded by our stakeholders. And this is the Digital Forest Day that took place uh, last September. And there we have gathered um, research, academia, state forest management um, uh, representatives and also NGOs to discuss really important questions. So where we are with the digital technologies in our countries, in the state forest sector of Ukraine and Poland. What influences uh, the level of digitalization? What are the areas and domains where it is more applied, less applied? And what are the trends in the world and Europe that we can take up in our two countries? And what challenges we have to, uh, to tackle 
in order to increase the wider application of digital technologies. We were happy that from Ukraine we could involve the highest, let's say, positioned person in the forest sector, the chief digital transformation officer and the deputy head of the State Forest Agency of Forest Resources. It, for us it was important that he sees how things happen in Poland because our uh, management often looks at the po at, at Poland example as an inspiration and also um, defines you know what we need uh, in what areas we can collaborate further on uh, for the knowledge transfer um, basically the last event that just happened last Friday in our that I would like to report to you was this collaborative project development workshop in Poland it was a hybrid event and uh, participants uh, could participate online as well as offline. Besides of the information that, um, you know, was basically, as Javier mentioned, common to uh, all the hubs that uh, have gone through this event, um, we also managed to talk about um, um, needs and competencies. Um, of the, let's say, businesses and the needs of the businesses and competencies that research and academia can offer to address those needs and discuss potential uh, uh, ideas for the uh, collaboration projects. So to outline those are surely digitalization of forestry and wood sector, for example, modern production technologies in sawmilling, wood traceability, using sensors to detect forest threats, and we also discussed the funding schemes that might be applied and besides of Horizon Europe that is a huge opportunity for many countries. We also discussed regional opportunities of Eureka and Yupco, cross-border cooperation, Interreg and other uh, programs. It was important that together with the um, Lukashevich Research Network, it was an institute of technology, um, um, the co-organizer of this event was the industry contact point digital transformation in Poland. Yes, we, as other partners, we have made an effort on dissemination activities. There were many activities online and offline. Just to mention that our Romanian partner, ProVood, um, presented the, our project on the joint Romanian-Bulgarian cluster conference, Bioeconomy as a driver for green, sustainable and inclusive growth. Um, during the gold label assessment process conducted by the European Secretariat of Cluster Analysis and many, many others, we have uh, made uh, Facebook pages, um, uh, tweets and uh, face Facebook uh, information, published articles in the forestry magazines, etc. So my last slide that I would like to share with you is not really uh, related to the hub, but um, I would like to use this opportunity um, to thank all of you who um, supported us, who proposed support after the work has happened. And um, on this slide, you see smiling people, but also a destroyed building of the Ukrainian forest and uh, planning unit in Irpin. Probably you have heard about this city if you follow the news on the war. There are many challenges that um, our um, forest sector faces right now. 20% uh, of forest is occupied. The 20% of forest is mined. There are mines in the forest. People cannot go in. Um, the um, amount of the f um, fires tripled in comparison with uh, last year because of the missiles shooting and uh, bombing. So um, there are many um, environmental crimes that we started to um, to document. We even have an application where people can report about the environmental crimes. Why is this slide? Um, why I put this slide? Um, I, I know that in this uh, room there are already ideas for further cooperation and maybe project ideas. So I would like to ask you to invite Ukrainian partners to these collaboration projects. I think this is important for us and uh, I think it will be your great input to our victory of Ukraine. Thank you. Yes. 
Okay, so I'm seeing Eduard and Javier watching the watch all the time. So guys, ju I had just this, don't worry. I'll be very quick. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the Southern West uh, Hub, our main results and uh, outcomes. First of all, who we are? Well, we are uh, from uh, Portugal, the University of Lisbon, from Italy, the Italian Agroforestry Energy Association, from France, the National Center for Forestry Property, and uh, CC4, which is the Wood and Forest uh, um, Service of the region Castilla y Leon. I would like to thank you all for your presence, but in particular the colleagues Henri Husson uh, from uh, France, Andrea Arniani from Italy, Susanna Barreiro is not here for uh, uh, work reasons, and I also would like to mention Angela Garcia, which uh, has been our project manager for more than two years. Well, this is uh, things you already know from our roadmap. I will be very quickly just summarizing. Uh, also from the former Rosewood project, our problematics are uh, still the same. The fragmented private forest properties is still at the top. The weak connection between forest and wood part of the forest wood value chain, the low level of cooperation among actors along the value chain, and the dominance of traditional meaning non-digital logistic solutions in sawmill industry. The low level of digitalization of business processes, especially in, in SMEs, and the lack of, of digital skills among private forestry owners. Our achievements, well, it says, uh, like all of you, we spent a lot of time in searching new best practices and innovation. I guess we made a huge work, which is available on the website, on the on the platform, here you can see some uh, examples. The best of the best has been selected uh, for, the, for the videos. Uh, we have uh, one video from France, uh, two from Italy, one from Portugal, and two from, uh, from Spain. We made two beautiful study visits. The first was in Caracedelo, in uh, Castilla y León, in Spain, around the popular value chain. This is a piece very, very important for, uh, for our Spanish uh, context. The second one was uh, in the Italian Eastern Alps, around the wood for biomass uh, sector. We saw there the problems around the forest fragmentation, the structural lack of sawmills and the forest roads and so on. Some main dissemination activities, uh, yeah, uh, Javier, you already mentioned the participation in the Mediterranean Forest Week where I could uh, collect uh, various expression of interest, especially from Turkish entities to join our new uh, Rosewood network, which will be launched to, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Then I would like to uh, remember that CC4 launched uh, a specific newsletter, bi-monthly bi publication, <coughs> Uh, dedicated to the Rosewood um, best practices uh, for the whole Spanish forestry sector. Uh, and well, our, uh, our guys, well, the main, the, the, um, the Oscar goes to Andrea uh, for, the, for the Italian video, <laughs> which is available only on YouTube. It was easy because you are the youngest uh, of the project, so it was easy. <laughs> And I would like to spend some time to read the, our conclusions. Well, the difference in development in the different countries and regions is, is evident. Uh, with the technologies and their application in northern and central western Europe standing out, making their industry more competitive compared to the rest of the countries. However, they also face a common problem across Europe the difficulty of finding trained machine operators, the loss of interest in general in the forestry work. Continuing to innovate in technologies that facilitate harvesting work by providing greater safety and quality are essential to ensure the continuity of work in the forestry environment, in most cases in rural areas. In this field, technologies such as Forward 2020, High Vision, Avatar or Forest HQ stand out. 
It is precisely the rural environment and the loss of interest in the forest sector that lead to the abandonment and mismanagement of forests. New technologies provide management support tools, collaboration platforms, and access to all kinds of information. They are technological tools that allow the mapping of forest holdings, information on the existing wood in each of them, and contact with buyers and industrialists, up to the marketing of the products themselves, for example, forest map. They also allow less experienced forest owners to make better use of their plots, for example, with digital platforms such as Metsan.fi or La Forêt Bouche. The same problem is linked to the need to accelerate land consolidation in certain cases, and there are technologies that facilitate this and are being successfully applied in several countries, such as Areas Florestais Agrupadas, which is a Portuguese best practice. Well, in Southwest Europe, the knowledge of technologies is high, and innovation is also high in the research sector but its adoption in companies and different areas is uneven, especially complicated in small companies and with, and with less access to technology. Therefore, support to the sector and the dissemination of information are still necessary for its implementation. In the Rosewood 4.0 project we traced the path, efforts have focused the on the transfer of information through talks, video, MOOCs, that will feed the European Forest Advisory System. And above all, all the knowledge platform that provides details and content data of the latest technological advances to bring these developments to all points in the value chain of the mobilization boot. Well, I hope that we will be able to get more projects because we are a beautiful partnership and uh, we deserve it. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, I will uh, tell you something about Southern East Hub and what we did. But first, let me uh, please thank you, our uh, partners from the uh, Southeast Europe Hub, uh, Slovenian Forest Research Institute and uh, Bioeconomy and Environment Cluster from Western Macedonia for, from Greece who together with Competence Center formed basically partnership of South, Southeast Europe Hub. And, uh, of course, uh, we, we functioned on international level, so all other countries uh, were involved in, uh, in the part of Southeast Europe in our activities. Since you, you heard about all the hubs, uh, basically we all had uh, similar activities in the framework of uh, scanning and analyzing the situation in Greece, Slovenia, and Croatia. We saw a great deal of uh, similarities, but also differences. We managed to comprehend everything in, in the form of roadmap, uh, where we were focused on some uh, things that were in generally in, in, uh, in our or uh, in entire interest. So we were talking in our roadmap about local wood for local use. This is the, the, the very important in the sense that we are now facing the situation that we will be forced to do much with less. So uh, area of forest which is mobilized cannot be, uh, cannot be bigger than it is now. So our wood industry and our innovation in the entire forest-based value chain have to bring uh, more added value from less uh, wood material. That is very obvious. Uh, we started with, of course, SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and uh, threats. And uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, we managed to uh, get to mobilize a great deal of various stakeholders from entire forest-based value chain. So from the foresters, from the associations of, uh, of foresters, 
with, together with food industry, with uh, environment protection. Uh, basically, we managed to talk about entire circular economy or bioeconomy of forestry and wood industry. And that is why it, it, it is very important that we uh, built not only a national value chain, but in this case, international, southeast, uh, in, in the area of, of southeast Europe, uh, and hopefully at the end of this project also European level. Also, we interacted with a lot of uh, activities of European Commission and all the other projects, like uh, EU Green Week, which was uh, organized under the topic of a new beginning for people and nature, which is perfectly in line of Rose 40 project. We managed together with our participants to create some business idea based on our best practice examples and innovations. And uh, as you will see in, in the future, both uh, all, all three stakeholders of Southeast Europe Hub, Greece, Slovenia, and, and Croatia, uh, gathered together uh, and uh, focused on one topic. And, and this is the Biomass Trade Center. And, uh, and in this moment, I can say that we have uh, really serious plans about following projects, hopefully doing together. Uh, about all that, we talked uh, during our study visits, which were very, very good, especially the last one we had together with our colleagues from Graz and Holz Cluster Steiermark organized. And again, I want to emphasize that we were, we were really pleasantly uh, surprised with, with always a, a great, great deal of uh, attendees and participants. So in Croatia, basically on our local level of Ukvarsrim County, we have a great deal of uh, support from Croatian Forest as a state-owned company, from our private forest owners, but also wood industry, our wood cluster. Uh, we really managed to, to build a local and international story which is, which is growing every day. Also, I have to say, uh, that the B2B events were, were very, very good. And uh, of course, like all, all other uh, hubs, we did our uh, mocks and we managed even to, to translate some of them in Croatian language because in forestry we have this language barrier. Uh, a lot of material should be available in Croatian. We are dealing with this and hopefully we will have much more materials in Croatian. Also, very important fact was collaboration with other projects and participation on, on other events, uh, where I can say that some, some projects and, and some stakeholders even see us as a, as a guideline and uh, as, as, as a lighthouse in this area. And for this, uh, of course, it, it, is, it is important to, to help others uh, get on board together with us. Also, we had uh, many dissemination activities on local, interregional, and, and European level. And uh, I, I want to conclude with a uh, reminiscence to 2018, when, when we had a kickoff meeting for the first Rose project in Stuttgart, and some of colleagues were there. And a project officer from Brussels said to us, uh, I congratulate you all because you are now in Champions League. So we are, we are still playing in Champions League. So I want to thank you all and congratulate us all on this playing in Champions League. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the five of you for this interesting presentation. So it seemed that we did a lot or you did a lot during the, in the project. Um, we have prepared some questions. We have the time problem, but at least I would like to share one question with you so you will have up to two minutes for each hub manager to, to answer this question. Um, this is a very general question. This is as a hub manager, which is your main lesson learned from the Rosewood 4.0 project? Maybe you, so you can start. Okay, well, <clears throat> I have learned to cooperate in a very large international projects and uh, got 
lots of information from European forestry, especially the best practices, of course, and innovations. But also, uh, I have learned a lot from our neighborhood countries. Although we are very close to each other, each other we haven't uh, cooperated enough, I would say, and hopefully in the future that is possible. And uh, of course, I also hope that we can continue with this large Rosewood network. Mm -hmm. Can you hear the currently? Yes, okay. Perfect. Vizinha, what is your... Well, um, what is most important that uh, there are so many excellent um, solutions uh, in the countries and there are so many hidden champions. Uh, and it is very important to detect them. It is very important to network, also to transfer this knowledge, because we often, and especially our companies, and we, we ourselves uh, are thinking, okay, um, we don't have time because we are busy with other things. But once we had companies on the workshops and together with us on the business trips, they were very, very happy to be there, to see the best practices. And you, it, it could be seen that right away they had new ideas and they followed the new, new and they had great inputs. And this is very uh, amazing thing that I have experienced in this project and I'm very thankful for that. Ricardo. Well, in general, uh, what I learned is that we, are, we have a lot of money dedicated in the framework of the um, European Commission and uh, on the calls you know, on the Horizon 2020 and now Horizon Europe uh, for the new technologies, the innovation, so we have to invent something new. But we maybe demonstrated that in the framework of the CSA, the Coordination and Subprotections, that sometimes it's enough to copy. And so we have to invent nothing, you know? We just have to look to, the, to our neighborhood to neighbor, neighbor and, and maybe we can find a solution for our territory just copying uh, best practice or innovation. And uh, I guess uh, all the material available thanks to Rosewood can help a lot, a lot of regions to solve some problem just copying. And it's not a shame. Yeah, the knowledge exchange and transfer is uh, essential. Lesia. Yes. I wanted to continue to take up the thought of uh, Ricardo. I wanted to say that, you know, there is no need to invent the bicycle again. Yes, there are so many solutions already, digital solutions and innovations that can help our stakeholders in our countries. Surely there are more developed countries, uh, and you also saw when we looked at this thread, where are people with the e-learning, yes, where are the countries with e-learning? Um, the Northern Hub in Sweden and other members of Northern Hub, Spain, was among champions. We are a bit lacking behind, but there are these great tools that we have now, MOOC, that we, can, we, have, we will have in uh, national languages that can be used. Um, also, there are so many digital solutions that can increase the uh, use of uh, wood, because the demand is high now, yes, many uh, countries decrease their dependence on Russian um, oil and gas. And we, don't, we have only so much forests, but there are solutions that can help us to utilize the forest better. And uh, all the uh, best practices that we collected, each and every, um, let's say, stakeholder from forestry or wood processing or wood construction surely can find there something that will inspire, you know, for further changes and, and moving forward. Well, regarding Competence Center, I can say, uh, I, I would like again to, to return in the past a little bit. Uh, when we finished first Rosewood, we had together final conference and kickoff meeting for a, mm -hmm. for a new project. Uh, let's say six months or one, one year before, uh, in the, we were finalizing Rosewood project and planning to have one project together. And in the uh, moment of final conference, uh, our, uh, so we, we just had Rosewood for zero. At this point, we have many, many joint projects. So we are really growing, and what we learned is something that we knew already, and that is entire European European Union is basically 
based on cooperation. Uh, as if we cooperate more, we get better results. We had only one continuation of project with Rosewood. Now, I think around 10, let's say. Not, not all the project partners are in all consortia, but that, that is the network. Find yourself, in, find your interest in where, where it is uh, uh, best. So, thank you very much, Yusi, Isnia, Ricardo, Lesia, Ivan, and we will see what is uh, coming in the future to continue with the cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So we can move to the last uh, presentation for today, uh, I mean for the morning session. Um, up to now we have, we have been talking about what has been done in the, in the project, so more or less we can say this is the past, but what is about the future? What is going to happen with uh, Rosewood 3.0 from the 13th of June when this is finalized officially the, the project? So we have this presentation beyond Rosewood 4.0, what is next? And uh, to answer this question, we have uh, Daniela Bartolovic for Competence Center for Research and Development and Edward Mauri from the European Forest Institute. So please. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, from that side, you cannot see that lights are so, so heavy. Uh, so it's uh, pretty much simple to continue to um, all of this that has been said uh, previously uh, during this, this morning. Um, based on all these results, all these good cooperation, all these activities that we have been uh, um, implementing uh, uh, last, last two and a half years, um, it was pretty much simple and easy to decide uh, how to continue um, or how to um, contribu contribute to continue I'm complicating now, sorry. Uh, how to uh, continue uh, and keep uh, this good project and good network alive. So um, all project partners basically decided uh, to uh, participate in Rosu 40 uh, network uh, um, sustainability activities um, since the network itself and the knowledge platform are basically two um, uh, identified as two um, the most uh, uh, potential uh, uh, project results that could uh, ensure the sustainability of, of the project. I have it here, so. <laughs> Uh, so, um, F, uh, um, Effie and uh, Steinbeis uh, developed a memorandum of collaboration, which um, has been presented to project partners. And um, tomorrow uh, uh, we will, do, we will uh, organize the f uh, first official uh, meeting of the network where the final version of this memorandum of um, collaboration will be defined. Um, uh, the thing, the basis uh, uh, for, for um, entering or joining the, the, our network uh, will be strictly vol vol voluntary. So um, if we have uh, 21 uh, project partner who is willing to uh, uh, work free of charge in, in this um, network, it's, it's uh, um, indicating the strength of the network and the good collaboration that we had in previous um, two years. Um, so. Um, we tried to keep it simple and to have uh, online meetings uh, uh, bi-monthly. Uh, for the organization of this meeting and the coordination of the network, uh, SECOM or Competence Center uh, from Croatia will be uh, responsible. Um, the other thing that all partners agreed is the um, uh, publication of, of Rosewood the Network, uh, which will be um, issued three times um, a year during the period, period of time, 18 months. Um, uh, and all the network members um, should contribute to, to the uh, uh, continuous feeding of, of knowledge uh, platform through uh, collecting um, at least two uh, uh, best practices from their uh, countries. So I'll go back. Here. Uh, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. <laughs> Oh, you can stay. Maybe there are some questions for you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, 
have, have you seen, um, we have been taking care of the sustainability of many of the elements, and Daniela has presented the sustainability of some of the activities of the, of the project. Uh, also the example of the e-learning platform that will be maintained by the state enterprise for forestry and timber of North Line Westphalia. And there is um, another element that it's missing, and I think that um, Uwe has uh, presented some insights, and is the sustainability of the knowledge platform for regional forest uh, innovation. Because as Daniela has just mentioned, uh, we want the 4.0 networks uh, members, so the former partners of the uh, project, plus any other wanting to uh, join us uh, on a voluntary basis to still contribute to this platform, meaning that we have to keep the platform uh, alive. And what do we want to achieve more precisely is, as I said, we want to keep it running, we want more data, and we want more exploitation. So how we are going to achieve this? And this will be uh, thanks to the collaboration of the EFI Bioregions Facility. So the EFI Bioregions Facility, uh, as its name says, it's a facility from the European Forest Institute established two years ago. It promotes translational cooperation for a sustainable and integrative uh, forest-based circular bioeconomy. It supports innovation, networking, and policy learning related to the development of a sustainable forest bioeconomy. Uh, EFI holds the secretariat of this facility that is funded by the Europea, European member regions that uh, we, we expect this number of member regions to continue increasing and support this, uh, this platform. The Bioregions mission is to work together across uh, regions to share ideas, experiences, and good practices that allow bioeconomy initiatives uh, with regional roads to have an outsized impact across Europe, uh, fueling the transformation to a circular forest-based bioeconomy in Europe. So, more in detail, to keep it running, uh, from 1st of July, the platform will be managed and, been, and maintained by EFI Bioregions Facility uh, with Bioregions own funds. Uh, this management, of course, will be supervised by the Rosewood 4.0 uh, network. How we want to get more data? As uh, Daniela said, we want to make the partners to contribute with uh, new best practices and, and innovations, but also we want this bioregions, member regions to contribute with their own uh, best practices and innovations uh, f from, uh, from, their, own, uh, from their, their own regions, but also that they stimulate uh, the stakeholders in their geographical area to, uh, to, to contribute. And this is, will be easy because the platform is already prepared to accept um, inputs, so fact sheets, from other sources, from other regions, from other projects. And this will be easily reflected and uh, uh, integrated into the platform. And we also expect to increase the data, also to diversify the topics. So by now, well, 4.0 is focusing on, on good mobilization, uh, but I think that it will be very easy to expand the topic and uh, embrace uh, the whole forest uh, bioeconomy sector. And finally, the, for the exploitation, um, of course, the bioregions facility will contribute to the communication and dissemination of the platform through our uh, own uh, campaigns. It will be used uh, as a source of um, innovations for the forestry speed datings of the bioregions facility. So to make it sure, forestry speed dating is there, there are innovations presented, there are attendees uh, online, and then you have a space to match the uh, suppliers of the innovations with the uh, demand side of these uh, bio, uh, bioeconomy innovations. And also, uh, the bioregions facility is planning to hold its first open innovation challenge. So of course, this platform will be a good source to identify uh, 
potential uh, innovators that could apply to this uh, open innovation challenge. So, um, you see, uh, I think that the, the knowledge platform will be in, uh, in good hands, uh, still serving the, the Rosewood 4.0 network, but at the same time uh, expanding its, uh, its uh, horizons. And um, you will learn more this afternoon about the Bioregions facility and how it can be useful for you, not just for the knowledge platform, because uh, this afternoon in session two, uh, we'll have a presentation from the coordinator of the, the Bioregions facility, Ignacio Martinez de Arano. So this is uh, all for the morning. Uh, I think we are quite on, on time. Let's check. Yeah, 1 p.m. Perfect. Uh, so uh, I take this advantage to do this transition because I will be moderating the session this afternoon. So some uh, announcements. The lunch will be at the same uh, place uh, as we had the, the coffee break. Uh, you may have seen some uh, posters uh, close to the entrance. They are f there to you to take a look and. Uh, uh, and, and read them. Um, uh, we will come back here at yeah two, or yeah we'll try to be we'll try to be on time. And uh, finally, uh, as you see in the program, this is a networking lunch. So during the coffee break, I someone uh, told me, I think I'm the only one not in the Rosewood 4.0 consortium member. And I told this person, no, you are not the only one. So. Please don't be shy. I will ask people in the room that it's not uh, a member of Rosewood 4.0 or does not work in an organization uh, being in the consortium. Please stand up so, so people can, can see you. So you see you are, you are not alone. There are one, two, three, four, five, six. We expect a couple of more people uh, joining uh, us for lunch or maybe this afternoon. Uh, in the back also, I, I see someone. So. Uh, Thank you. You, you. you can sit. Yeah, you, you, I, I hope that you will take advantage, uh, you people from, from Rosewood, to, to meet these people and uh, to, build, uh, to build new, new contacts and new networking. So no more uh, blah, blah. Uh, let's go for lunch. I think that the, the catering should be waiting. Also, I told them that we may be late, so they may be still under preparation. The toilets are in the second floor, and I have no more announcement. Enjoy the lunch, and thank you.
Okay, welcome, welcome back, everybody. I hope, I hope that you enjoyed the lunch and that you, um, it was a place and a moment to, uh, for networking to uh, take care of the of the existing uh, connections and maybe building uh, new ones. This afternoon, uh, we will not talk anymore about Rosewood uh, 4.0 results. This afternoon, uh, we are going to try to answer what CC4 said, uh, told me some months ago, the million euro question. On <laughs> yeah, because we are going to try to how um, we could sustain the activities and uh, the network that have been built during EU funded projects once the funding is over. So, of course, um, we wanted to add the 1 million question, not the 100 euros question. That would be uh, too easy. Um, and for this, um, we have uh, two main blocks. One blocks on the tools, so which services exist to support your projects where once the EU funding will be over. And the second block after the coffee break uh, on uh, success cases on how some EU-funded projects succeeded to, contain, to continue their activities or to continue uh, animating their network once the EU funding was, was over. But uh, before this, we'll have a, a keynote. Well, this is the structure. So we'll have a, a keynote uh, speaker on uh, post-project sustainability and exploitation. Uh, she's online. She's uh, Katrina Barcane from uh, European Commission's Director General for Research and uh, Innovation. Uh, do we have Katrina online? Uh, yep. Yeah. No, nope, sorry. Yep. We can we can have uh, Katrina online. Yes. So, uh, Katrina, you have uh, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, sorry. Mm. Yeah, 20 minutes presentation more or less, and then uh, some minutes for the questions and answers from the attendees. So the floor is yours. We'll see you on the screen. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. I will quickly upload my presentation as well so that you don't have to see just me. You can look at the pretty colors on the slide. Let's just check a second. And OK, it's uploading. Give it a second. And I hope you can see it now on my side. It shows that all is well. If not, someone shout at me because uh, these hybrid events are great, but it's uh, a bit tricky at times, I think. So I hope everyone can see it. And uh, with this, I will then begin. So thanks a lot for having me here today. I hope that you can indeed hear me well. And uh, these are the perks and the drawbacks of the hybrid setups. It does allow for more people to participate, such as myself. Uh, but it also makes us obviously more reliant on the technical aspects of things. In any case, hope that you can hear me well. You see the slides and uh, happy to be here today to indeed introduce the topic of this afternoon, which will focus on the post-project sustainability and exploitation. So perhaps before I go on, it does make a little bit of uh, sense that I say a few words about who, who am I. So it's not just this face on the screen talking in their own world. Um, I'm, as it was mentioned, I, my name is uh, Katrina Barcane. I'm Latvian by birth and uh, Spanish slash Catalan by upbringing, having actually spent uh, most of my life very near to many of you where many of you are here today. If you have a little time, there's a little seaside town, Sijas, that's my hometown, so if you can visit it. But aside from the personal aspects, um, I've lived and worked in several different countries, including uh, Spain, Morocco, and for the past years, based in Belgium. I've worked on the implementation side of the project in different domains. And now I get to see also the other side of the coin uh, by seeing the projects from the view of, of the funding body, so the European Commission and the policymaker side too. So currently I work at the European Commission as a policy officer and director general for research and innovation. 
uh, dealing with data knowledge management and dissemination and exploitation of research results. So very much on point on this this on today's discussion. And I think that all of us more or less we're used to associate when we hear sustainability, we associate it with something you know positive. Perhaps that's not always the case when we hear the word exploitation, uh, but rest assured that here uh, exploitation and when it comes to the research, it does refer to the only good things and to put it simply, it's the actual use and uptake of the results. So why do we all care and why should we care about post-project sustainability and exploitation and what does it mean, mean concretely? So in Europe, at the EU and at national level, uh, we are funding research, of course, to advance science, to advance knowledge, um, but also to achieve results. To see and to celebrate that our actions and all the efforts we put into it have an impact. I can quickly mention here the, the framework program, the current RNA framework program on, on our end, which is the Horizon Europe, with an impressive budget of nearly 100 billion euros. It really doesn't acknowledge this um, value of impact more, even more visibly. You know, we need to work on how research translates into society and to make sure that when we say end of the project, um, perhaps a lot of times we, we are referring to end of the project as it was initially funding, but it should not be the end of the idea, the end of the efforts, um, etc. So that's exactly where we see this highlighted importance of ensuring that all the uh, projects, including those that are funded by the EU, are sustainable and that the key exploitable results are actually used um, directly or indirectly for the benefit of, of the society. Um, so this is very quite simply, we all know the journey. It starts with an idea and then it becomes a proposal, proposal seeks financial support, and after finding it, perhaps in a form of grant, uh, the project implementation begins. We all know the steps. Um, and in the project implementation, we can expect to reach some of the initial objectives, perhaps fail to address others, but overall there's a certain learning curve. And it's important to remember here that all research results have value. Even the ones that we might not consider, uh, or we might consider as unsuccessful. This is not what I wanted to find out, or this is actually I found out this by 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 chance. Uh, and with this in mind, this is of course put quite uh, in simple terms. But with this in mind, it's exactly why concepts like dissemination and exploitation need to be thought of in advance, precisely with the post-project sustainability in mind. From the Commission's side, um, the importance of dissemination exploitation is has already been uh, widely acknowledged and recognized. Also, uh, already in the previous framework program, H2020, in the regulations saying that the, the Union, the European Union, should carry out activities that implement research, technological development, uh, etc., but also disseminate, disseminate and optimize the results that we have. So, to really stimulate the the research that is being done. And um, this, of course, then afterwards, they would, the aim would be in terms of sustainability to achieve economic, societal, and scientific sustainability. And as such, we see this extra emphasis on sustainability, not just during the lifetime of the project, but also, and perhaps even more crucially at the end of it, when we get to the results. And then with this, of course, when we say results, what are they exactly? Um, in particular here, a lot of the times we do refer to the key exploitable results or key ERs. Um, it's key, key, uh, KERs would be the main results which have been really prioritized in, in the end due to the high potential for exploitation. And exploitation meaning their use and the further scientific, societal or policy use. So these, in other words, are the results that we that the projects deem worthy of being further disseminated, presented to user communities, etc. And these results, it's important to remember that they can indeed take many forms. They're not all uh, tangible, perhaps like uh, prototypes or technologies or publications or inventions. They can be intangible, like policy recommendations, knowledge and capacity building as well. So there's there's more more to it than just perhaps the initial ones that uh, we sometimes tend to focus on. 
And uh, of course, you can see as well on the slide, there's the different kind of like a summary of different type of results. That's not like uh, there's more than that. These are just, you know, for a bit of a, a recap on them. And then in order to, again, once more, coming back to the post project sustainability, uh, what, what could be said is that the project must pay close attention to three aspects, perhaps, uh, which would be one would be communication. We would have also the dissemination and exploitation. So the three can often go hand in hand, um, but they each have their own specific purpose and use. It's true that dissemination gets often confused with communication. Um, just to perhaps elaborate quickly, that when we say communication in terms of research uh, and innovation, it means speedy talking strategic and targeted measures for promoting the action, so the project itself. So it's uh, through media, engaging with the uh, citizens and perhaps people who are not uh, experts on of the field. So it's really reaching out to the society as a whole, whereas dissemination talks about results. So not the project, but the results. And it addresses the targeted audience that may potentially use these results that are made available and shared with them. And then the third one in the in the batch exploitation is the actual and the practical use of the results, which then concretizes the value and uh, the impact of the RNI activities. Important again to mention that exploitation, it can be commercial, societal, political. Um, it can be aimed at improving public knowledge and action. It can also be uh, recommendations for policy making through feedback to policy, etc. So it really has different shapes and forms, but it does focus that like the focus of exploitation is the actual use of results and let's say translating the research concepts into concrete solutions. So that's to sum it up, it, depending on what you wish to do, uh, whether it's informing on the project versus in performing on the results or making these results available for reuse or going the next step forward on actually using them and then generating some kind of a societal value with it. And it's important to know which ones to use and when, which order, etc. There are some examples of uh, already, of course, that's what we're going to be discussing in the this afternoon of the tools and initiatives that exist already. So we'll we'll get to that a bit later. But perhaps just to uh, finish on, on, on this, um, oh, sorry, I lost my own presentation for a bit. No, okay, back now. Sorry about that. So now knowing and understanding why we wish to ensure post-project sustainability and exploitation and what we mean by it. So what is it that we understand by these concepts? Because it's important that when we um, think of these concepts that everyone has a more or less common understanding of what it is they mean um, or they mean to them. So the European Commission has designed with this in mind um, and is implementing a dissemination and exploitation strategy. This is to support the EU funded RNI framework beneficiaries in taking their results this step further, you know, like the market uptake or wider scientific use or legislation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And it um, it includes the several different uh, tools as well, which we'll discuss later. But in short, as you can see as well here, it's really the support by offering, um, among other things, guidance, training, capacity building, uh, simplifying the access to materials, um, activities, and incentivizing beneficiaries to scale up and exploit the results after the end of the project. Because um, it's it's great, you know, to, to do the research for the sake of research, of course, so perhaps um, there are there are people who will be more interested in exploiting the results, there are people who would be less interested, so it's really about incentivizing that no matter if it's you do taking that next step to at least make them available if someone else would want to, with of taking into consideration that we have the wider perspective, the bigger picture of societal benefits at the at, in mind. 
Um, so examples, like I said, include the guidance uh, initiative, uh, guidance documents and initiatives like the Horizon Impact Award, which uh, I'm not sure if someone has heard of it already. Hope yes, but uh, we'll quickly go over it later, so no worries. And then uh, just to finish, um, briefly touching upon this, there are, like I said, the specific tools and initiatives as the Horizon Impact Award, but there's also services available with this concrete post-project sustainability and exploitation in mind that offer professional and uh, like customized go-to-market support uh, as well as further help on dissemination and exploitation. So because sometimes we may think that, okay, yes, sure, I should, we should be doing this and yes, the value is there, but perhaps there's a lack of, let's say, I don't know, resources, be it human resources or financial to actually put thoughts into motion and this is where there's a lot of there's this ecosystem of dissemination and exploitation that can help you and really support you in support the, the projects in their next steps. So to summarize, post project sustainability and exploitation are really instrumental in improving and let's say securing the value that we have from the research and innovation funding. What we mean by this is better dissemination and exploitation can pave the way, can make the, the, the can do the necessary steps to more impact um, through the circulation of ideas, through the circulation of the through the sharing of knowledge, and also of course increasing the innovation potential, creating new opportunities overall, and in general maximizing the impact of what we consider to be the RNI investment. So they to sum it up, serve as a catalyzer for impact creation of the RNA investment, but also European competitiveness overall and welfare of our society and sustainability of our ecosystem. So really it's 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 a um, whole chain of things that to think of when when we have the project in hand and that or the idea in hand to see this bigger picture of what does it mean to be sustainable. So when it comes to the necessary tools and services or available in existing tools and services, we'll cover those later as well. But for the time being, on this note, I think we can end the, the intro. Thanks, of course, for, for your attention. I'm, of course, happy to answer questions. It's a little bit strange on my side because obviously I am talking to a computer and you see me on a big screen. But um, in case there's any technical difficulties also for this part of the Q&A, because I'm not sure how this will uh, work, for anyone who's there, you can also, of course, reach out to me afterwards um, through email or bilaterally, and I'll also be uh, now in, in the panel of the next session. So thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, happy to hear from you. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, we have uh, some minutes for questions from the audience or from people online. So feel free, there is a micro in the room. If you was, want to ask anything to, to Katrina, maybe, Katrina, you can now stop sharing your, your screen so we can see your face again. Full. Okay. So any question for, for Katrina? Uh, yeah, we have one. From uh, Uwe Kies. Yes, hello. Uwe Kies, I'm Secretary General of Innova Wood. I would like to ask the question what, what actually is the sort of the hard piece also in all these collaboration uh, projects? How do we break up these silos and how do we reach out to other communities? So we are very happy here to be among us, uh, foresters. We learn a lot about. Uh, other regions, this is a real benefit to be in your community and advance your knowledge, your professional knowledge of your community, but especially the programs are getting more um, transdisciplinary, they want to include different sectors who are working on common challenges. Uh, how can we support that with these communication and dissemination tools that you have and, and what would you recommend? How should we as, let's say, the forest community uh, reach out to other communities and become more involved in other sectors. Because frankly, uh, okay, myself, I'm also a forest scientist. I like to be in the woods. I like to be uh, by myself, but <laughs> how do we become more active and uh, 
yeah, more visible also towards other communities. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. No, good. Indeed, good question because um, it's true that a lot of the times we might even recognize that we work, you know, or we operate in silos. You know, I'm in my domain, you're in your domain, and and so it's this is where perhaps even more than the communication, this is where the dissemination comes into play because it's really making these connections to targeted audience to those who could use it. Or well, this could be done, you know, like, okay, at the fundamental research point, it can be publications, it can be events, it can be other type of activities. Speaking directly in, in, in let's say, for the experience of the framework program beneficiaries, um, they're one of the tools that would be the best for you to use to really take this next step would be something like the Horizon Results Booster, which helps you bring, bring these kind of build a portfolio of um, either other projects who might have similar views or interests or have a dissemination strategy to how exactly and exploitation strategy to how exactly reach, you know, the other domains, other communities so that you don't just talk about a topic between yourselves, but that it gets a bit of a wider exposure. So there's different channels and we will discuss them a bit later on, but I would say that the first step is really making sure that whatever you are discussing in your community um, it is made available, that it does, it's not just discussed between yourselves, but there's a public presence and there's a public um, sort of, let's say, light shining on it, be it in form of a website. So that would be like the communication aspect, but somewhere where you can really spotlight that, yes, we have all this, we're willing to engage, we're willing to talk. This is also where something like the Horizon Results platform comes into play because it allows you to not only show what you have, but also tell the others what you're looking for, collaboration or funding or, um, I don't know, further research. So I would say it, as a first step, it would be super important to know what exists already, which is, I guess is what we're going to be discussing as well this afternoon, and then taking it from there, making these connections. So making from your end things available so that you have this open channel. I hope this uh, answers a little bit, but uh, happy to discuss it even more after we go through the tools in the afternoon. Thank you, Katrina. We, we have still time for an extra question from the audience. Okay, so then I will ask you, Katrina, to stay online because you are uh, one of the speakers and panelists of the of the following block that we are starting just right now. Um, so, uh, as I said, the next block is about the existing tools, so things that already exist or that will exist very soon, that will are there for you to use in the continuation of your uh, project activities, uh, even when the EU funding is, is over. So uh, services that can help your projects to exploit your results, to continue part of your activities, or even to animate your uh, networks. So the structure of this block will have uh, four presentations, 12 minutes each, and then about 25 minutes of debate uh, with, uh, with the speakers, so write down your questions while they are presenting, uh, so you can ask them uh, afterwards. So I invite you, Katrin is already online, so I invite you, uh, the speakers, that uh, Jens Hertel, Ignacio Martinez de Arano, and Taylor Arbor, to come to the, come to the, in the, to the front. We sit in order of, uh, of presentation. Well, uh, I will introduce you. I will point you okay. when introducing you, no problem. <laughs> so the, the first to speak will be uh, Jens uh, Hertel. Jens Hertel uh, is, uh, works at the liaison unit in Bonn uh, for um, Forest Europe. Then we'll have Ignacio Martinez de Arano. Uh, he is the coordinator of the EFI Bioregions uh, facility. And uh, we have also Taylor Arbor uh, from the University of Ghent. Uh, he was involved in the Eureka project 
and uh, he will present the continuation of, of this Eureka project, that it's the, the EU farm book. And finally, we'll have uh, also Katrina Barcani, that he already gave us some, uh, 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 some, some, uh, some small picture of what he will be presented, that will be the Horizon Results platform and the Horizon uh, Results uh, booster. So the first to present is Jens. Please, you have 12 minutes. Thanks a lot, Eduard. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, also from our side, from the Liaison Unit Bonn, congratulations to a very interesting and very successful project and also for organizing this very nice event here in uh, yeah, a hybrid format. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And as introduced by Eduard, um, I would like to introduce to you Forest Europe, first of all, and also in particular um, the so-called FORISK, the Forest Risk Knowledge Mechanism, where we have exactly the same topic uh, as we discussed today in the morning with knowledge, knowledge exchange over borders across a pan-European scale. And afterwards, I'm looking forward to your questions and also our discussion. So most of you probably are quite familiar with Forest Europe. Some of you might be not so familiar. Therefore, I would like to summarize. Therefore, I would like to summarize a few points which are also very important to know because these are also strengths and opportunities with regard to the forest risk knowledge mechanism, which we will um, um, or we propose to start in 2024 with a pilot in September. So the first important point is um, that it is. You see here a map of um, the European continent, and when I uh, graphically highlight the countries which are part of the Forest Euro process, then it's quite obvious that we really cover the continent on a very wide scale. We have all 27 EU members as signatories um, um, with, with us, but we have also outside the European Union uh, countries with us, like Norway, like Switzerland, like Turkey, and also the European Union itself is signatory um, of the process. And this is a strength, obviously, because we have a wide perspective from the east to the west, from the north to the south. And <clears throat> it is, uh, or it was born as a pan-European voluntary high-level po political process. And this uh, tire, this point here is very important because it covers the regional scale, as mentioned before, pan-European. It is voluntary. We heard that uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, uh, Rosewood will also continue on a voluntary base, which means the commitment is really key. And what is also important is it is a high-level political process, which means Forest Europe represents the ministers responsible for forest throughout the pan-European region, and this is unique by itself and therefore um, associated with a lot of strength. The history uh, of Forest Europe is uh, originated actually in 1990. When we look back at asset rains and emissions, um, the ministers came together to improve and work towards uh, an, an improved vitality of forests. And today, if you think about it, this topic is still very valid, but today the, the, the impacts, the ne negative impacts, are more oriented on, or, are, or are related to climate change, but the concern is still very valid and therefore timely. I mentioned the 46 signatories, which is um, uh, quite impressive, uh, including also the European Union. And on top, which is also very interesting, we just talked about silos and breaking the silos. We have 63 uh, observers, which includes organization and also countries outside the pan-European region, Canada or also uh, China, are observer countries of the, of the process. And regarding the observer organizations, we are very pleased to have, for example, environmental NGOs with us. So there is a, a big perspective and a comprehensive perspective on the topic of, of forests. And the key topic um, which is associated to Forest Europe is sustainable forest management, which means our key still is to promote SFM across the pan-European region. And in the context of Forest Europe, ministers first, or as for the first time in the European context, agreed on a definition and of a concept of sustainable forest management and what does it actually mean, which is a quite an achievement and still valid today. With regard to the current time of Forest Europe, 
um, one has to know that there are rotating German chips. And currently, from 10, 2021 to 2024, Germany has the, has the Germ, uh, or is the chairmanship, and which means that uh, Germany is also providing the secretariat um, of um, Forest Europe, which is the liaison unit Bonn, and this is the place um, where I um, work. After 2024, for example, the Turkish colleagues will take over, and then afterwards, um, Sweden. And obviously, we. Uh, elaborated our focus topics during this chairmanship, the German chairmanship, and I would like to introduce um, the points to you in this slide. First of all, the SFM concept, you know, demographic changes, climate change and so on, is a dynamic concept which needs to evolve over time, and revisiting SFM is one of our key focuses, which includes criteria, uh, criteria and indicators, how to measure actually sustainable forest management, but also the State of European Forests report, which is probably also known to you, um, is also one of the key topics. Then this topic, I will come to this in, in, in detail, the forest risk knowledge mechanism is the second work focus. And then we have uh, green jobs and forest education. If you consider sustainability, um, human resources are very, very key. And therefore, for us, it's really important to also cover green jobs and forest education. And on top, we would like, and we are currently already implementing, um, a rapid response and an emerging issue uh, work stream, which means that we are also flexible within this work stream to react uh, on uh, emerging topics. And very crucial, and therefore we are very pleased to have next to the liaison unit Bonn, uh, colleagues from the European Forest Institute with us. One key uh, topic here is communications, where we have an EFI co colleague who is really professional in, 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 in reaching out to society and spreading the word. And one last point is, and therefore I'm very pleased to speak to you today, um, for us it's really, really key that we look for back-to-back -back activities and for synergies because a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise is available across the European continent and we would really like to, to work and collaborate wherever possible and Rosewood is a very great example. And looking on the pan-European forest risk knowledge mechanism, so the abbreviation is FORISC, I would like to introduce to you what actually is behind this uh, yeah, maybe a little bit abstract term. So the mandate is associated to a resolution which was signed by the signatories in Slovakia, in, in, in Bratislava, with the name Adapting Pan-European Forests to Climate Change. And here, uh, Forest Europe received the mandate to work towards a coordinated transboundary and collaborative um, fora where different stakeholders come together to exchange on forest risks but also forest adaptation and forest resilience. And again here, it's crucial when looking at this topic that we really build on knowledge exchange and science-based data. So therefore, again, this triangle between practitioners and best practice, as we heard earlier today, and also science is very, very crucial because evidence-based policy making is really crucial, particularly um, in, in current times. And again, for us, it's very important that here we have a back-to-back -back approach with European-related processes, which means that we, for example, really thoroughly screen activities which are dealing with the field of forest risk and forest adaptation. And this is still ra rather theoretical, but we are moving towards a more practical approach in the next slide, because we will have a so-called expert level meeting end of August where the national focal points of the 46 signatory countries come together and here we will propose to work towards a pilot, so a small scale implementation of the forest risk knowledge mechanism looking at focus topics which are of most importance for the signatories and observers. And the launch is foreseen after the approval by the expert level meeting in September 2022, and it shall last until the beginning of 2024, uh, so the end of the German chairmanship in, in, in February. And here for us, we uh, disseminated a questionnaire to identify forest damage agents, which are of most importance for the signatories. And based on this questionnaire and the feedback, we decided to focus, first of all, the first level on three focus topics. The first one will be wildfires, so from September uh, this year until end of January next, next year. Afterwards, we are proposing to look at pests and diseases. Here, uh, we have 
different subtopics like bark beetles and invasive species, which will be very important. And the last uh, point, which will be, uh, uh, or which is proposed to be addressed in the, concept, uh, in, the, in the context of the pilot, are storms. And in addition to those three focus topics, we will have, and this is really important, um, we have a second level, which is the, con uh, the continuation here of the arrow you see, which is looking at forest risk interrelations. Because when we look at previous projects, and also current projects, very often there is a particular focus, like wildfire. But an ecosystem obviously has a lot of interconnections and interrelations, and a good example for, uh, is, for, is, for example, drought. Drought obviously supports bark beetles, drought supports wildfire, so the interrelation between different forest damage agents is really, really key. And therefore, while concentrating on the three pilot phases, we are proposing to have an overarching uh, phase, so to say, which looks at the interlinkages uh, inter inter and interrelations. So this is the, the simplified architecture. And now the question, where are the concrete linkages, for example, to Rosewood and knowledge exchange and networks? And we have a concept paper um, which is proposed um, to the, the, the signatories. And in the context of this concept paper, we also have one really important um, aspect with regard to cooperation, and here we call it Cooperation Hub, where the focus will be that information, which is already very often available in different regions, um, will be transferred and communicated and, and also um, translated towards the individual stakeholder groups, for, for example, from practice uh, to uh, policy making, so that in the end, uh, political decision making is supported with the available information throughout the pan-European region. And one slight different, uh, difference which we currently foresee in our concept is that we will not concentrate on regional hubs because for us the transboundary exchange with regard to focus topics is key. We would like to have, for a corpor or we propose cooperation hubs which are concentrating on specific content like wildfires, a pan-European cooperation hub which is looking at wildfires so that the colleagues, for example, in Scandinavia have directly the exchange with the colleagues from the Mediterranean areas to um, exchange on their knowledge and their expertise. And again, which is like we heard um, uh, when I looked to, to Rosewood, uh, we also foresee a focal point with regard to uh, each and every cooperation hub, which is, so to say, um, the exchange um, a, a, a person for us, the liaison unit Bonn, to um, exchange information to the hubs and also to Forest Europe and the decision-making uh, process. And in general, you can say that the task of the cooperation hub manager would be to identify and facilitate um, the initiatives and uh, relevant activities in the hub and to support together with the liaison unit Bonn then the science and practice policy interface. And as a concluding slide, to state concrete potential um, synergies here in, in the context of, of Rosewood. Um, we could, and also then Rosewood Network obviously in the future then from, from tomorrow on, would be that knowledge and information transfer could be supported, which on the one hand would increase the visibility obviously of activities which Rosewood is actually dealing with. We could mirror them towards the political decision-making process and vice versa. And another very important aspect is that Forest Europe is foreseeing not a limitation of this forest risk knowledge mechanism. So continuity, continuity would be a really big added value because even after at the end of a project, the network itself would have a stable reference point within this mechanism so that the experts are still um, connected to each other. And this would then support um, also the, the, the creation of concrete deliverables out of the pilot, for example, reports. And in the end, it would strengthen um, the networks itself within Rosewood, but also within the Forest Europe uh, community. And here, like today, joint events or communication could be examples, but this is obviously just a starting point where we are happy really to exchange with you in the, in, in, in the upcoming future. So, and with this, I think um, this is enough for um, a starting point. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention, and then I'm looking forward to our exchange afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, write down your questions for the uh, discussion afterwards, because uh, we jump uh, to the next speaker, Ignacio Martinez de Arano, coordinator of the Bioregions <coughs> Facility. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you to Steinbest, thank you to EFI and Eduardo Mario, thank you for the Rosewood Consortium for giving me this opportunity to be with you here to present our Bajorians facility and to have this discussion time to see how we can better uh, develop uh, synergies. So first of all, I would like to start a few words on, on, on the forest bioeconomy, how we conceptualize it and how we, we approach it. So I think, and I will follow up on, on Uwe's word this morning, I think we have immense environmental challenges uh, and we really, I think we all agree that we need a change in our uh, economic model from this fossil fuel based linear uh, model to something different. Uh, and this something different, of course, will be more bio-based, it will be more circular, it, it will touch consu consumer consumption patterns, it will have something of degrowth and a slow food, a slow movement, and of course it will have biomicry, it will be um, based on renewable energies, etc. So in every place, um, this, this could take a, a different shape. So what we mean, when, so when we discuss the bioeconomy in this framework, we are aware that we need to, to put our, um, let's say, economic system within the planetary boundaries. At the same time, we need to create job and employment for all in a, in a very complex uh, uh, world that we live in. So, but what, what key message for us here is that we don't see the bioeconomy only as a bio-based sector, uh, forestry 4.0 or, or advanced agriculture. It's more about how we make all sectors more biological. So we need to think how we can transform the main economic sectors of the economy. And, and, this, this, and these sectors are, of course, uh, we have the protein revolution in agriculture, but we need to decarbonize agriculture. But we need construction. We need the way we live in cities through green infrastructure. We need plastic-free supermarkets. We need to change the today plastic-dominated manufacturing, etc. So this is the way we see bioeconomy, how we can make all these sectors more bio-based, more circular, sustainable, with positive environmental impacts. So this is a little bit the dream we need to advance towards. Uh, it's an economic model within the planet boundaries, feed on renewable energies, where society is in the middle, and we are able to use the natural capital in the best possible ways. Ecosystem services, building on our heritage, build, building on cultural services, building on regulatory services for green infrastructure in cities and outside, and using the provision of services in a completely, uh, with all the principles of, of um, of circular economy in terms of efficiency, cascading, uh, hierarchy of uses, but also eco-design, recycling, maintain, reuse, um, platform economy, sharing economy, etc. So this, this is a big challenge, and of course, in every place, this, this, will, take, this will take a different shape. But we are also convinced that forests have a key role, and I will not extend on this for, 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 for many reasons. Forests will be a key element of this transformation, but also regions, uh, because we, regions provide this connections to the land, connections to existing economic sectors, cultural uh, fit, uh, and regions, many regions have the necessary tools in terms of landscape planning, in terms of industrial policies, research policies, and, and they can provide the critical uh, mass for, the, for, for this to happen. So this is why we, we developed the Bajorians facility, uh, facility to facilitate uh, systemic transitions of regions towards more sustainable uh, bioeconomy. So what is the Bajorians facility? It's a co an open platform to collaborate across regions. It was founded by three member regions just the, the day before we closed Europe with the pandemic. Um, so these are Basque Country, North Karelia and North Rhine-Westphalia. But it's open now to other regions after two years of, of work and piloting. Um, so we, we, we are open to regions committed to sustainable bioeconomy committed uh, to using forest as, as a key component and that have some tools and willing and capacity to act in the bioeconomy. So we define regions in an open way. So our missions are enabling framework conditions for, for this bioeconomy to happen. We want to create in very much in line with Rosewood, vibrant ecosystems and, and, and foster innovation. And we also need uh, well-engaged societies. When we discuss systemic transitions, we are looking at this. At the core, we have, of course, political will, willingness to go for it, uh, which is obviously basic condition, and not only in the policy makers, in, in, in served by, by regional stakeholders. But it's all about Rosewood, it's about sustainable supply of natural resources in a complex situation, provisioning ecosystem services, and attending the very, the very, multi, the very different um, views on, on, on management resources. But we need capacity to innovate. 
we need a lot of cross-sectoral connections. Also, I came this morning, you need access to finance, uh, you need training, knowledge, and skills. Also, you need demand side from, for, for bio-based products, how we can foster demand. And of course, you need a mechanism to mediate societal issues, winners and losers, social participation, and to engage uh, society that can support this transition. So this is the areas that we are working at. And how do we work on this? We have developed three, three axes of action. We have a policy learning platform. We exchange regions to regions, success cases, initiatives on the policy side of the bioeconomy. We developed an open innovation and business discovery hub that we call it to speed up innovation very much in the logic of Rosewood. So we are trying to answer two of the million dollar questions, Eduard. One is how to bridge the knowledge innovation divide, how to speed up the uptake of, of good solutions, and second, how to do this independently from uh, competitive projects in a more strategic permanent basis. These are the two questions that we answer with the facility. Finally, we have a societal awareness toolbox, we call. Uh, we, we come back to this. And we have to, to let's say, Cross-cutting axis, one is to engage regional actors, increase the footprint, help create at the regional level this mindset of a eco bioeconomy ecosystem. Now we have many actors that don't recognize themselves as being part of the bioeconomy. You have business support, you have a public procurement office, you have foresters, you have many other actors that don't, don't talk to, to each other necessarily and, and they are not in the same bioeconomy mindset. And then, of course, uh, we want to engage with existing networks in Brussels or in, in, in policy. So we work with the RIN, work with the RIAF, with the, uh, with, with the new BBI, the CBE, European uh, Circular Recovery Investment Fund, etc. We try to work with all actors in Brussels also to pass through uh, lessons learned. So just to give you a, bit, a big flavor of our work, this is we've been working during the pandemic on green procurement in our regions and how this can become innovative bio-based procurement. So we do inter we connect our real actors, we do surveys, workshops, internal, external, and we came with some recommendations on how to develop bio-based procurement programs. But more than developing the fact sheets and the recommendation is to activate the actors and, and, and create action at the regional level. Then we have this business innovation and business discovery hub. So here, what, this is a, what we want to is activate our EFI network those, the, that you see in the map, but also Innova Wood network of, of, of Wood Research Centers, European Biocom University network, and then project-based networks like Rosewood, like Incredible, more generally EU, EU um, project results that are relevant, and we want to, to, to help bridge this knowledge innovation divide, facilitate uptake, support spin-offs and startups from these projects, and, 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 and also connect our regional business development support centers to attract these startups and develop. So, you know, it's, it's, all, about, it's all about, or a lot about creating partnerships. Huh? So for the owners of the challenge, the hubs in Rosewood and stakeholders, we want to, of course, bring them continuous innovation, enrich the database of, of, of solutions and mobilize them, but it's also about not only identifying new businesses, it's also about attracting talent, it's also about better understanding what is happening there, having this technological antenna, and it's also about marketing in general, the, the forest bio-based sector. And of course, for the solution owners, we want to give them insights and fitness on the idea, partnership opportunities, personal networking, recognition prices, so they can really start up or scale up their initiatives. So for this, we have three tools. We have forestry speed datings, we have the incoming bioregions open innovation challenge, and we have regional bioeconomy days or bioeconomy forums. I will come back very briefly to this. Speed dating, some of you took part. This is a very light uh, tool. Every month, we, have a, we present innovations to interested stakeholders, and we have breakout rooms to, ma to make matching, ma matching events and, and, and to define further collaboration. We've been focusing on digital solutions, and we have tried to mobilize the Rosewood uh, initiatives and bring them to stakeholders who have an average of 80, of 80 participants registered, or up to 80, 60 to 80 participants. So now we are moving to, to a new series about bio-based solutions for construction. So we will move to a new target for the next six months. We have our opening seminar uh, this Friday, 17th of June, where we will just have an open webinar about what are the key challenges of bio-based construction in Europe. And then we will be presenting innovations to the interested stakeholders. So we plan to continue this. We will come back to digital solutions next year, probably, and we will have this tool open to, to all of you. 
Second, we are preparing an open innovation challenge, more formal. So now we are, I cannot say a lot more because we are developing this challenge. But if, if we ask our regional stakeholders, you will not be surprised that many of the challenges that we want to address are very similar to challenges in the, in the, in the Rosewood Hubs because are the challenges of forestry in Europe. So it's about activating forest owners, in joint management, in creating new value chains on carbon farming or non-wood forest products, activating also your phone owners. It's about how to adapt to climate change, early warning, monitoring, response, and it's also about new products and on side streams mainly, and, and a lot on um, energy, moving from energy to other material uses with better environmental impacts. It's about finding high climate performance solutions. So we're looking for digital solutions, technological, new business models, social innovation. So we, make an, we will make an open call, get some winners and help them get in contact with our regional stakeholders, developing partnerships, joining acceleration programs or having access to finance. So this is a little bit and we will do this uh, in a systematic way in the coming years. And finally, this, this regional uh, days, for example, in November, uh, we will bring some of the Rosewood, hopefully, startups and scale-ups to North Karelia to meet the regional photonics hub up there to pitch and present and, 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 and give an opportunity to, to have. Uh, forest and photonics is, is a big event in North Karelia where they mix forestry with photonics clusters to develop new businesses, and we will bring this, this innovation, so we will be communicating through Rosewood channels also to identify these most promising uh, digital solutions. And finally, we have this awareness toolbox. I will leave some leaflets of our survey. One example of the things we do in these leaflets, we've been conducting a, a survey on what is the perceptions of policymakers, perceptions of, of business leaders in the bioeconomy in different regions. So we have a survey translated to several languages with a toolkit ready to launch in any region. It's open to any European region. We have launched it in five regions so far. And we are looking at what are the most promising sectors, what are the key drivers and enablers? What are the key barriers for the bioeconomy? Who is responsible for the bioeconomy? Just to give you a flavor of four of the regions. Eh? For, some of them, for most of them, bioenergy is key bioeconomy sector. For some of them, wood construction is a key element, not for others. For some of them, nature-based tourism is the most promising sector. You see some differences. But in general, we have a, a strong bias towards bioenergy and, and uh, much less development, for example, in advanced materials, this is much less visible. Also interesting for you to know, if we ask stakeholders what is the key benefit of the bioeconomy, in general we have climate and environmental benefits, but we don't, have, we don't get a clear message that is a key element for economic development, creating jobs and employment. Uh, so it's, it's perceived more for its environmental benefits, but for being a critical element for, for the development of, of the regional economy. Interestingly, the stakeholders think that it's more a matter of the public sector than the private sector to invest in, to communicate, and to develop. Anyway, this, 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 this tool then is, is discussing with real stakeholders and helps tar better targeting communication strategies, etc. Next year, we, we will launch a survey on students' perceptions, on, on life science student perceptions on bioeconomy and entrepreneurship, so to start understanding how uh, and start working with universities, how we can better create uh, an entrepreneurship mindset related to the forest bioeconomy. This is in a nutshell and uh, some examples of what we do. We also have different communication channels that you, you, can, you can tap on. So basically, BioRions is, is a platform under development. Uh, we see a lot of synergies in terms of keeping alive networks like Rosewood through our speed dating, so innovation challenges. Uh, we do study tour visits also. Uh, and this type of question, so we are very happy to cooperate with this um, new Rosewood uh, network that, is, that, that we maintain. And, and as a facility, it's open to, to the regions. We, have a, we are in the region, regions, we have a trust fund that the regions contribute. They, have a steering, they are in the steering committee, they pilot the, the Bajor region, so it's very much a regional driven uh, facility. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Our next speaker is from University of uh, Ghent, uh, Tyler Arbor, and he will present something that I would, let if I am allowed, describe as the, the marriage of uh, Zenodo and Facebook. So, Taylor, please. Okay, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm also very 
honored to be here and uh, to travel a bit after a, a long COVID period. So uh, being in lovely Barcelona is a great opportunity. And um, I have a background that is not at all in, in forestry or even so much agriculture, but uh, I wanted to, I was drawn to this more science policy direction. Um, coming to the project I'll tell you about, uh, it's called Eureka. And so I'm here representing the uh, Eureka project and the, the EU farm book, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about here in, in brief. Uh, but first, let's uh, address the, the elephant or the giant fir tree in the room, uh, let the name EU farm book. So I promise we forestry is, uh, is prominently featured on, on our homepage, uh, but we might need to consider uh, a sister site, for example, if, if the name does prove to be a, a real barrier for people uh, in, in understanding what the platform is about. So maybe a forestry book, forestry hub, sister site is a, a discussion to have uh, going forward in the future. Um, because as I'll explain, this like, prob one of the unique selling points, let's say, of this platform is it really tries to be as broad as possible because as we've been discussing, all of these issues relate. And so um, I'll just get into it uh, with, to, I'll give you a preview of, of how, we, how we hope to do that. But also agroforestry is just an example where maybe better together, uh, such a connection, um, there are definitely opportunities to, that will come from people talking to each other across fields and uh, sectors. So a brief, history of the project. Uh, I'm, I, I, I didn't choose the acronyms uh, for the, the names of these projects, but the, the first one, uh, there's a Greek, a Greek sisters theme if, for, for the history people involved. So uh, Eurachnos was the, the beginning and uh, running from 2019 to 2021. And the mission of this and the, the, fall, the it's a succession of three projects, but they all believe that the future of innovation uh, in agriculture and forestry, other sectors, but is in, in, in big part based on this exchange, better exchange of best practices, especially in the in a digital best uh, digital tools uh, between these different sectors and critically across member states, which brings a lot of challenges. So, Eurachnos looked at them, uh, them thematic networks, um, and I'll. I'll just go to uh, the outcome. So included in that were Rosewood, uh, the incredible, incredible forest or incredible project, and Afinet as more of the forestry-related um, thematic network examples. And we really, in this project, laid the foundation for uh, a very a pretty elegant uh, and open source-based uh, database technology with not just collecting like popular keywords and and things like that, but really looking at, uh, in a more formal way, the, a data model and an ontology, so how these different topics are related to each other, and whether it's a broader or narrower concept, all of this actually matters a lot for how a database performs, because if you want suggested uh, relevant content or things like this, you actually have to have a somewhat formal uh, definition of what these different uh, topics and terms mean. So. The, the prototype of the EU farm book was developed in this, uh, in this project, as well as the, the first visuals and, uh, and this. And Eureka is, was the sister or, or uh, daughter in project. It, it ran for one year uh, overlapping with, with Eurachnos, but the, it broadened the scope to all of these uh, multi-actor projects, uh, Horizon 2020, and really in, in both projects studying the, uh, we did, workshops and focus groups with, with the users themselves, the, the potential, all different stakeholders, um, farmers, foresters, advisors are really the, right now the main, the main user in mind, but also the project community uh, who will be helping to, to feed this, this platform. And Eureka, I'll just, I'll go to what we've delivered in terms of the pilot version of the, of the EU farm book. Uh, but I do want to explain a bit that it's a big consortium. Eurachnos had some of the similar partners, um, uh, uh, many overlapping, but this is the, the Eureka group. There's, there's 21 partners from 16 different member states, and some of the, the, the organization logos are here. But so when you come currently to the pilot version of the, of the homepage, and as I, I showed a quick preview earlier, but there's the 
pretty typical layout. Um, tried to keep it's very simple and kind of cut pared down at this point. Um, but I just want to go through some of the main features or functionalities of it. Uh, so here's a random example of searching for drones. And um, what you can see here is that there's a, that 14 different languages, so including English, uh, that we've achieved through a combination of, of auto translation. We use uh, DeepL deep currently, but also manual translation um, with, for the important terms and text on the, on the website, because if a user comes to it and, and has a Im bad impression of really poor translation on some of the key, key areas or pages, then th that will, uh, be, they'll be less likely to return. So that's something that uh, we've put effort into already, but it remains a big focus going forward. Uh, and then also on the right, you can see, uh, I d None of the, the categories are really expanded or the, those, those filters that you can use, but there's um, di the different high-level topics and then subtopics that are uh, that you tied to the EIP agri terms, so it tries to also be a bit interoperable with the existing uh, database and, and resource from the, from the commission that others also adopt, and then the common language location, things like this. So. Um, we, yeah, just to emphasize the strong focus on multilingual functionality. Uh, currently, it's, it's quite simple, uh, available technology. So here's an example where it's, uh, the site is in, in Spanish. Uh, there's a, the like button is, is me gusta. And you can see that you can uh, traducir comentario, so translate the comment if you want. And we really are excited about, this is a simple example, but this is one way that sharing across borders and language and culture barriers will, will need to be overcome, and that's allowing uh, foresters, farmers, others to talk with people who don't speak their language uh, uh, through, through means like this, um, and maybe even allow them to connect in more, uh, in stronger ways. So you may have noticed too, there's, each section has um, uh, the content, but then community and experts uh, pages, and the, the community is, it's currently, um, so like threads and discussions, you can, you can start a, a, a comment on any one of the objects in this database um, and, and have these conversations with the ability to translate the comments. Um, but we, I, I've been having discussions with people and I think that one maybe really desired feature more serving like the project community is to have a, a project uh, pages where a project can can collect their like give a description. It's basically like the Facebook aspect. So uh, a Facebook page or even a group, probably more more like a page. But then all content also can be can be found there. So I think it helps the users as well to see. Okay, here's the content that comes from this from this group. Um, and the just to go back the the experts tab. Uh, the experts is. I think also going to be a pretty unique uh, feature of the platform. It's challenging to, to figure out exactly how the model and how to make it work, but it's essentially people who are willing to volunteer to, sh to, sh to help answer questions, whether on the platform directly or they share some contact information so that if a user, want, someone wants to get in touch with them, then they can, they can answer questions. Um, like, and this is something that will continue to evolve and hope we, we look for for feedback on as well. So the, the journey continues, uh, and maybe it's even more than a 1 million euro question, or, but uh, 15 million euros or more question that we have a, a large follow-up project that was granted earlier this year. So we're happy that we can uh, guarantee some sustainability and longer term to projects. And we've also, in both Eurachnos and Eureka, spent like, uh, focused a lot on developing the, looking at the possible sustainability and models, um, governance and funding models going forward. And I can talk about that a bit more in the discussion, I think, but um, currently it's the, the core funding from the EU is, um, is the, the main model. So it's a big project and what we really want to do is take this pilot version uh, and make it something that is very user-friendly, that users really like 
Uh, and this is going to be an iterative process that involves uh, a, a diverse community of practice, so that includes the project community here, and these cycles where we, we review and get feedback, both from the commission, but also the like people in this room and others. And then I think that we all know that none of it really amounts to anything in the end if you don't share it and, uh, and spread things widely. So there's a lot of resources devoted towards the dissemination and including education and training. So this will be a way to share other projects material as well, just to make, to, to make it more, um, more available. And another core element of that that we've been hearing about today is that you have to connect at the more local level. So in each member state, uh, we, we have, um, we're going to work with the local coordinating bodies, the agricultural and forestry innovation systems um, in, in all the member states and even at finer level. So the, if I, how am I doing for time? Okay. Okay. All right, all right. But, uh, so I'll wrap up. I, I put this slide in case I started to talk too long. But the number one, um, how, how the, the EU Farm Book uh, can help your project is really providing this actively maintained uh, database for storing and, sh and sharing more widely your knowledge objects. Um, we provide some, some guidelines and some support, especially early on to the projects who are interested to try and like upload data or link it to the, to the database. Um, and there are a couple of ways to do that currently, but uh, it's something that we, relationships we're working out with different projects. Also work, I think, with the, the commission to, on these guidelines, some of, uh, we heard in the keynote speech, um, guidelines and resources so that projects don't face such barriers to, to do this well. Um, it doesn't take so much voluntary time of people as is, is usually the case now. And by widely promoting uh, the use of this tool, if it, it will help to share the content of any projects and reach a wider audience. So it's fair data management is, is uh, most of you have probably heard, of, heard about this. It's, it's really what underlies the, um, this, this content. And I just wanted to quickly go through a few slides of the examples. So here's this wonderful platform with great content from from Rosewood, and you can see the, the metadata here, like similar to the, the categories in the farm book. We have country, type, language. They're all different. Uh, so this is what the, the, the iceberg we saw in another presentation. This is what underlies the, um, all of these things. And, and just an example, uh, expanding the types of rich information that is uh, like in the Rosewood platform. Uh, in order to share this easily, uh, to upload this data or link it to the farm book, then the challenge is mapping, the, mapping this data together. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you translate this uh, computationally um, and using computer and humans to, to do this mapping so that it can be shared in a database? So the, here's the set of your, the Eureka metadata. It's, it's very similar to very open source and common standards of uh, what the key information is for, for files. And this is what we help projects to, uh, to, to make sure that their data is, is annotated with a minimal amount of information that makes it very searchable and powerful. Mm -hmm. So the last couple of, of slides are that for projects uh, that have already put a lot of effort, for example, into uploading them to some uh, one database in their own or Zenodo, then there are ways to uh, export that data that, that you, this uses the same exact uh, language. So this DC that you see in the little, the HTML sort of font is Dublin Core and that's a, a metadata standard that our platform is built on. So uh, machines are able to talk directly to each other and read this type of information. It still requires some mapping and coding to, for, for different databases, but the possibility is there. So a couple of quick examples. Uh, we have a c projects that have chosen to try and use the farm book as their main repository. One of them is currently, they have the site embedded in their project website. It's a, a small ruminant technologies project in France. And then a, you may, Affinet has some content already added to the, to the platform as well. Okay, so help us to build and feed the farm book and improve it and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Taylor. So you, you all got the, the take-home message, uh, help to feed the, the farm book. Um, and we have a fourth and last presentation before we jump into the debate. It's again uh, Katrina Barcani, uh, who will present the Horizon Result platform and the Horizon Results uh, booster. So Katrina, are you online, I hope? You can turn on your webcam. No, he's not online. Hello? Hi, everyone. Can Hi. you hear me? Because I can't, I seem to have lost the connection on your end. For me, it appears as the hall has been muted. We hear oh, your sound, hear but last. we don't see your camera and we don't see your presentation. Still nothing on my end. I mean, I can go on and present it, just know that I do not hear the, the other side. I don't know what the technical hiccup. We're trying to solve Should this. Should I do the presentation? We hear you, but we cannot see you, and we cannot see your presentation. Now we can see you. <laughs> Are you sharing your screen? I guess someone on the IT side is looking into it. If not, I mean, I can start, but uh, for the Q&A part, it's not going to be very useful. Can you hear me? Yes, we can I, hear I can you. you at least, we, we hear you and we see you, but we don't see your uh, shared screen. Okay, I don't know okay. if it's so someone's maybe, um, on the other end, but uh, I'll share my presentation and, and begin. If in the meantime someone could check on the the team's connection, because on my side I see that you are muted, but I'll, I'll begin. Okay, so uh, start, we start uh, please, and we'll try to time. fix the, the share of the screen, but we can see and hear you perfectly. Okay. Thank you. Should see it now. Yes, we see Still your. Don't hear you, but okay. Um, we see your presentation, Katrina. And I hope in the meantime it will be uh, fixed. So thanks again for the opportunity to speak here today. For the part that I did hear before, it was super interesting to tune in, and I hope that there's going to be a recording of some sort so I can also hear the the other side. The usual hiccups when it comes to these uh, hybrid meetings we're all still all, we're still all a little bit in the learning curve i guess so a lot of this has been mentioned in one way or another so there's a bit of an echo on that but i think that's actually a good thing because it means that we are all thinking about it and uh, looking into it so this is the what we covered already also a little bit in the keynote but just to come back to what we will what i will quickly present is uh, that these existing services um, you will see later are very closely linked to what is the dissemination and exploitation strategy. And the main aims of this strategy, as you can see here, is really um, guidance to applicants and beneficiaries, so those who are looking for funding, but also those who have received funding. Um, further incentives of different sorts to actually go that extra step and use the results then as well support actions from a further exploitation uh, measures and also synergies with other EU programs. And this also refers to synergies with other projects, um, be it EU funded or otherwise, you know, uh, sharing is caring um, in a way. And then moving up to the next. So 
Having said that, um, let's have a quick look at the, some of the tools and services and opportunities. Um, I'll focus mostly on the Horizon Results Platform and the Horizon Results Booster here, but I'll also quickly mention the Horizon Impact Award. So these are the kind of the existing support measures, some of a uh, few, of, of course, this is not an extensive list of what exists to support really the EU funded projects in their dissemination and exploitation journey. So uh, just a quick disclaimer before moving on, the tools and the initiatives that I'm about to go into a bit more details into are really the ones that are closely linked to the RNI framework programs. So uh, such as the seventh framework program, so FP7, H2020, and Horizon Europe currently. So they will be of they will of course be of interest to all, but of particular relevance, um, I think also to the beneficiaries of these uh, programs in particular. So first off, we have here um, to begin with the Horizon Impact Award. So this is an initiative that was launched in 2019. And well, quite simply put, there's not really a secret. It recognizes and celebrates impact. So that's clear enough. But really here, the core aim of this initiative is it's one of the incentives for past beneficiaries to show what they have done and how they did it, how they got to this impact. And it's really uh, an initiative to put into the spotlight the project and the people, so really who like who is behind the success of the people who have done extra steps to make sure that their results uh, translate into societal impact with concrete benefits for citizens and society. It's, you know, as if someone would stop um, a person who's working on a project, a researcher on the street and ask a simple question, you know, why should I care about your research? You know, like, and why is my, uh, you know, like, why are my taxes perhaps funding it if it's funded by the EU? What's, what's, what's in it for me? So Horizon Impact Award tackles these, these were questions. And um, we won't have, um, I think, time to go into the details of this today, but I do invite you to look up the website and also see the videos of the past winners. They are available also if you just put it on YouTube, Horizon Impact Award, you will see different domains, different types of impact have been celebrated. Um, but it really shines a light on why we do what we do, um, lest we, I mean, because we sometimes do forget. The eligibility here, so who can benefit from this, who can apply, who can get the visibility and the award that comes with this prize is up until now all closed FP7 and H2020 projects. And the award criteria really tackles two, two main things. One of them is pathway taken to go from having the results to creating societal benefits. And the second is the already achieved and materialized impact. So not the potential of it, not the, expect the expectations, but what is there already, you know, and how is it supported by not just the stakeholders involved, perhaps in the process, but also the user communities that are really on the front line and that can confirm that they have profited from it. It takes place um, on an annual basis, with the exception of 2021. And we are actually now for the 2022 edition, we're in the middle of the evaluation process. Uh, so you can stay tuned as we do expect to announce the winners in the coming uh, research and innovation days, end of September. So that's yet to come. Moving on to another tool in the dissemination exploitation ecosystem, and this would be the Horizon Results Platform. This is something that is a free of charge um, tool for, I mean, for everyone. Uh, you can just go online and find it. Um, to be able to upload the results. Currently, it's available for the FP7, H2020, Horizon Europe, and EMFF um, beneficiaries. Other RNI programs are also in the making to be to be included there. But aside from who can upload the results, everyone can have a look at them. So this is really used a little bit also as the bridge between what are the results and what they're looking for. Um, it's really like I said, the bridge to, to bridge the gap between results and impact, including market uptake, if that would be the case, or policy making, because I mean, it's in, in the results pages, which you, which you can see on the platform, you can see what it is, what is it that the specific project is looking for, be it uh, for further collaboration, be it further funding, 
being just visibility, hey, we have this, we want it out there, uh, perhaps it can be of use to someone else, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of interesting filtering options as well by SDGs and one that is coming up uh, soon as well also by missions, by the EU missions. There's also just the plain old keyword filtering so that you can uh, just type in whatever keywords interest of you and you have a quick look of what results have already been uploaded there that might actually be of interest to you. It's a two-way street of demand and supply, so beneficiaries are invited to upload their results. Um, and interested parties, like I said before, can be anyone really, from policy makers to investors, business angels, RNI organizations, public administration, etc., and and beyond, uh, can access these results. So, and with this, make these valuable connections that can then lead to to impact. Um, so that's. A little bit on that and just to clarify that who like I was just mentioning who can make the best use of it honestly it's multifaceted so I mentioned already several potential user groups before but we can see that beneficiaries can use it to upload the results and to really make them visible and available stakeholders can so this is depending on what you're looking for, you know, depending who your stakeholders are, but they have full access to the platform as well. They can use the contact option. And from our side as well in the European Commission, we can use it as to learn from the project results and actually feed this knowledge into policy making. So it's really um, in broader terms a win-win situation with, with, with this platform and what it has to offer. And then last but not least, um, we have also the Horizon Results Booster. This is not a platform, but rather free of charge services offered by the Commission to the Framework Program beneficiaries, so FP7 and H2020 beneficiaries, with either ongoing or closed projects to assist, support, and really um, help lend, a hand in, uh, lend, a, lend some help in the, their DE journey. This is not a grant. There's no money or payments between uh, the commission and the beneficiary. Uh, this is a service that is provided um, by a team of experts. So you can see a little bit here on the slides of the different services that are available. It really varies. There's three types. You have them all from portfolio dissemination expectation strategies. So this can help the project or project groups to develop, you know, these portfolios of results and design what would be their next step in terms of dissemination and exploitation then for those who might be more ready to go to market or would like to go to market there's also a service how to develop an effective uh, developing actually an effective business plan and third last but not least you have hands-on go to market getting your research ready for that uh, commercialization step so there's uh, really from the beginning till the end of the journey, and these are free of charge and available. So it's something that, because we do understand that while dissemination and exploitation are, let's say for the EU funded projects, you, you're you supposed to already, you're thinking about them at the proposal stage, of course, but a lot of things can happen during the project. And oftentimes as well, it's, um, at a certain point, it might be lack of resources or finances or or time. So this is where the ser this service comes into play with really kind of offering that little bit of extra um, support uh, to take your results to the next level. Just to confirm, well, I covered this already, but who can benefit of this after uh, from this? After uh, opportunity. So these are ongoing or completed projects, so both, um, di directly funded by the seventh framework program by H2020 or Horizon Europe, or indirectly funded there, like it's for example would be the um, European Innovation um, EIT kicks or the, the ones covered by the Article 185. I mean, there's a little bit of uh, more analysis goes into that, but in short, it's really those that have the strong link with FP7 and H2020 and now Horizon Europe as well. And to finish on this, what's the added value of these services? I mentioned briefly that it can help you 
in in like bridging the gap with if there was uh, the willingness to do uh, to do these activities but perhaps not the resources or, or or the expertise so this really helps to generate this impact on well it helps to have this plan and these actions and this clear view and the clear path on how the generation of an impact could take place and it helps you to be on that path also interesting here because it can also help you to create this portfolio of project groups. So let's say you have one project, but you're interested to see what's more out there, perhaps different domains, but to come together with a common name and to really build on the complementarity of the different projects. So there's also the option to use the service to join forces through common dissemination activities. And this way it can also help to really reach those relevant audiences and uh, it can also help to have a better, well, in general terms, a better reach, a stronger reach when it's a more broad, you know, this is a project group of, you know, covering different aspects, covering different projects that we have, we have come to the same conclusion, perhaps this is of interest to you. Just one of the examples of, of such projects. Um, and with this, uh, I end the introduction. I mean, all, all of the aforementioned tools and initiatives, of course, have an online presence, so you can just Google them and find them online as well. The Horizon Impact Award, Horizon Results Platform, Horizon Results Booster, Horizon Echoes throughout them all. And uh, in case of any questions, of course, you may also reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to further discuss them. And thanks a lot for, for your attention today. Thanks. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, you can remain here because we are starting now um, like 15, 20 minutes of uh, debate and uh, questions and answers from, the, from you, from the attendees. Um, so uh, let's start with what question that was asked online in the, in the YouTube from one of the online attendees. And uh, this question was directly to Tyler, uh, but in fact could be then replicated to the others. Uh, the, the question was how, um, in that case, a uh, Horizon 2020 project can join the EU Farm book. I guess that joining meaning uh, uh, uploading their knowledge objects into the platform. Yes, uh, I realized, uh, I was thinking about it before my presentation that I completely forgot to include the uh, contact info or for more information. So I can uh, share that, uh, maybe, maybe you could disseminate it, but I think the, there, the options we have right now are, you may have seen on the platform, there's a contribute to EU farm book. And if you click that link, um, first you have to register for um, an account that allows you to, like gives you credentials. So we'll send, uh, send credentials to log in and then use uh, an upload form that has basically drop down menus and uh, you, you fill in for uh, any, any like single or few objects you want to add that has that metadata that I mentioned. So once you, if you fill in those fields, then you submit it, it's, uh, it gets a quick review by our team and then uploaded to the database. and. Uh, so just going to the website, it's eufarmbook.eu, uh, we'll, we'll link you there, but that is fairly limited. We don't actually see it as being, uh, we put a lot of effort into exploring that idea because we kind of needed to, but probably for most projects that have uh, larger sets of things to add, it's more the either sending you our template file in an Excel format where it has that same information, but it allows like you can copy paste things that are similar and format data that way. Or in the example, like for if you have a database already and you want to, sh we want to link a lot of things. Also, it's possible to harvest from the farm book into your database. Then doing that through some, figuring out how to do it uh, behind the scenes, like in the database exchange, uh, which requires some manual checking and probably coding of to map the information, but we pull the basic metadata basically, and then it allows a user to search and find it in your site. Uh, and it, with a link to go usually back to, for example, the Rosewood platform, if they want more information is, is an example of how it would work. So there, it's still ongoing. The platform is 
it's, we're in the in-between project phase, and, uh, but it's still, we have a very committed team of partners, so it's a little bit quieter time right now as we go through our, our final review and everything, but it starts already in August, the new project, and so it will ramp up pretty quickly in the first uh, six months again, and then really uh, start to, we, we hope that there's a snowballing effect of, of bringing in a lot more content, because it's very limited right now. There's about eight, to eight or 900 uh, knowledge objects in the database, but for how broad the platform is, it's actually not very much. Thank you, Taylor. I, I think one, one important message is that even if the U Farm book is still in its pilot version, any data that you upload there will be kept for the, for the final version that will be developed in the, in the project that is starting right now. Ignacio, what do you if want you, to add? If you allow me, I was also involved in the preparation of U Farm book. And I want to just highlight there's another way of engaging with U Farm book. And I think the big potential is that it has a big interface with advisory services. So I think that there's going to be a lot of work to embed your farm book into advisory services, train them, and have this bilateral direction. So in your regions, in your place, we have all the challenge to develop the forest advisory services. We have some good examples in Europe, but in a few countries. I, I was very happy to hear this morning EU Commission DG Agri, uh, or DG RDT presenting this new call on developing forestry advisory services. This, one, this is one, one to follow. And, uh, and yeah, so there's this interface. And I think the critical um, element of all these databases beyond the technicalities, beyond the content, is the use. And I think this iteration will be what will make your farm book a success. It's very much oriented to practitioners. Yeah. And, and the advisory services are the critical intermediary for the final forester to advisory service and your farm book. So this is another possibility to engage. Yes. Thank you, Daphia. So maybe I continue with you asking the, the same question. How uh, a project could knock at the bioregions facility door and say, look, I have a project. What, what's there uh, for me to, to support my project? And uh, so which, okay, we are which way do you suggest to, if you to see, reach you? If you see your farm book a lot in the practitioner interface and for the zero a lot in the policy interface with some practice also, we are in this innovation side. So we, many of our activities are open. So when, uh, at the end of this month, we are going to having a workshop about systemic regional transitions with GRC, BioEast, big other actors, and we will visit a big bio refinery. This is open to anybody online and, and in presence. Uh, our speed datings are open to anybody, and we're very happy to receive uh, now we are in this topic of bio-based solutions for construction. We are very uh, happy to receive um, proposals to present, to network. We have, um, so uh, many of our activities are open to anybody and we are very happy to receive proposals. We have a few activities that are uh, member, um, for member regions or member. So I, I think it will stay tuned to our networks and, and when activities are, are, are good for you, just uh, contact us and we will be very happy to provide a platform because we are trying to bring all this innovation from EU projects to regional stakeholders to facilitate uh, speed up. So, but, we, we, but we are more focusing on innovation, uh, 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 a lot on business creation, but also organizational innovation and, and social innovation in this side. Thank you, Ignacio. <laughs> uh, and then I ask the same question to, to Jens. Uh, imagine that there is someone here that it's uh, involved in a uh, project related to uh, forest risks, how, how can this project benefit or access to the, this future forest risk platform? Yeah, so the, the easiest way would be to just email me. I, I shared the, the email address, but you can also find um, the address on foresteurope.org. We are absolutely happy to get in contact with projects and activities which, for example, deal with wildfire or, or storms or, or pests. But also, I mean, um, it's also very important for us that we also closely cooperate together with partners which see maybe even a different perspective on forest risk because, I mean, we are now currently proposing to really concentrate on forest damage agents, but risk is much more, you know, and obviously um, we need to, to focus somehow, but we still would like to really have this holistic, comprehensive picture. So even if there is something which is currently not in detail proposed and is associated to forest risk and, and forest adaptation, and you're interested in this transboundary approach, um, you're very well, welcome to contact us via the email or the, the webpage forest, foresteurope.org. Thank you, Jens. Uh, 
I feel free not to ask this same question to Katrina because Katrina, you, you clearly answer how to access the Horizons Result Booster and the Horizons Result uh, Service. So, um, is there any? I open the question for the for the attendees here in person. Unless there is any other question from online attendees, Javier. No. Any any question from from the audience? Other like otherwise, I have a list of questions prepared here for the. For the speakers, yes, Uwe. I don't want to be the only one who starts, <laughs> but uh, I have a lot of questions. So, um, uh, to Inatio, uh, you are mentioning um, this is about innovation. So, will this platform also offer the opportunity, you know, to connect people and work on innovation, like in a way like an open innovation system, um, and? How do you see the role of industry in there? Is it possible to bring in industries, you know, who also have more of a different interest, a focus on, on, uh, yeah, making money, uh, making business? Uh, how do you see that linked in there? Because we are discussing similar ideas in the wood construction projects we are involved in. Uh, the question is, how does this really fit to primary resources, forestry production, and so on, uh, rural areas? Yeah, it's a challenge how to bridge these communities. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I think we are, uh, really our ambition is to create a strong open innovation hub in forest and forest-based industries in Europe. Uh, we, were, we are going to start modest and we want to increase. So for the moment, in this year, we are not going to target specific industries, but we have discussions with, uh, with industries and we are looking, and in the future, we, we, we plan to target specific challenges for industrial, industrial um, uh, challenges and maybe sponsored by specific industries that are looking uh, to these tools and we want to provide. But now we want to socialize open innovation. I think in a science environment, social innovation is very easy to understand. It's the way science goes, it's the, it's the way of Rosewood. Uh, but we want to, to socialize this in regional actors, stakeholders. And, but our idea is, de is definitely to develop a hub that is looking at, at all the at different levels in the, in the value chain. So we, we, we will start more at, at, let's say, at regional cluster level, general needs of a region. So we are, but, and then we will move, as, uh, if we are successful and we are able to realize our dreams, we will move into supporting industries. And not only through these bio regions. So for example, we, I was telling you, we have a, in a separate project related to wildfire. We, we are also preparing an open innovation challenge for next uh, year on wildfire related issues to bring innovations, technological solutions to our um, to the project stakeholders that are uh, dealing with wildfire risk management. So, and we will incrementally work in this in this open innovation uh, hub. But now, for now, we, we start modest at regional le regional level challenges. Then we will go to, to industry. Uh, and of course, we want to. We, we think our the research network is so large that we need to mobilize it much better. Thank you, Nathia. Any other question, uh, Pablo? Hi, I'm Pablo Sabin, I'm from CC4, and my question is also for Ignacio. It's about how, how are you, how, how do you foresee this um, open innovation hub, uh, the, part the participation of some regions that are not involved in the bio regions facility? Are you thinking somehow to integrate them, or it's going to be mandatory to be part of the bio regions to, to, to be part of, of, of this hub? I think we are, uh, our work is work in progress. Uh, so now we, we developed a core group of regions to advance. Now we are open to new regions, so any region interested can contact us, and we, we are very much willing to cooperate with others. As I tell you, many of our activities are open, and we channel them through ERIN, Bioeconomy Working Group or Area Working Group. So many of the things we do, we, we, we collaborate with other regions. For example, the SAR Bio and Bioeconomy Perceptions is open to any region. It was launched in Castilla León, fantastic. It was launched in Tuscany, uh, fantastic, and, and any of your regions could be. For this challenge now, in the terms of the demand side, we are servicing our own regions, and, and the winners will be contacted with our regional ecosystems now. So trying to bring talent and ideas to the regional innovation ecosystem. On the other side, the solution uh, seekers, or the solution providers, are open to, to all Europe. 
So any company from Castilla León can join the challenge and eventually make business in, in, in Germany or in North Carelia. So in, in, for, for the moment, but of course, we will be looking at, at, at ways of, of increasing this in the future, and we may end up having this uh, in, in a much broader way. Uh, for the moment, demand side is our regional network, uh, supply side is Europe, so any Rosewood partner can be supplier of solutions. And I think we, we, we can help developing the ideas, the business, and from there, this can fly. Huh? This can fly to, to anywhere. But, but this will evolve in the future, I'm sure. Thank you, Nacio. Uh, we have a question here from Maria Rosa. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your presentations. I have a question uh, related with the connection that uh, your hubs, your books, and your innovations and networks have with the new tools that the European Commission is establishing, like, for example, Living Labs, and uh, as a way to put in place this type of innovations for a, a specific community around uh, a, 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 in a region, and, uh, and also, or even the lighthouses. I forgot to say I'm Rosa Mosquera from the University of Santiago de Compostela. Thank you. If, who wants to answer? If you have the question is connecting innovation to living labs and lighthouses. I think as I understand the, there's a lot about multi-actor approaches in a territorial base uh, in, the, in these new tools. Uh, we will be working with the with the result platform, we were discussing with them how we can develop demand side uh, side in their website, so I can put demands and mobilize. But coming to this, I think we, we have a vision on the bioeconomy in terms of a territorial approach. It's not, let's say, a value chain approach. It's not about green chemistry or, or about wood construction. Only it's about linking stakeholders, talking to each other, creating partnerships. So this is, this is what we are focused on, on having the a strong footprint in the region and creating this regional mindset. And we do this also through cross-regional cooperation. This is a way of work. So it fits very well in the instruments. Specifically how we're going to use these instruments, we ha one of the things we do is project broker ads. And, and uh, it's, this is a tricky thing, but we try to incorporate regional stakeholders in, in proposals and we, and we try to embed our idea of open innovation um, in proposals. Uh, so it's more, uh, we try to enrich what we do in proposals, but we don't have anything specifically targeting um, um, the living labs. So, so we work as a, we work as a sort of a living lab in our regions. Um, you want to add me? or complete your... Yeah, sure. Uh, I, uh, hello, Rosa. I was like, I'm also meeting a partner in, your, in Eureka for the first time, so in real life. <laughs> Welcome. Um, but I think in the... We've really learned from our experiences so far that, um, well, once this tool, the, the farm book, is, is more ready for broader dissemination, that's why I mentioned the, there's really a strong focus and a lot of budget dedicated towards the education and training. And I think that's quite flexible uh, in terms of it, it's at member state region and maybe even, even finer scale. Uh, and if they want to, uh, yes, put it towards a living lab or create something like this, then I think there's, there's the budget there to support those kinds of activities. Um, so I think the project is set up in a pretty holistic way uh, that hopefully, hopefully allows these sorts of things to happen um, so that it's not just a, a platform that we invite people to, but there's actually some of the material in the platform is used as the basis for trainings. And then, of course, that will bring people to to it, uh, but I think that's a really good model and so an important question. Jens, do you want to complete? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah sure. In the context of the forest, we have, so to say, a two-way um, uh, approach. One uh, very important approach is the direct contact to our um, countries and observers, and they obviously have the, be the best understanding of relevant activities and initiatives, and which would be a good fit for um, the way we uh, propose and which we foresee from September onwards. And the second um, way is that we obviously also do an intensive screening. 
uh, because a lot of information about relevant uh, activities is available, ongoing but also closed initiatives. And um, wherever we see the potential, we also are uh, active and get in contact um, with them. So with the, those two approaches, we hope to, to get the most um, out of it to identify the, 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 the relevant partners. Thank you, Jens. Maybe, Katrina, you want to, to add something on how to connect, for example, the, the living labs with the actors and the stakeholders? Make it available. I mean, we can go into more details, but how to connect would be really having a good plan from the get-go, but this involves uh, really an expert help of knowing what is the landscape, doing a little bit of the market research, market research, not in terms of just, you know, commercialization. It's really the market research of who are your groups and how, who is the one you want to connect to. So it's, it's a bit, I can only comment in broader terms. And then it of course depends, uh, project to project on a case by case basis, but, uh, at the bottom of it, I would say uh, effective strategy of d &E would be my first uh, step. Thank you, Katrina. Um, we are finishing the session, but I would like to launch a question for you all. So for the, for the panelists, but also for the attendees here. Uh, is As we have Katrina as a representative of the European Commission, um, do you, some of you have any in mind any service that you would like to have from set up by the European Commission? So we know that, for example, through the uh, funding and tenders portal, uh, we have some services, and Katrina presented the Horizon Social Booster, the Horizon Social Platform, but maybe you have in mind any uh, specific service that you would like the European Commission to provide to the uh, H2020 and Horizon Europe uh, projects? And if yes, launch it here. Maybe Katrina will capture it. And uh, let's see what, uh, what, uh, uh, where, do, what, where does uh, this bring to. Or if your idea comes later, just uh, email to Katrina. <laughs> Yeah, also through email, but it's always good to gather feedback, as you know, there's uh, the initiatives, some of them, like the Horizon Results Booster, is for a specific period of time, so it's important to know what has worked well, what has not, and what is it that actually beneficiaries are looking for. So please, if you have uh, suggestions or a uh, list of wishes, uh, let me know. Ah, Ignacio, maybe he has no. an idea. No. <laughs> Edward, thank you. Because I think we, we had a couple of meetings that you organized, Edward, with the with the new commission platform, and and we discussed. And I think you have already the idea, but maybe you can develop a bit on on developing this demand side. So you have the result booster where projects put the results. But if I'm looking for solutions, what is f I only I can do can, I can search or I can actually post my demand and, and, and have a site. So I think, I think you are thinking on, on in the future and developing something in this sort, which I think it will be very useful. So you can uh, really uh, interact demand and, 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 and supply of knowledge. I fully agree. No, indeed. I mean, at the bottom of it for the Horizon Results platform, it's really the fact that it's matchmaking, but not one-sided. So that ideally, in an ideal world with the future, it's a relatively new platform, um, but in the future developments, if possible, it would be great to not only have this side of the beneficiaries hosting their their results, but also from the demand side, be it investor, be it whomever else, um, their own profiles showing we I'm interested in this, this, and this. So indeed, the, the demand side needs some further um, thought put into it for sure. Thanks, thanks for the comment. And Taylor? It's a bit, maybe it's a, a question and a suggestion or at, at the same time. So I, I'm not uh, super familiar with the, the landscape and the diff, really the, in detail the different types of projects, but one it, more of a big or wilder idea is I wonder if uh, because this dissemination exploitation is so important and we all recognize that, but we recognize the challenge of finding the resources to do it well, are there projects or should there be that for people who love to do that kind of work that are purely dissemination ex and exploitation actions or projects where they, they get to uh, maybe link with 
ongoing uh, projects or representatives thereof, and then their their job is really just to share it, uh, and they ha and they're given the resources to do that. Um, so it's a bit of a an out there idea, but I think it's I think there are people who enjoy that that type of work and would find it very rewarding. So. Certainly, I think what in part answers this kind of um, question demand already would be one of the services specifically for dissemination exploitation provided by the booster because it's people who are uh, diehard fans of all things dissemination exploitation and experts for this as well and they are the ones lending that helping hand um, to the project but indeed something that to think of for the future would be brainstorming here, you know, like one of the common support actions, which are really the ones that have this expertise and then provide it for a broader set of projects. So thanks, thanks, thanks for the comment. It's good to see that there's interest in something like this. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jens, something? I can just, I mean, we have a different perspective, so <laughs> to say, but uh, what was introduced is uh, more a support of um, the, the, the further development of, 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 of the database so that it's supported when you're looking for um, already closed and, 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 and finished um, projects um, that you get the information you need and the, the, the way forward, which was introduced in the presentation, I think is the right way forward to really out of the pile and uh, massive amount of information, find what you need in the most efficient time. And I think this is really important and particular for screening and for, for finding added values and so on. So I think this is rather a statement of support for, for the introduced way forward. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for the speakers. <laughs> thank you all of you. So it's time for the coffee break. Uh, we'll take uh, kind of yeah, 25 minutes uh, so let's go back here at quarter past four for the second blocks where success stories of projects that succeeded to continue their activities once the EU uh, stopped the funding uh, will be there presented and similarly uh, debated here. So see you in 25 minutes. Um, one, thing I, one thing that I didn't comment is...
yeah, yeah, I don't know what's doing here. Uh, we may have the, the presentation for this afternoon, please. The tec Los Tecnicos. Okay, so, um, mm, 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 mm. yep. Hola. Ah, ahora lo anuncio. Sí, si os queréis sentar aquí, sí. Sí, pero tiene problemas de garganta, se añadirá al final. ¿Porque eso está en online o qué más? Bueno, ahora lo explico. Okay, hello. Okay. So welcome back. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, having interrupted some of the interesting discussions that you were having around the, the coffee break. But we have a, a little bit longer uh, second block uh, now uh, because I would like to provide more time of debate uh, around this topic. That, is the, that are the success cases of EU-funded projects uh, that succeeded to maintain uh, part of their activities and that their network once the project, uh, the, the European funding was, was over. Um, we have a slight modification in the program because the first speaker, uh, Lydia Guitart, uh, she cannot be here and she cannot attain online due to last minute health issues. So she's very, she, she's very sorry not being able to, to present. Lydia Guitard is the forest engineer at the Forest Owners Association of Montnegri Corrado here in Catalonia, about 40 kilometers northeast of, um, of Barcelona. And uh, they were managing uh, the project Singular Wood that was uh, funded by the European Agricultural uh, fund for uh, rural development, uh, but unfortunately she will not be able to be here. So uh, what I suggest uh, is that I would briefly present her project because EFI had the chance two weeks ago to, uh, to meet her and uh, see what the project Singular Good managed to do and uh, which are the main challenging the challenges that they are facing now. So. Uh, in my modesty, I will try to present as best as I can uh, uh, this, this project, although I don't have the slides that Lydia prepared. Then we'll have um, a tandem presentation uh, from CC4. Uh, so uh, Pablo Sabin and Ricardo Castellini, who will present uh, two interreg projects that succeeded to maintain their activities, one around mycology and the other around um, model forests. So we'll see how, how they managed to still continue running this. Um, then the, the third presentation will be from Antoine Cremer. I, don't, I suppose that he should be online now, from the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment in Roye. Uh, and he will present it, Eveltree, an FP6 uh, network of excellence that many years later uh, is still active. And uh, Antoine Cremer, in fact, was uh, the former coordinator and the one who succeeded to keep the, this network of excellence uh, alive. And uh, finally, we'll have another tandem presentation so, uh, of, uh, on organic farm knowledge. Uh, it's a group of H2020 projects. Well, the Lauren and, and Bram will give you more details, but at least some H2020 projects, some of them being uh, CSA, that grouped under this organic farm knowledge and uh, succeeded to maintain their network and activities um, alive. Okay, and uh, Bram will be online. Lauren is having some cough problems, so. Uh, not to disturb the presentation, she will join at the moment of, uh, of a speaking and uh, be here also for the, for the debate. So that's why Lauren is, is not here by now. So let me, as I said, very modestly, I, don't, I, I only have this slide, uh, uh, introduce the project uh, Singular Wood, who, who, that should have been presented by Lydia uh, Guitart. Uh, Singular Wood 
it's, uh, as I said, a uh, project funded by the, uh, I never remember the acronym in English because it's unpronounceable. So in, in Spanish and French it's FEA there, so the, the agricultural regional, agri yeah, this? <laughs> the, um, so what this uh, singular good project aimed at, it was coordinated by this association of, of uh, forest owners. And uh, they realized that there were some pieces of wood in the, in the properties of, uh, of, the, of the forest owners that due to their characteristics, they could not enter into the uh, usual market of, uh, of, uh, of timber. And in the worst case, they were chipped and used as uh, fuel wood. So, um, Thanks to this uh, singular wood project, they built uh, the framework to uh, identify and convey these species that, of wood that were these logs that came from the properties from the, uh, of the landowners of the Forest Owners Association and uh, conveyed into a, a new supply chain. And this is, this is the, the, their main challenge. They were building uh, a new branch of the wood supply chain from zero. Why? Because these pieces are usually of very big dimensions, especially for the, for the trees that are involved. We are thinking here about Mediterranean tree species that uh, usually don't reach uh, big sizes, or at least in our quite young Catalan forests, uh, we're thinking about oaks, home oaks, um, um, uh, pinus, uh, even uh, eucalyptus. So, too big to be sown or, or too big to fit into the standard uh, sawmills, and also having some particularities, some either a, a flaw in the, in the, in the wood uh, that would not allow them to be used in the conventional or the standard use of, uh, of so, uh, sound wood. So they identify these species, these, uh, these, uh, these species, and they, instead of putting them into the market for, in the best case, wood chips or just pallets, so very low value, they collected them into the timber yard, and they don't have a sawmill as association, so when they have enough of these species, they send them to uh, two sawmills, um, one of them, for example, that it's uh, collaborating with them is specialized in uh, sowing uh, tropical, tropical woods, so woods of big dimensions for uh, furniture um, making. And these species are, before uh, being sown, they are photographed, they are characterized, and once they are sown into, in, uh, in boards, each board also is measured, is described, is photographed, and is put together, so uh, one on the top of the other, uh, what is usually called a bull, and uh, they make it dry. And they build this website that you can visit, Singular Wood, um, that it's one of the, the, the piece, the main piece that they set up, thanks to this project, to co um, uh, contact the potential buyers of these uh, pieces of wood. So, you, you see the catalog in the website, like, the, the, like for example, the four uh, pictures that you see here, but there are many of them. You can scroll down, see all of them. When you click, you see a complete uh, sheet describing all the boards that you have from this, uh, from this log, and you have a price. And I must say that the prices are over 1,000 euros for the whole, for the whole log, uh, because this is... Uh, uh, the, the, the potential customers are mainly uh, uh, art, wood artisans, furniture makers that use uh, these singular boards to build singular uh, and unique pieces of, uh, of furniture. So having talked with, uh, with them, of course, one of the challenges is uh, from the technical side is not having a sawmill, so they have to wait until they have enough uh, logs to fill uh, a truck to send to the, to the sawmill. So this means that some pieces may uh, deteriorate while waiting to be, to be sawn. And the other, um, uh, the other challenge is 
connecting the buyers. Because the providers, they are the, the forest owners of their own association, so they are all aware that this project exists and that they can sell these locks to the, to the forest owners association who then sows and sells them to the furniture makers and the, and the wood, uh, and the wood uh, artisans. But it's challenging for them to connect to these wood artisans. Uh, well, the project uh, itself, the funding finished uh, last year, so it's still an early post-project uh, situation. Uh, and how do they maintain uh, their activities that it's mainly the website, but also they would like uh, to have enough profit to buy uh, uh, a portable sawmill and also to improve the timber yard to uh, optimize the drying conditions of the of the of the logs and the boards is by the so by selling this uh, these pieces of wood so uh, the owner uh, the their their business model is that they pay the owner as uh, wood chips the the price and then if finally the lock is sold for the to a to an artisan or to a, a furniture maker they they pay the, the 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 extra revenue that they got from this uh, uh, upgrading uh, of the of the selling of this of this good, and part of these uh, benefits go to the association, so they can uh, their objective is to uh, of course maintain the website, uh, pay the extra work that supposes. Uh, uh, or that implies taking a picture of the of the log, taking the picture of each uh, board, measuring it, creating the sheet of each uh, of each uh, log, and also uh, they would like to have uh, enough revenue, also enough profits to, as I said, buy a portable sawmill and improve the the conditions of the of the timber yard. So. Uh, this is as far as I can I can present. I, I'm sorry that Lydia cannot be here. So um, uh, let's go. Let's continue with the with the next uh, with the next presentation. That it's uh, a tandem presentation uh, from CC4. First, uh, Pablo Sabin, and then uh, Ricardo will will intervene also. Okay. Thank you very much. Eduard, thank you very much for inviting us to be here. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here in this excellent uh, meeting. And I'm going to take some minutes to tell you a story, a story that started uh, quite uh, years ago, several years ago, in 2002 were a, a first live project called MIAS was launched and it was Mycology and Sustainable uh, Harvesting. It was a live project uh, which is, it was launched in Soria, in Castilla León, in the province of Soria, where the Sephora is located. And by that, by that time, things that, that now in Castilla León we, for us, they are usual, they weren't usual by that time. By that time, uh, harvesting of mushroom was something usual in the villages of Soria, but there were a lot of, uh, I think, th there were not a uh, sector after this, uh, this resource. And what we, are, uh, we, are at, we have achieved from 2002 till, till now is to, to, to build a sector based on mycology. Uh, by that time, some people get to the forest, go, went to the forest and get some mushroom, they sell it, they get their profit, and there was an informal economy we had quite first about the sustainable 
uh, harvest of this, uh, of this resource. Sometimes we saw a lot of people coming from other places with rakes and taking all the mushrooms, and we didn't know if that is going to be sustainable or not. And we had this, uh, the, the local population, which uh, somehow it was not involved in this in this harvest of the resource, they don't touch any money, so there's quite like a conflict also in in the in, in the province. So with this project, we start to know a little bit more about uh, 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 mycology and, um, and the and the production of, of of mushrooms in the forest. We increase the knowledge and we promote and disseminate information of, about fungi all over uh, the province. And we started to create a, a European mycological network in order to get in touch with other researchers, other organizations facing the same, same problems. It was one million euros funded. And then we, uh, time passed by and several years later, uh, with some funds from the regional uh, government between uh, another project, uh, an interreg, was, was uh, launched, it was the project Mico Silva, where we uh, start to relate uh, mushroom production and forest management, and how can we combine uh, or, or uh, to profit this uh, this resource, the resource in the forest management. Uh, in this uh, project, may, uh, more actions related to create networks, to integrate management, uh, forest and, and fungi production, and to train and start to train people in the area in order to get this mycological uh, possibilities to, to, to new jobs or new opportunities in the, in the area. And then another project, and this is the last one, which it was 1.2 million euros, it was Microsilva Plus, it was another Interrac Sudoe, where we, uh, na, we started to promote uh, the, the mushroom production and to integrate this in an economic in economical way in the in the society so uh, here uh, we stimulate the regulation policy and governance which was the most important part of this uh, mico silva and with all this with this three project uh, we uh, create micocil which is a regulated uh, system for uh, mushroom harvesting in Castilian, not only in Soria but all over Castilian, and based on a, a, a regulation decree where all which is uh, based on all, all the in research doing have been done during these three projects, and it's in, including this Micocil project. The Micocil project uh, was the for who took the 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 the, um, the position to manage this uh, Micocil. We are a semi-public and private organization. We are a private organization, but with a lot of public support. So we are like we are seen like something like mm, not controversial in terms of uh, our activity that we, 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 are, we are seen like a partner for for uh, private sector but also a partner for the public public sector so we took this initiative we with these of objectives that uh, sustainable less to to improve the sustainability of the mycological resources, to compatibilize this with other forestry uses, to organize, organize the sector, the market, transparency, and to re reduce this informal economy, 
and increase and better distribution of the, of the local incomes. And it was, uh, we need to, to do that, we need to create a governance structure. And this governance structure was, uh, was led by CESE4, but uh, we had also the participation of the Regional Ministry of Environment of, of Castile León, of the region, and the Provincial Council, which represent the municipalities. Okay. And we, we act as ma manager of the program. But not uh, in this scheme of governance, we have also to include uh, other stakeholders like landowners. Here, mainly, uh, Mikothil has been has focused especially mainly in, in public uh, sec in public forest owners, um, uh, microbiological association because we have several microbiological association in Castile León. We have nine provinces, so sorry is one of them, but we are in a regional level, so we have this microbiological association in all the provinces. Uh, we want to involve also companies and agents from the tourism sector because uh, this was one of the uh, uh, opportunities that, that we saw when we launched the program that uh, maybe tourism could be a, a very important in terms of economy in talking about mushrooms uh, production, other research uh, institutions and some others. And Mikosil focus on four areas, which are forestry and resource management, mycotourism and gastronomy, uh, pro agri food, promotion of consumption, consumption uh, new products, traceability, and uh, training, consumer education, and, and restaurant networks. And we launched also a, a guarantee mark, which is Setas de Castilleon. So we, we're going to make a lot, make a field works on the resource, but also work in promotion, in promotion and uh, research and innovation in all the value chain. So, and the model, the business model was, was uh, we need to have incomes and and the business model was designed to have these uh, permits, uh, individual permits. Uh, uh, so everyone that wants to collect mushroom should take a permit, which is valued between three and 300 euros. It depends on if you are local, provincial, linked, or general. It depends on the temporality of the permit. It's daily, today, seasonal. It, it varies also if it's recreational or commercial, commercial, and we have some special permits. So everyone that wants to pick mushrooms in the regulated area has to take the, this permit, and this is going to uh, where we are. That's take, this is the idea, and where we are now, we have uh, 200,000 more or less hectares uh, managed under, regulated under the Mycothil scheme, so managed by CESE4, but we also have other 400,000 hectares in Castilleón which are not managed by CESE4 because the maturity of the uh, system has allowed to, to be replicated by other organizations and other institutions in Castilleón. So now we have 600,000 of hectares in Castilleón. And as we, I told you before, we are uh, responsible of 228,000 of them. And how we do it? We buy the harvesting rights for the municipalities and we pay them for these harvesting rights and we sell the individual permits to people living in the villages in the province and people who is coming to Castilla León to pick mushrooms in a commercial way or in a recreative way. And we use these incomes to pay structural costs of the organization of Micosil and in case of profit or surplus, we uh, revert it to the municipalities. 
At the, uh, as you can see now, we are selling in, two, in 2021 uh, 67,000 permits in Castile León, 72,000 in 2020, 62 in 2018. It was a very bad year in 2017 because uh, the drought in, in autumn, so we didn't have too much mushrooms. Uh, we have estimated that we have 40 455,000 harvesters in Castilla y León and 250 uh, micro-tourists, which are uh, very important in terms of the revenue for, for, the, for, for the region. Uh, as we can see in this graph in the left, we see that the property rights, so the municipalities or landowners, they don't uh, earn a lot of money with that, and most of the um, uh, of the incomes or, or most of the uh, uh, the the yes the activity or the the economical activity is in the uh, uh, agroalimentary uh, transformation and or commercialization of the mushrooms and microtourism, which are these are the most important. And I just want to finish with some general figures. Uh, Mycothil represents nowadays 30% of the regulated area. Annual incomes from coming from permits are near 300,000 uh, uh, euros per year. And we get some annual regional and local funds. So we have an annual budget of uh, 400,000 euros. There's six people uh, working uh, as permanent staff managing this, uh, this regulated area. And if we look at the impacts for the whole sector, we can say that this story that started 20 years ago, it's been a very good story for Castileón because nowadays we have estimate of 20 million euros in tourism more than 20 million euros also in mushroom commercialization coming from uh, mushroom from our, our forest. We have almost think, 5 million euros of money going to harvesters and more and more under a formal economy. It, it, it's equivalent to, to 100 full-time equivalent jobs, so it's not that bad in, in terms of uh, of job because we have to realize that the jobs are also are always in rural areas, so it's very important. It's a temporary job, but it's quite important. And for municipalities, some money, but uh, it's not too much. And just to finish, uh, all this uh, system, all this micro, uh, all this micro seal program, has launch also other related or, or has need to launch other related services. For example, a lot of technological development, digitalization. We have a, a traceability system that now is used by uh, most of the uh, um, companies that commercialize uh, mushroom because it's mandatory for them to have uh, a traceability system and this is connected this system is connected with police so they can check if the mushroom are mm, fairly uh, collected and we have another application for for uh, uh, collectors and also for for inspectors of mycology now we have real-time production models, so uh, nowadays we can check where and how much production of the different most important species are being uh, growing, are growing in the forest. So um, tourists or uh, commercial collectors can uh, prepare their, uh, their visits. And this is now based on remote sensing, of course, and it's quite useful. 
and we also monitor uh, harvesting pressure, we monitor production, we have from last mm, years of the last century, from 1995, uh, permanent plots collected every week all the edible ma mushrooms, and we have a long series of data in, that have allowed us to make this, all these uh, models for production. And we have a lot of activities on promotion, like mm, making short uh, circuits of, of, of selling uh, in, the, in the local markets, um, activities to increase the knowledge of the resource and to use the resource. So, and we have this guarantee mark of Setas de Castilla y León. So nowadays, after these three funded projects, we have a Mycosil program well established. We have also another programs in Castilla y León, which has have been developed uh, after Mycosil. Mycosil has opened a window for many other people to work in this area uh, with a bottom-up approach. And now we have a regulated harvesting, guaranteeing sustainability, and enhancing tourism and business development. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Yeah, so now we have to switch to another network. Yes, another network born after a European project, such as our. Huh? It was a project funded under the Interreg uh, MED project. At that time, uh, it was the Interreg uh, 4B, something like this. Uh, anyway, it is the Interreg program open um, for the Mediterranean regions from Algarve in Portugal until Greece. And uh, this project was dedicated to governance, basically, for the coordination of regional policies for the forest with the help of a new governance instrument, the model forest, which is a governance tool coming from Canada, basically. The lead partner was from Corsica, or French. Well, but it really doesn't matter, the, the project. The main project objective was, uh, uh, you know, the, as usual, a blah, 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 and uh, the establishment of uh, a model of governance uh, for, uh, to set up a coordination, really, well, pure theory. But there was a concrete exercise, meaning the creation of the first association, because the model forest is an association, a new uh, body, a new entity in each region involved. This was the real challenge. And this was the first key, huh? because I would like really to focus about the key of success, because you have to know. It doesn't matter if you know what a model forest is. It doesn't matter if you don't know about this tool of governance. You just have to know that this association created between uh, 2012 and 2015 are still alive. Are still alive today and more or less, depend on the <laughs> countries, uh, are good, or, well, with up and downs. So the exercise, the keys, the first keys of the success was, first of all, the selection of the pilot site, which is important. So it was demanded to create a new body, new entity, legal entity, so establishing a new local partnership with a strategic plan and a new association, so a new legal body. The keys were, first of all, the selection of the local public authority that function as a locomotive. What does it mean? That uh, the association could work only in the territories that um, the partners of the project 
was able to see a real involvement of the people, you know, but the real people, the real people living there in this concrete territory, the people that were interested to join a forum for exchanging their opinions about the management of the forest. And this was the real key, because if you are wrong with the selection of the territory, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's no way. For example, in Italy, where I live, in Tuscany, uh, there is a model forest association that was created around uh, a union of, of municipalities in the province of Florence. And for example, one reasonment was that all these mayors were, was from the same party, because the political is also important. And so, <laughs> better to avoid the po uh, po polit uh, political conflicts from the beginning. Then, involve in the association the competent authority, which was the region. The region, and could be different uh, in, in each country. Maybe in some countries is, is, the, is the state, in other countries we have uh, the provinces or the counties, uh, depend, depends. Third, voluntary basis. When you are creating something new, you have to select the territory, you have to talk with the people, but you have to explain very well that the commitment is voluntary. You know, because I can say you, under my experience, that it's better to start without money. It's better at the local level, because we are too much used to work with a project funded with uh, regular funds. And so we don't face any problems since the beginning. It's, uh, everything is easy. Eh? We, can, we can select uh, staff, organize meetings. So in that case, the Model Forest Association were created without funds. Eh? Just uh, start, and then we will see. <laughs> um, the fifth is also important, because um, you know the fundraising sometimes is wrong, because uh, we are encouraged nowadays to see the important programs such as Horizon, Life, Erasmus, Interreg, but at the local level, it doesn't work. The, the, the fundraising should, should be a bottom-up approach. These local associations succeed at the beginning, for example, with the help of the local action groups, with the GALS, and with the funds of their own regions, maximum with the funds from the ministries. But now, after 10 years, the Model Forest Association are directly participating in Horizon Europe project, which is amazing, amazing. And then, of course, since the beginning, create this kind of new body with uh, working groups very specific, specialized thematically. For example, Daniela will have to uh, create this new network, this new Rosewood network, but maybe we can think about uh, some working groups dedicated to climate change, I don't know, governance or uh, rural development, uh, but very specific because we have to do a factory of projects, you know, we have to play the game, uh, try and try and try until uh, <laughs> we succeed. And then, well, another key of success was the evolution of a network, because uh, at the beginning, the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean Model Forest Network was a network of regions, regional authorities. And then with the time when each region selected a pilot site and created the first association, the network is changed in a network of association. So the region behind, the associations in front. And now the network is a, is a network of, uh, with uh, eight uh, uh, certified from the Canadian uh, Model Forest Association and some new initiatives, some, some candidates and some new initiatives in Italy, uh, in Greece, and so on. We started with a memorandum of understanding and we did the same, for example, I, some couple of months ago I sent the MOU of the Mediterranean Model Forest Network to to Javier, to, to Daniela, to, the, to um, Eduard, in order to keep it as an example 
of a protocol of collaboration with, uh, within, between public authorities, uh, starting new adventure with a new network. Then we, have, we had a single secretariat from the beginning. During 10 years, the secretariat of this network has been endorsed by the region Castilla León and managed by CSF4. And since uh, 2021, uh, it is managed by the Tuscany region with a new commitment because money is important, we have to say it, and to, in this case, the Tuscany region put the money uh, in, to create a new secretariat. I am a member of this uh, uh, secretariat, and of course, um, uh, we are paid, uh, but we are working for all the associations involved in the, in the network. The associations are independent, huh? so we can propose them to participate in a new adventure, but uh, basically they are free to do everything they want, they need. They are completely independent, and this is another key of success. So the main barriers uh, for the current association. Yeah, lack of funds at the beginning, but it's good to start without, uh, in following my experience, because this generates a real commitment in the territory, so the people are very motivated at the beginning, and they want to search money, but they do it by themselves. <laughs> Another barrier is the inability to capture funds, so forget Horizon. The first sources of funding must be sought locally. And of course, the poor motivation, how do we fight uh, with, with, against the poor motivation? Believe me, the human beings follow the trends. <laughs> we, all, we, we all know it. So at the beginning, it's good to involve few, but key actors. For example, at the beginning, it was important to involve the regional authority, the university of the territory, some important companies, and then the rest of the world, when was uh, seeing these four or five people getting together, talking about the uh, um, management of the forest, uh, said, oh, well, well, what are you doing? I want to go too. Uh, I want to go to lead, just to listen, but I want to go too. And then the, world, the, the, the door, of course, is still open for everybody, and the association has growth. It's as simple like this. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Pablo. I think that some of us were maybe a little bit afraid when we heard it's better to start without money. <laughs> but you explained very well why this is um, important. Um, before we start with the, this is the fourth presentation. We have online uh, one speaker. Uh, that's uh, Antoine uh, Cremer from uh, Inrae. Uh, so, yep, yeah, here. Hello, Antoine. Bon Bon Can, you Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly. So, um, okay. if uh, you would like to share your screen, so uh, uh, the attendees can see your presentation. Okay, let's see. Last night it didn't work. Let's see if this time it works. Can you see it? No. Uh, yes. Exactly. And Is you it can okay launch it. Not? Yeah, launch it full screen. Okay, then you have to share, maybe you are working with two screens, you have to share the other screen. Okay. Uh, I, I suggest that you, Antoine, I suggest that you uh, stop sharing, launch the presentation, and then uh, share it again. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we can leave like this. Uh, our screen is big enough to read your slides. Yeah, we, we, you can continue. You can continue uh, like this, yes. So you can use the, do you pass your slides uh, yourself? So we have heard about um, these projects from, uh, from CSIS4 that were transferred to, um, mainly to public administration, but of course then other partners uh, joined. Here we see an we'll see an example, uh, Evil Tree, who was transferred to academia. So uh, please, Antoine, the floor is yours. You have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, so the, um, 
the Evil Tree uh, was originally a network of excellence that was uh, supported by FP6 between 2016 and uh, 2006, uh, 2006 and 2010. We were uh, about 25 partners and uh, during the uh, support by the EU we had uh, activity, one of the many activities was uh, how to install uh, durability of the network after the EU support. So next slide please. Oh. Uh, Antoine. Antoine, you can pass the slides uh, yourself. Yeah, here. Oh, okay. Um, Click. Yeah, we see the so second in, slide. Uh, we, we then uh, came up with a, with a new, of course, legal frame, uh, which was put in place by the, uh, or prepared by both by the legal department of INRAE, that was the coordinating institute of the Network of Excellence and also EFI, and so the consortium agreement was a consortium agreement according to a European research group. Uh, this, in this system, of course, in the new uh, consortium agreement, we were asking for a voluntary contribution in terms of funding and activities. Uh, we come to this later on. And another major step uh, was the integration within EFI. Okay. Uh, this was adopted uh, uh, by the uh, uh, governing board uh, on September uh, 30th, 2011. So, what was the first a few words about the, the general objectives? During the uh, support by the by the EU as a network of excellence, we installed many uh, resources, common collective resources, which benefited to all partners in terms, for example, of databases. But also there was a, a repository center with DNA extracts and other infrastructures. So we wanted that these uh, common infrastructures were, were, could benefit to all the partners after the EU support. This was one major objective. And the second objective was to support um, a training, mobility and dissemination throughout the network. So uh, we came up with a new legal frame, as I said, the uh, new consortium agreement. And the, 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 this, the, the frame uh, of the uh, 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 of or the duration uh, of the frame was uh, four years, so it was renewed a second time in 2014. It was renewed in 2018, and it was just recently renewed again. Okay, uh, so uh, I will come now to some of the major parts of 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 the legal frame. Talk a little bit about the activities and how the self funding. Is, is actually achieved. So a new, there was a new consortium agreement, as I indicated, the ERG document. This um, would, a major step was the integration within EFI, and I will say a few words about the governance, the membership, and the funding system in this new legal frame. I, uh, there's a whole document. I, I won't have time to, to go into details. Today, I will just highlight some of the major uh, uh, points uh, that, that were decided. Concerning, of course, the uh, EFI, the integration within EFI, EFI is as such a member of the ERG, is a facilitator of the ERG as it is an administrator, and in EFI has also veto right. I, I will come to this later on again. So the new, the concerning the governance, it was similar to 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 uh, uh, the governance during the network of excellence. There was a the the, the governing board, which is the main gov uh, governance body, uh, elects a coordination coordinator institution, which was uh, in Rai, and the coordinator institution nominates a coordinator. 
Uh, there's also an administrator institution, which is EFI, which nominates an administrator. And uh, there is an executive committee and the members are elected. Five of them are elected and two are nominated. And they run uh, on uh, every da everyday basis the activities of, of the network. Uh, now the membership. There are two, two uh, kinds of members, what we call core member and associate member. Well, the difference between core member and associate member is basically uh, due to the level of their contribution. For example, those partners that contribute financially by cash will are core members, and those that contribute in kind are associate members. And core members have also uh, two votes when it comes to uh, uh, governing board decision, why associate members have only one vote. Uh, so this is the major difference. Um, and at the beginning of the term, of the four years term, each member in the institution signs a commitment letter saying, I intend to contribute by cash, or I intend to contribute in kind, and then he, uh, they have to the the indicate uh, what the in-kind activities are. Okay. Uh, so as, yeah, as I ind uh, indicated, the funding and the contribution, this is either cash or in-kind contribution. And administration, of course, is done by, by, the, by the EFI. So I want uh, our main activities are the maintenance and upgrading of the um, resources that I already mentioned, uh, to facilitate the access to common infrastructure and resources, uh, the dissemination and, and training. And of course, there's also coordination activities. I just want to illustrate some of the uh, uh, electronic resources that, that are shared within uh, and available on, on, on the website of, of the uh, Evol Tree. And the, the, these um, uh, resources, electronic resources, are part of what is called the electronic lab. These are the different uh, databases and the contents and, and, and the species that are concerned by, by this data, and they are shared among the different partners. So, and this is it. I was very brief. I understood that you, well, uh, a little words about the training activities, which is an important component. We uh, uh, organize mostly summer schools per year. And I should say that the training activities are most of the time the in-kind contribution of the universities. I mean, they take care and pay uh, uh, for the logistics of organizing the summer school. And Evol3 supports financially the participation of students which are belong to Evol3 partners. Okay. So it's mostly open to students and permanent staff. So, and well, this is um, this is it. As I wanted to be brief, I understood that you wanted mostly to know, uh, have some information on how we did it and how it works, more than on, on the content of the activities. And I guess you will have many questions related to the um, Evol3 ERG. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Antoine. Uh, that, that was perfect. Uh, and uh, I didn't say at the beginning, but uh, of course we, chosen, we have chosen uh, um, examples based on forestry because most of us are, are foresters. But we could have done the same success cases with projects on medicine, on urbanism, or whatever topic. Because what uh, we wanted to know is how did you manage to to maintain your activities after the, the EU funding. And it seems that uh, Evil Tree followed somehow uh, th this maximum of uh, better to start without money because they started with voluntary contributions from, from the members, some cash, some in kind. So 
they follow the, the receipt from, uh, from CC4 that uh, Ricardo presented. Um, Antoine, please uh, keep, uh, you can stop sharing your screen, uh, keep uh, online. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. how, uh, how do I proceed? Uh... Okay, we see you. Okay, so I invite you to stay online because we have um, a fourth presentation and then we'll have uh, a debate. And I would like that you could also contribute to the, to the debate. So I invite to come uh, Lauren uh, Dieterman. Uh, Lauren Dieterman is uh, from FIBL, the Research Institute of Organic uh, Agriculture. Working, working, she's working at the Department of Extension and, and Training and Communication. So Lauren. Yeah, and we'll have also online, uh, this is also a tandem presentation, Bram uh, Mueskops uh, from iFoam uh, Organic Europe, uh, and he's uh, their research and innovation uh, manager. Uh, they will be presenting the organic farm knowledge uh, that, as I said, it originated, well, well several European projects uh, putting them together. I think that some of them are uh, coordination and support actions funded by uh, Horizon 2020. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Moeskops will start yeah, the first half of the presentation, and then uh, Lauren will, will continue, and, and both will be here for the debate. So I think we have Bram online. You can start presenting. Okay, thanks a lot, Tracht. Do you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. And do, you, do you see the screen? Yes. yes. I think everything is all right. So, Lauren and I will present organic farm knowledge, uh, which, as the name says, is a knowledge platform about organic management and the assumption behind the whole platform is that um, the foundation of organic farming is knowledge and so that by bringing the knowledge to the farmers and facilitating knowledge exchange among farmers uh, advisors and researchers we can improve uh, production methods and um, yeah, so here you see a print screen of our platform. So uh, you're perhaps not so much into farm farming, so I will uh, not, uh, it goes by itself too fast. Um, so I, uh, it's basically a platform divided in different teams uh, related to farm and users can find different uh, tools on the platform, such as videos, guidelines, manual decision support systems, um, yeah, that with all types of advice on, on organic production methods, uh, ranging from uh, fruit production to animal, pigs, everything that you could imagine related to farming. Um, and the history of organic farm knowledge started in uh, 2015 or even earlier uh, with a thematic network called Okenet Arable and then um, we followed with a second thematic network called Okanet EcoFeed. Uh, the first thematic network um, started in 2015 and already at the application stage, we had this idea of setting up a, a platform and uh, the, the main parties driving the, the platform, uh, seven out of the 17 parties, um, yeah, sat together, designed the idea of this platform and already entered into an agreement to maintain and continue the platform for at least five years after the end of the project. And then during the project um, in 2016, we launched the first version of the platform at that time still called Farm Knowledge. Um, but then um, we went to uh, a second project called Okay at EcoFeed, started in 2018, which we used uh, among other things. We did many other things, but I won't go into detail there. Uh, we also, we, um, yeah, we set up a new version. We rebranded the whole platform. We call it Organic Farm Knowledge, also with the new logo, which you can see uh, on the bottom of the screen. Um, and that was in 2019. 
Um, and then with the end of that project um, in 2021, the, the structural funding, we didn't have any structural funding anymore uh, to maintain the platform. So we were kind of uh, left on our own with our own network and we, we had to uh, see how to continue all the things. Um, but we were kind of prepared for that. So uh, we had planned to make a deliverable within the OKDIT EcoFeed project, a uh, plan for the continuation of the organic farm knowledge platform, in which we set out actions for further development. We set up a governance model uh, based on an executive and an editorial board, and we also outlined options, options for um, the funding, which Lauren will explain um, in the next phase of the presentation. So as it comes to the partners um three partners have actually always uh, from the very beginning been at the, at the core and been driving the whole platform that's feeble i from organics europe where i come for myself and icrofts i from um is in short in charge of the coordination of the, all the activities related to organic farm knowledge and chairing the executive and editorial board um feeble is in charge of doing the real hard work on maintaining the platform, uploading all the tools on the platform, and iCross is responsible for the database that is behind in the background of the, of the platform. And so in the beginning, I said we were seven partners. Uh, so besides these three, there were four others that com committed to make the platform after OKNET Arable, of which uh, three joined the new project Oaken at EcoFeed, one did not. So it already shows that even if we make formal agreements, we put things on paper, then after a few years, uh, people still step out. So uh, it, it's difficult to really stick to what you promised on paper because then the things in reality changes. Um, and then at the end of Oaken at EcoFeed, we established um, these two boards are uh, currently nine members in the executive board. The executive board is kind of more sets out the main lines, that's the mission, the vision, how we're where to go with, with the platform. Editorial board is doing more the practical work, and that has um, 17 members. Uh, and the core of the board is composed of the partners of the two projects, OKNET Arable and OKNET EcoFeed. And that was expanded, expanded through the network of, uh, of these core partners. Um, and to join either the editorial or the executive board, we have a formal membership agreement. Um, if people want to take a higher commitment and be part of, of the executive board and set out the lines uh, for, um, for organic farm knowledge, then they have to commit to at least contribute with one person month of in-kind contribution uh, per year. If they want a lower involvement, they can be part of the editorial board and then they commit to at least half a percent uh, per year. We will see that these yeah, amounts are still what well, are modest, but we see actually it, it, certainly the one person month per year can be a, a hurdle and obstacle for, for partners to join. So most of the organization just opt for the editorial board. Uh, and then I will hand over to uh, Lauren. So I think I will stop sharing and I share, uh, Lauren can share her screen. Yes, we just wait a moment until it's shared here. Hi, Bram. <laughs> Edward, if it's an issue, I think Bram can also continue sharing. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay, perfect. So I'll just scroll through and get to where I need to be here. Um, so just a few words about the current governance structure of the Organic Farm Knowledge Platform. Bram kind of already outlined most of the most information, uh, most important information that you all, that would be interesting for, for everyone here. Um, we have two boards. Um, one of them is really more related to strategic development and the other one's more related to yeah, tool quality control, identifying different tools, et cetera. Um, 
and Bram mentioned this before, but the executive board is a bit smaller. It's made up of the core members from these um, two Horizon 2020 projects, whereas the editorial board has additional um, partners from um, the core partners networks and the, um, from the other, from the two Horizon 2020 projects. Um, so answering the question, which is the business model providing our sustainability? Um, I'll go through a few points. The first um, bit that I would like to uh, talk about is the basic financial commitment from our core partners. Um, the organization that I'm working for in Switzerland, Feeble, uh, we have committed to providing a core amount, a basic amount of funding for the platform because we see it as an important asset to the organic movement. Um, but this isn't like, you know, it's not guaranteed for 10 years or something. So we're constantly looking for new sources. iFoam as well and iCrovs as well from the, from the um, technical side um, with organic ePrints, which is where all the tools are stored. Um, the second bit that, that Bram actually already mentioned as well are the in-kind contributions um, from the two boards. So the members of the executive board agree to um, contribute in-kind one person month per year, whereas the editorial board is responsible for half a person month per year. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the third bit is about um, existing Horizon 2020 projects that we've been involved in kind of from the beginning, so being really included into the project proposals, and also trying to market ourselves um, to become more involved in Horizon Europe um, future projects. Um, here are some of the projects that we've, we've been involved in, and just as a note, Best for Soil, this, I don't know, oh yeah, Best for Soil, um, this is a project that actually approached us, which was a nice um, thing to see that people kind of hear about us and um, and we have a model um, for um, seeing how many tools a project would like to upload, what kind of partnership they're looking for, so that we can um, then be financed for our work on our side. The last uh, few that were considered in this deliverable that Bram mentioned were governmental support, including national project funding, business support, private foundations, and end users paying. These are all things that are um, ongoing, like I, I said, um, we're continuing the search for future funding um, and getting more involved in the next calls for Horizon Europe. Um, just a note on number seven, um, we decided that against this model because um, we really want it to be um, yeah, open for the public to use and that's kind of, that was against our, our purpose of the platform. Uh, we also have um, a page on the website, join us um, and it's the, the, pro the platform is really open for any project, any individual um, who's interested in getting involved um, or contributing a sing single tool or really involving us in their consortium. Um, yes. Coming to the next question, which are the main barriers to overcome in post-project sustainability? Bram and I met um, for a short bit and discussed some of these questions that were shared with us and I think it was also um, useful from my side to think about this because you know you're just in your daily work and you don't really think about yeah what what did what did the project have to overcome to be where we are today um, of course like always it's money um, finding funding and um, yeah having the funding be sustainable. I think that's the other key point. Yeah, we have this basic funding from the th three core partners, but um, we're on a constant search for, for new opportunities, new partnerships, and that also benefits the platform, um, which business model really fits for the needs of your users is super important for um, post-project sustainability. Um, and then the last barrier is active partner engagement post-funding. This was mentioned already a few times. 
Um, sometimes it can be a bit difficult to keep partners accountable for their commitments, even if it's formally agreed on on paper. Um, I think this is this is natural. You know, scientists are very busy, um, and we only have so many hours in the day. So, even if you're being funded for for something and paid for your work, sometimes you can't get a hold of people. So, if you're not being funded, then it kind of falls back on your list naturally. Um, in the same line, kind of promotion. Um, it, iPhone kind of heads our promotion, and they do a really great job. But our pro our project partners, um, they're also responsible for promoting the platform on a local level. Um, I think maybe it wasn't mentioned before. The, the platform's really on an EU level for organic farmers and farm advisors, but in order to reach farmers, <laughs> reach farmers on an EU level, you need to promote it also on the local level. Um, and it's, it's available in 14 different um, European languages and it's always expanding. So yeah, the promotion can also be a barrier. Um, and then we have quarterly meetings and sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge to get all of the partners involved in the editorial board to attend these meetings. Typically they run for three hours so it's, it's quite a commitment but they're only quarterly so yeah. Um, okay, so I have three lessons learned to share. Um, the first is kind of nitpicky, I would say, like uh, Bram brought it up actually, and I, I completely agree. Um, the di division of the executive and editorial board is actually quite unnecessary. Um, the members in the executive board are also a part of the editorial board. <laughs> so it's just kind of like a more formal agreement with these core partners, I guess. Um, but I think one is enough. We think one is enough. Um, I think keeping the governance of the platform as simple as possible and really defining the roles is key. Um, the business model that we went for, uh, for finding new projects um, and really relying on, yeah, um, the, the proactivity of the, the um, editorial board members um, is of course uncertain and unstable, um, but the user's fees, like I said, were against our values. Um, and the last thing is that the structures in place um, should, or the structured should, structure, structures should be in place before the project ends. All of the work, all of the hours that you put in to put in, like to set up the structures, and when I say structures, I mean editorial, like the, who's on the board, who's writing the documents, who's responsible for what, like really defining the things, having templates, having like, having everything really set up, that should be really done before the project ends because it, you sh really shouldn't underestimate all the work that goes into setting up these structures. Um, I think that's it, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brams. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Um, I hope we'll still have Bram and uh, Antoine online, maybe uh, if you are sharing. Perfect. Yeah, we see you, uh, Bram and Antoine, we see you on, uh, in, on our screen, so uh, you will be able to participate in this uh, debate. Uh, I, I was listening all the speakers and I was thinking, I hope that uh, Ivan and Daniela from SECOM are taking notes because uh, <laughs> they will be the, the, the future coordinators of the Rosewood 4.0 network, so the post-project uh, Rosewood 4.0, and uh, we have heard here very, very interesting uh, lessons learned on this uh, continuity of the, of the projects, uh, of the project's activities, because we understand the project when there is still funding from the, from the European Commission. So, uh, I would like to know if there is any question from, from the attendees here in the room or in the chat uh, in, on, on YouTube. Or contribution. Or contributions, yes. Or uh, <laughs> uh, if you want also to exchange your own uh, experiences, please, you are free to do. Uh, Apart Uwe's question. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, yes. Is uh, Javier there? Yeah. Okay. 
at the bottom. <coughs> By the way, we have half an hour of debate, so until <laughs> six. Thank you. Okay, I will speak slowly then. Um, my question relates to the last presentation. Um, can you please uh, detail a bit how H2020 projects and Horizon Europe projects contribute to your sustainability uh, once your project is over, please? Uh, I didn't hear to who the question was directed. To Bram and Lauren, please. Yeah. Okay, to Bram and Lauren. So which uh, H2020 projects uh, were involved and supported this sustainability of the CSA? Order? Which, which yes. um, projects? Then they were both CSA or... No, sorry. sorry. We will manage. No, sorry, it's not so much which, but more how. How they contribute. Uh, how, okay. To the sustainability of the platform. Um, okay, maybe I can go first because I think like with the microphones, I think it's better. And then Bram, maybe you can add on if it's okay. Or do you want to go first, Bram? Okay. Um, yeah, I think the projects themselves were the place where the ideas and the platforms were actually developed. Um, and I think the way that the second project with, with the deliverable that Bram um, explained, there was a plan for continuation of the platform. Um, so these, like I said, these structures were kind of outlined during the last months of the project. Bram, do you want to add something? Yeah, I can add, um, because I understood the question also in a way that how the new project would contribute, so perhaps I can add on that. So um, you've seen on the screen that the live sheet, the remix project and so on. <laughs> so these were um, projects where some of the partners of the editorial board were partner in and they had um, agreed within the project that the outcomes of uh, that particular project would then be uploaded on organic farm knowledge. So there were, um, were kind of tasks foreseen within mm. this, these projects to collaborate with organic farm knowledge. That's uh, the main way how this project contributes. Uh, and one um, other way is in the case of the Best for Soil project, there was before or within the consortium, within the grant agreement and with the description of action, there was no collaboration planned, but then they came to us and they asked us to promote their material and then we entered in a kind of a service contract. So we said, okay, we can upload uh, X amount of tools for you. That's going to cost that much uh, money but for the work done. Uh, we agreed on a price and we did the work for them. Thank you. Does that answer your question? I think there's yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Other other questions from the attendees? Yes, uh, Rosa. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's for you, Laura. Um, you mentioned that after a project is, is carried out and innovation is covered, you are thinking on how to develop a, a specific business model for that, uh, for that project. Uh, we are doing a similar thing in a European Union project called GoGrass, Go where we develop uh, alternative uses of the, of the grass, like paper, compost, uh, animal bedding, etc. But we, we, besides the business model evaluation, we are also very interested in the business environment evaluation. Uh, because the context for the same business model could be different in different countries from different mm -hmm. perspectives. Are you taking that into account in the, in, the, in, in, in I mean, in somehow this in, in the future of this, of this uh, project? And the other one is more related with the previous team, maybe it's not now. It's when they ask it for a wish for the future, I think it's very important, and we saw that also in Eureka project, uh, the real evaluation of the impact of the projects when they end, 10 years afterwards, to show up as how this can be improved for the ongoing projects. So there are two things. The first thing is about the business environment. Another one is a wish of the real evaluation of the impact of the projects 
when the project is ended, but 10 years afterwards it, it is ended. Okay, thank you. So, who wants to answer? Um, I think the, f the first question is, is maybe not so, I, I don't know, Bram, maybe you have a different idea, but the, the business environment for organic farm knowledge, I mean, we're, we're more of a knowledge provider. Um, so we're not, yeah, we don't really have, we don't need to develop business models. We don't need to look on the local levels. Um, the projects are kind of bringing um, their innovations to us um, and we're using the platform to then like disseminate the knowledge further. Um, Bram, do you want to add something or? Yeah, I'm not sure if I totally understood the question, but um, it's true, of course, that the way um, farmers and advisors um, obtain their knowledge differs from country to country. And um, we kind of offer one solution, mm -hmm. but then the way uh, Perhaps it doesn't work for all countries because uh, people are used for to for other channels or obtain their information in another way. Um, so we are of course mainly targeted uh, targeting um, those people that have a bit of a European perspective and look also on international websites. That's that's true, uh, but we that's also why we. Um, um, do a lot of efforts now that in the editorial board we have people from um, different from all not all the member states but from a lot of a lot of European countries uh, we try to cover them all um, so that we kind of have a perspective from the different countries what their needs are um, and um, in terms of type of tools but also in terms of what knowledge or what sectors are uh, are the yeah like to give a perhaps a, a hypothetical example in the Netherlands can be more horticulture in other countries can be more uh, pasture uh, something like that so it can be that we have a better understanding what are the different knowledge needs in the different countries so that's what that, that's why we try in the editorial board to cover um, yeah if not all the, most of the EU countries I, I may uh, really launch a similar question to uh, Ricardo for the Mediterranean uh, uh, Model Forest Network. At, we saw on your slide that you have uh, uh, model forest networks from different countries and including North and African countries. So um, you, the, the, the business model that you applied, was it easy to, to have the same for all the countries or you have to somehow uh, do some adjustments mm -hmm. country to country or try to or did you manage to, to have the same model that would fit all the different yeah. countries? Well, at the beginning, it was a matter of diplomacy. You know, uh, we, have, we had to select the right uh, members of the, for, the, for this new adventure. And in the, in the case of the countries of the South Mediterranean, the level was at the ministry, you know, the, the, because they are the competent authority for the forest management. The same for us, the, the regions. And so that's all, you know, it's a matter of organization. But I can return the question to the audience. Huh? Are we doing well now, this selection for our future Rosewood Network? Are we selecting the right partners for our network? Or maybe we should look for some strategic partners. What do you think about it? <laughs> well, uh, we have EFI, it's good. <laughs> EFI is good because where, if, if, there, if there is a EFI in a meeting, I will be there to listen, <laughs> to listen what you are saying. But should, for example, should we involve in our future network our regional authorities directly, for example, the partners involved? Well, we are very happy that tomorrow afternoon we have uh, <laughs> this first meeting of the Rosewood 4.0 network. So this, I think it's a question that uh, could be launched there and, and all the partners try to, to find the appropriate answer. Uh, Ignacio in the front has a, has a question also.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to launch a question in the line of Ricardo's question, but taking the experience of a, of a former thematic networks of Evol3, uh, what do you think is success factor of being able to continue after a project finishes? Is it about the type of partners that you are public partners that maybe you can invest time in the project because you have some flexibility for that? Is because the, the topic is narrow and very concrete? Is because you have the right type of partners or very, very um, key leader that is able, legitimate player that, that can attract interest? Uh, so what do you think is a, is a core success factor for being, for example, level three for so long time, uh, an active network after the project ended? But also, also, Arabon, okay, Arabon. Uh, Antoine, you are muted. I think the main expectation and benefits for the partner is to have access to the data that are continuously upgraded during the uh, uh, since actually the net network was created. So uh, and also the training. I mean, um, uh, mo many forestry related issues are uh, addressed. Uh, addressed at the continental level and and so partners have have interest to contribute to to such research so i think it's the um, as i said the, the access to data uh, which are continuously upgraded and and second uh, also the participation to research project at the at the eu level. Anyone else here would like to answer Ignacio's question? Uh, I think um, what is really, really important is that uh, the subject of this project has user users after this project because otherwise it's going to be impossible and that users could be general public or could be some companies could be also clients no but we should have this end users and then we need at least one organization who takes the lead and who is going to like profit or it's in the core of its uh, of its uh, basis, no? and so if we can match these things, and if we can, during the project, identify this uh, organization that could take the lead because it, for 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 uh, for them it's important, and we push a little bit, that could be a a good way to succeed. Yeah, I think I. I think I can just echo that. Um, I think having a super strong network is important, but um, I mean, talking about our different boards, and I mean, we have we have more than a few members on our board, and, and it's expanding um, every month. Um, but I think really having the core partners committed, like we have three core partners, um, we're all very aligned with organic agriculture. We all work on just organic agriculture. So it's very clear what's delineated there. Um, and we're all passionate about it as well. I think the passion is something that should be mentioned because a lot of these, yeah, I mean, this could easily have disappeared. It, it probably would have disappeared if not so many passionate people were involved, not only in the project consortium, but BRAM and um, is uh, at ICROVS. I mean, there's so many passionate people behind the thing. And I think finding those gems and bringing them in to be in that core team is, is important. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Lauren. Um, yep, yeah, one question here. Yeah, I have a question to all, all speakers. Uh, how do you, or what do you think is the key uh, question for uh, trying to balance 
the success of a post project when there is some non-profit organizations on the uh, consortium and others like private companies that I mean the, probably they need to uh, exploit uh, commercially the the results of a, of a project, but maybe the non-profit are not so concerned about that. So what's the key point of trying to balance these two things into the success of a post-project network? Thank you. <laughs> well, the, the question is too difficult it's, because uh, we, we don't know. <laughs> in you go, the question is impossible to answer because uh, the, every every project is a story, single story. So I talked about governance. They talked about new technologies. But in our specific example here today, for the Rosewood, we are working, I guess, specifically for the private sector because. Uh, uh, I said in my president presentation that uh, in the southwest Europe, we have the knowledge, we have the innovation, we have the technology, but the real problem is that, that all this uh, knowledge is not available for the, for the SMEs, the, the small SMEs in particular. And so, of course, we are here for them, first of all, and if we can benefit them with this new network, I'm more than happy. Uh, I'd like to add, add something that we are a research organization, not ma mainly focused on research, but more, more on transfer and promotion. But what, what is a big topic nowadays between other organizations like, like us, we are private, we're, we want to be close to the industry is that innovation needs to get the market because always we are going to be like in a bubble or making projects and get, getting funds and it seems like the objective of the of, of the organization is get funds to get the people financed financed no and I think in the more, more and more innovation and this kind of projects should focus on arrive to market. And this is something that it's only, not only, but it's more, it's more usually to be driven by, by companies. Uh, so sometimes in the consortiums it's difficult to balance that. But I think we have to design the projects to get that idea, because uh, it's the way that we're going to transform society. Uh, if we go to market, if we, go, if we solve real problems of the people and, and companies and users that uh, want to pay that uh, thing, it's, we're transforming, we are uh, arriving where we want to be. Uh, so. To me, it's very important, and of course, it depends. It's not the same as, uh, as C C C C CSA or a RIA or a innovation. It's always different, but we have to focus that something has to happen after the project. We need, yeah, and we we look. We can look in different terms. We we we'll, maybe we we want to have more farmers engaged in organic farmers. So we have there we have our clients and maybe some companies could profit because they are going to sell different products. So we're going to transform society. So it's very important to to keep that in mind. And sometimes I, I, I realize that when consortium are too based, for example, in universities, they are very far away from that vision. So I think we should also balance because it's not the same when we talk about we have we are we have research organization in this consortium, for example, no. But it's not the same if this research organization are private centers or or technological centers or universities, because the vision is completely different. So go to market. That's very difficult.
Hello? Yes. Now, I wanted to reflect on this line and maybe thinking on this, the network, the value for the network members and how you provide value to society, could be companies, could be governments, could be something different. So reflecting on this idea of a business model for the network means that you are creating value and reflecting on Evoltree's experience that Antoine tells us, that the network members are benefiting themselves from research, access to data, access to knowledge, um, delivering their mission in training, maybe society. So I was thinking that for, to keep this network, maybe you really need, need to add value first to the network members, and then you will, you will engage society. But you need to be clear what, the, what is for the members that have missions in different countries with different focus or related or not. So what is this core value that the networks provide? Is this access to these uh, best practices? Is, is this a uh, study tour visit? So for the future of Rosewood, well, a partner, why will this partner stick to the network? In the case of Evol3 is I have a big repository of data. Uh, I, I have a, a, a common collection of genetic material I want to access. I have a, and then I deliver my mission to society. But even if I empower myself in the network, this is what I understood. Uh, so for Rosewood, what is this uh, core benefit for partners to stick to the network and then deliver, as you say, mission vis-a-vis -vis companies or vis-a-vis -vis governments? Yeah. No, I think this is a good reflection. This is what I captured. Any, any reaction to Ignacio's no, comment? this was a statement, not, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, Bram, uh, or uh, Antoine, if you, want to, if you want to react to Ignacio's, Ignacio's comment. On, um, but I think that, yeah. He's speaking. Yeah, okay. I think Antoine is muted. Antoine, maybe you are muted again. No, uh, well, I I didn't fully understand the, the the statement because I have some problems with the with the sound. I don't. There's some back noise which makes it difficult to understand all the questions. But uh, so I didn't get all the details of the uh, of the previous statement. Well, Inathia was Inathia was commenting that uh, when continue uh, post project post project activities that. Uh, we should be very clear um, which is the core value that the, the network uh, provides. And uh, I think that this can help uh, the post-project uh, activities to, 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 to be sure that they continue providing this, uh, this need. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say, uh, well, it's reciprocal. I mean, what can the uh, the network uh, provide to you and also what can i as a member contribute to the network mm. it has to be both both ways okay and when one this reciprocal relationship is well established then uh, i mean the, the the network works just fine uh, i should say frankly speaking we, as I ind indicated earlier, uh, at the beginning of each term, we ask a com for a commitment letter of each partner to indicate precisely what their contribution will be during the term, e either in terms of cash contribution or in kind. In, in some cases, in a few cases, there were partners that didn't finally make it and didn't fulfill their commitment. So this was a problem. And we had quite discussions <laughs> and we finally we didn't finally uh, uh, agree yet on how to proceed with those only a few, very few of them. How, how we should continue in the case where partners that committed for contribution finally do not fulfill their, their contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so you haven't, you haven't solved no. it. So you're no, we haven't solved it. There are different options. They're going from exclusion of the partner to uh, uh, amendments to the commitment letter, and well, it's it's a difficult bit. It I should say it's still it it, it occurred I think twice since 
since the 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 uh, the, the uh, network is is uh, running. But it, it, it's a uh, it can uh, it can be of course a problem. Uh, the membership of the network have steadily increased. There were one partner that that uh, quit the network since it was uh, put in place, which is shows actually that uh, that network is well perceived. And yeah. I, I think this concept of uh, reciprocity is very important. Uh, mm. We have the same in organic farm knowledge. We e expect a contribution from mm. the from the mm. members to contribute to maintaining, improving the platform, but I feel they also really gain from that by having exchange with the other other partners in other countries, knowing what's going on there and have uh, really access to all the knowledge that organic mm -hmm. farm knowledge promote, which then they can use in their own networks in their in their own country. So um, mm -hmm. the, the, the benefits really go in the two ways. Yeah. Pablo, you wanted to? No. I think many of these questions, I think, they are very important in, in order to to think in this in this Rosewood network. No, how, how is it going to to continue? Maybe tomorrow we talk a little bit more about that. No, but I think here there are some uh, comments that are very useful useful in order to identify how. Partners are going to be involved. How? What? What are? What do we expect? Because we have this competence center uh, leading the the next rush boot, But are we going to be after them? Are we going to contribute? It is not only a matter of sending some information and yeah. the, having this platform with two or three ideas. It's it's. Are we engaged with the project or are yeah, with the vision? Should we pay for? Yeah. <laughs> Which are the benefits? Yeah. What we want, really. I, I, I may have um, uh, a naive question for all the speakers. Uh, because it's just Antoine just mentioned maybe, I don't know if it's this uh, not uh, respecting the agreement or, and the consequences that this would have was uh, foreseen or not. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, when building the, the business model and the business plan for the post-project uh, network or activities, did you get uh, external professional advice or you build your business model and business plan in-house only uh, with the consortium members? In my case, was uh, in house, in house for for the Mediterranean Forest yeah. Model Forest Network. In house, in house also for the for, for the, the Seal. Bram can answer. I believe it was also yeah, in, in house. Our case, it was, in our case, it was also in house. Yeah. But we've now applied, or we will start a new project called Organic Targets for EU, where we uh, have plans to uh, improve our uh, our business plan with the help of the Horizon Result Booster Service. Um, I hope they will give some more, some professional advice. I've heard mixed uh, feelings from this service. Some are very enthusiastic, some are somewhere less. So let's see what the outcome will be. But our plan is to professionalize our business plan with the help of this uh, booster service. And uh, Antoine, for, for Evil3, Antoine, did you get any professional external advice or it was self uh, self-made? Uh, you are muted. Uh, Antoine, you are muted. Uh, Antoine, Antoine, I'm, I'm sorry, you are muted again, so you'll have to restart. <laughs> yeah, it was more, more mostly within the network. We had some advice, especially by EFI, uh, from uh, when EFI joined. I mean, the, our major problem was how to deal administratively with all the different members coming from different countries. We, no member, no single member had the expertise 
to deal with the old administration. And uh, whereas EFI, which is a European institution, has the skills and the expertise to handle uh, administrative work with all the partners. So they were quite helpful in, uh, at the beginning where, when we switched from the uh, 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 network, uh, the, the EU network, to now the uh, self-sustainable uh, network. Thank you, thank you, Antoine. So I, I'm happy to hear from Ram that uh, uh, this application for the Horizon Results uh, Booster, because it's one of the services that they offer. Now I'm doing free advertising, <laughs> and uh, I, um, uh, you have to be aware that some of the services of the Horizon Results Booster you can apply as a single project or as a combination of projects. So if you if you find other projects like like yours. Uh, you can apply it as a, a combined uh, service to provide combined support to a, to a group of, of projects. Um, it's already six. Maybe uh, we can have time for one last question from the audience. No? Otherwise, uh, I think that we can conclude uh, this uh, second session of the day on how to sustain project activities once the EU funding is, is over. Uh, I personally will bring back uh, to me uh, many good advices uh, from all the speakers and uh, good examples, and I hope that they will be, and I'm sure, uh, very useful for the con successful continuation of a Rosewood 4.0 project into the Rosewood 4.0 network. So thank you very much for the speakers. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will do some uh, uh, practical uh, announcements. So remember that tomorrow morning we have the, the working groups. Uh, as it was already announced at the beginning of the day by Javier, uh, we start at 9.30, but you are invited to be here at 9.15. Uh, because during the first half of the morning, we will have four uh, working groups, one hour and a half, then coffee break, and at 11.30, uh, the second round of five parallel uh, working groups in this same building, in other homes, but in the same building. So come to the same place uh, uh, as, uh, as today. The working groups will be uh, hybrid. Uh, this time it will be homemade hybrid, uh, but um, I will do our best. Um, Bring back, if you come tomorrow, bring, keep your badge and bring it back uh, tomorrow, so do not forget at the, at the hotel. If you are not coming back tomorrow, you, you are kindly asked to leave your badge at the, at the exit. Uh, Gerard, our communication officer, is uh, now ready to take a picture that I think will be at the stairs at the bottom of the corridor. So when you leave the home, don't get out of the building. Uh, wait at the stairs, and Gerard will take a, a group picture. And um, I, I, yeah, beers. <laughs> um, we have not organized uh, anything, so let's hope that it will be uh, some uh, self-organic uh, organization. Uh, of course, there are many bars in Barcelona. So what I suggest is. When you're leaving through the same uh, main door, uh, if you want to stay, of course, you, it's not compulsory, but uh, uh, wait for the group at the bottom of the stairs of the main entrance. And from there, we will go towards Sagrada Familia that you will see at the bottom of the avenue. And there are several uh, bars and cafeterias along. So then. Uh, we can see which staffers is uh, available enough to, to sit there, have a drink together. And the idea is that from there, we may plan uh, a dinner according to your uh, dietary requirements and uh, also the availability of, of, uh, of restaurants. So uh, thank you very much. I hope that you will be there here. And uh, thank you.